If you want to be able to have high leverage during the sales process, have really deep, meaningful relationships with your prospects and customers that allows your company to have a respectable profit margin, to be able to close sales on your own terms without compromise, it's critical that you get the basics right. LinkedIn lead generation. Are you trying to build your brand or destroy it? I'm Joshua Feinberg from SP Home Run. In this video, we're gonna talk about the importance of getting LinkedIn lead generation best practices done right. Are you trying to use LinkedIn lead generation to fill the top of your sales funnel for your B2B technology company? If so, there's a dirty little secret that I need to let you in on because you have two fundamental choices. First, you could generate leads from LinkedIn in a way that builds up your brand, positions you and your team as thought leaders, and tease up your sales team to have impactful, game-chaining conversations, doctor-patient style, consultative sessions with highly qualified prospects. So that's option number one. Option number two is you could hire a marginally trained, inexpensive offshore virtual assistant to relentlessly spam the heck out of your first degree connections and essentially beg for 15 minute meetings, literally destroying your brand one spam message at a time. So which makes more sense for you? Now, to be clear, when we're talking about your brand, we're talking about way more than just your logos, your colors, your fonts, your brand guide. Your brand is what people say about you and your team when you're not in the room. And in a digitally transformed world, your reputation, what you stand for, what you wanna be known for is super important. In a world where 60 to 80% of buyer's journeys now happen before qualified prospects are open to having a conversation with someone from your sales team, you no longer can afford to sit this one out on the sidelines. It's critical for your company to have a seat at the table, get found early on by the right prospects, in the right places, at the right time, and most of all, in the right context, so that you're seen as the go-to experts and thought leaders about anything and everything having to do with your niche, with your ideal buyers and their goals, their plans and their challenges. Not what you want to sell them, but what they care about. What's keeping them up at two o'clock in the morning? What if they get right? is gonna get them a huge promotion. What if they mess up is gonna get them booted out? So make sure that you're obsessively focused on giving value to your prospects and clients. And the way to do this all comes down to creating and distributing helpful educational content where you answer the questions that your ideal clients are asking all day long on Google, LinkedIn, YouTube, Siri, Alexa, and others, anywhere from days, weeks, even months before they're ready to engage with you and your sales team. And when you do this right, you earn a seat at the table on their side of the table, you're seen as the de facto guru, advisor, subject matter expert teacher on anything and everything having to do with their goals, plans, and challenges. And if you miss the chance, your prospects early on, that's a bigger problem because now someone else is the one who's coaching them, who's giving them the advice, who's teaching them about what they should be thinking about when it comes to your category. And they're certainly going to be steered towards different options because someone else is stacking the decks in their company's favor. Now, there's still a chance for your company to still get added to the shortlist, even if you're asleep at the wheel for the first seven innings of the game, the first three quarters of the football game or, or basketball game before that purchase happens. However, when you just show up at the end, there's an inherent problem because if you haven't been the one that's done the educating and building up the trust, the only card you typically have left to play is competing on price, which is that race to the bottom that nobody besides Jeff Bezos is really good at winning at. So if you want to put yourself in a place where the only thing you have left to do is to sell it cheaper, go ahead spam the heck out of your LinkedIn connections. But if you want to be able to have high leverage during the sales process, have really deep, meaningful relationships with your prospects and customers that allows your company to have a respectable profit margin, to be able to close sales on your own terms without compromise, it's critical that you get the basics right. So if you're serious about doing LinkedIn lead generation, think about whether you're trying to build your brand or destroy it. If you want to improve how prospects perceive your brand, make sure that you keep these six critical prerequisites in mind. First, you have a documented 
buyer personas. Do you have buyer personas and ideal client profiles documented for your most important kinds of stakeholders, for your most important kind of company that you want to sell to? Second, do you have the buyer's journey mapped out so you know the steps that someone goes through in between when they're a complete stranger to the point where they're a closed one deal? Is this done for your ideal buyer personas? Do you have premium content assets that educate and build trust with your most important buyer personas at each of the stages of the buyer's journey? So if you have two core buyer personas and there's three stages of the buyer's journey, you're only getting started when you check off the box and say, yes, I have six content offers ready to go that educate and build trust. Uh, in addition, do you have lead generation landing pages set up with forms that allow you to convert anonymous visitors into known leads where you can educate and build trust with them, where you can build a relationship with them over time? So when they are ready, you are not only on the short list, but if you really nail this, you are the short list and there's no other competitive options that they're considering. Do you have email lead nurturing? in place with perhaps with some marketing automation workflows that allows you to take leads that look like they're a reasonably good fit but aren't quite yet ready to talk with you and your company and it warms them up and gets them teed up for a productive sales conversation. And finally, have you invested in the right kind of sales accelerators, sales cycle accelerators, such as having a documented sales development process, perhaps case studies, a webinar program that does the same thing, that takes leads that, wow, they look pretty good. I wish they'd pay more attention to us and gives them a reason for them to pay more attention to you because you're adding so much value to the buyer's journey that they are navigating and you're zeroing in on being super helpful about their goal their plans and their challenges. If you're serious about using LinkedIn lead generation as a strategic growth engine for your business, make sure that you take time to think about, do you want to build up your brand or are you inadvertently destroying it by trying to play the short game instead of the long game? If you have any questions or comments, feel free to leave them below or reach out. I'm Joshua Feinberg from SP Home Run, and I look forward to hearing your great success stories and using LinkedIn lead generation to grow your business. video marketing tools that you can be using to educate and build trust. I'm Joshua Feinberg from SP Home Run, and I often get asked to share some of the resources and tools that we use in various facets of building out customer growth funnels. So when it comes to video, since 2008, my go-to tool, it's a long time, right? Camtasia for Windows. I'm certainly not a professional video editor, but Camtasia has been the primary app that I've used to record and edit videos pretty much since the beginning. I use it to record my screen, webcam, external microphone, and system audio. Much more recently, I've also started to use Descript. I'm currently evaluating Descript to add to my video marketing toolkit. I especially like its ability to transcribe videos and edit the video directly from the transcript. It also has this cool AI, this cool artificial intelligence feature that identifies and allows me to delete all the embarrassing filler words that all too often mere mortals like me tend to use like, uh, well, like, kind of, their AI can actually, when it transcribes those, pick up that those are filler words and in one simple box it can identify them and not only delete it from the transcript, but it can delete it simultaneously from your audio and video track, pretty cool stuff. Another big set of tools that I've used for a very long time, going back all the way to 2008, is GoToWebinar and GoToMeeting. I've used GoToWebinar to host webinars and, and small meetings that many times are getting recorded and edited and repurposed into video content. I have webinars that I've recorded five, six, seven years later that are still getting watched sitting behind landing pages. I often talk about the value of having some evergreen content in your content strategy. And case in point, when you have a, a one hour webinar that you've turned into a video that people still find value from months and years later, you're, you're doing great things. HubSpot video can also be a big part of that for hosting those recordings of your webinars. You can also use it to host podcast interviews and on-demand webinars. Another tool that I use in my video marketing toolkit and I've used for a long time going all the way back to 2013 is Wistia. I've used it with its HubSpot integration for premium hosting. 
generally webinar recordings that are gated behind landing pages. Another really super cool feature that you can find both in the HubSpot video app as well as in Wistia with the HubSpot integration is you can see how much of a particular video that a person has watched on a contact record within HubSpot. So for example, if you are a marketer that generates a lot of leads that you pass to your sales team, your sales team can look in the contact timeline in HubSpot and be like, okay, cool, this person converted on a landing page to watch a webinar recording, but I can look and see like, did this person watch three minutes of the one hour webinar recording or did they watch all 59 minutes of the one hour webinar recording? Super cool, useful contextual stuff to help your reps be able to prioritize that. Another video marketing tool that I've started using more recently is V.io, V.io. I'm currently evaluating this as a tool that we can use to reformat standard HD videos in 1920 by 1080 and resize them into square videos for LinkedIn. V also does a really good job of generating captions and can burn the captions right into the video, which is super important for attracting people who watch videos with sound off, which is a lot of people when they're on their mobile device. Another big video marketing tool that I've used pretty much all the way since the beginning, going all the way back to 2010, I think it was shortly after Google acquired YouTube, is YouTube. Again, as the second most important, second most popular search engine and the second most popular social media site, YouTube's reach is really unparalleled. It's certainly gotten more competitive over time, but its organic reach is just massive. And one final video marketing tool that's in my toolkit that I've used is Zoom meetings. Since like 2019, a little more recently, just as with GoToWebinar and GoToMeeting, I use Zoom, host Zoom for hosting small meetings that get recorded and repurposed into podcast episodes. Those are the video marketing tools that I use to educate and build trust. Let me know in the comments below what video marketing tools that you use or if you have any questions. And if you want to connect on a one-on-one -on -one basis, feel free to send me a note to connect with me on LinkedIn. I'm Joshua Feinberg from SP Home Run. The quality of being able to build that relationship comes down to investing in that relationship. But if you're looking to improve your link building and at the same time be able to publish and share some great thought leadership content, great ed helpful educational resources, putting together a podcast where you interview subject matter experts that have active blogs, active company newsrooms can be a great way for you to get some really, really high quality links. Link building strategies for mid-market and enterprise tech startups. I'm Joshua Feinberg from SP Home Run. And in this video, I'm going to introduce you to some strategies and tactics that you can use to improve your inbound link profile for your website to improve your search engine findability. But before I do that, let me just ask you to please take a moment and subscribe to this YouTube channel and ring the bell for notifications so you can be notified when new videos just like this become available. Now, are there a few core topics for your business that you need to become much better known for when people do a search on Google or Bing or ask a question to Siri or Alexa or Cortana? Would you like to make sure that when prospects ask any of these search engines or personal assistants for answers, for advice and recommendations that searchers find their way to your website? If so, you've likely given some thought to search engine optimization, SEO, as part of your go-to-market strategy. Now, maybe you've even flirted with the idea of hiring an SEO firm, but perhaps you got a little bit nervous because you've heard so many horror stories about um, inexperienced or inexpensive short they're focused on just the short-term goals and doing a lot of things that can lead to long-term reputational damage, long-term search penalties. A good rule of thumb is if it seems too good to be true, it probably is. But education is one of your most effective weapons that you have to be able to get the knowledge that you need to empower yourself to make the right digital marketing strategy decisions at a high level. However, in today's brutally competitive marketplace, in order to win in SEO, in search engine optimization, and findability on search engines, 
you really need stellar content, highly remarkable, incredibly valuable educational content, as well as comparable search engine authority. Um, if you need some help with your content, make sure that you check out some of these great resources for B2B content marketing strategy that you'll find along with this video in its playlist. In this video, in this article, we're going to look at some podcast-centric link building strategies that are especially valuable for targeting, for attracting the mind share of the right kind of people in mid-market and enterprise technology organizations. First up, start an interview-based podcast if you don't already have a podcast. Second, invite guests that you know have an active blog or active company newsroom that they post to on a regular basis on their website, especially where you know that they like to talk about recent media coverage. Third, post the video version of your podcast interview to your YouTube channel. Fourth, post the audio version of your podcast interview to Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and other podcast distribution sites. Fifth, take the time to transcribe that podcast episode. Number six, write a blog post about the podcast episode that includes an embed of the YouTube video as well as an embed of the audio version and the text transcript. And then finally, number seven, this is a really, really important part, is thank your guest for appearing as a great resource on your podcast in that particular episode and provide links to your YouTube and blog versions as well as encouraging the guests to share the episode on their social media and their blog or company newsroom. Mention that you certainly would appreciate if they can let their visitors, let their community, let their whoever their subscribers know who might also find valuable on the same kind of content. And if you do your interview well, you will get feedback from these frequent guests that like, wow, you asked me deep, insightful questions that no one's ever asked me before. Or I really enjoyed your conversation. Or you brought up some really good contrarian viewpoints that no one has ever thought to ask me before. And again, the quality of being able to build that relationship comes down to investing in that relationship. But if you're looking to improve your link building and at the same time be able to publish and share some great thought leadership content, great ed helpful educational resources, putting together a podcast where you interview subject matter experts that have active blogs, active company newsrooms can be a great way for you to get some really, really high quality links that will help your website on a long-term basis. And more than likely on a short-term basis, these exact same people that you interview will likely be glad to share and amplify your content on their personal and on their company social media channels. And again, you would be surprised at how often these interviewers, these people that you conduct these interviews with are, are really, really happy to blog about their podcast appearance and with you and almost always including a link to the blog post. And they may even again mention their blog post, uh, mention that interview in their company newsroom as if it was traditional mainstream media coverage. Uh, using this exact strategy, a podcast guest from a Fortune 500 company actually notified their marketing department who in turn linked to this particular blog post about the podcast episode on, on the website right next to mainstream media coverage from outlets like uh, CNN, Forbes, and the Wall Street Journal. Not too shabby, right? What kind of link building strategies are you currently doing to help your company's website become more findable on search engines to improve your search engine authority or domain authority as industry insiders often talk about? Let me know what you're working on with this in the comments section below. And if you have any questions, feel free to leave them in the section below as well. And if you're looking for some one-on-one -on -one assistance with being able to build and implement a strategy like this for your own company that can help you with link building strategies for reaching more mid-market and enterprise technology buyers, feel free to look me up on LinkedIn, send me a quick note that you're looking for some assistance and we may be able to work together on a one-on-one -on -one basis. I'm Joshua Feinberg from SP Home Run and I wish you great success in being able to attract amazingly relevant and helpful links, inbound links into your website that help you attract more of the right kinds of prospects 
for your mid-market and enterprise technology solutions. Seven SaaS content marketing building blocks for your success. Content marketing is no longer a nice to have for SaaS startups and scale ups. To be blunt, you cannot grow a SaaS business without content marketing. Since starting content from scratch can to many seem overwhelming, I've narrowed down your to do list to seven essential SaaS content marketing building blocks that you need to succeed. But before we get into that, can I ask you to please take a moment and subscribe to this YouTube channel and ring the bell so you can be notified when new videos just like this become available. First up, make a list of the 10 questions that you get asked all the time from your prospects and customers. Step number two, turn each of these questions into its own separate video. Step number three, post these videos to your YouTube channel. Step number four, Create and edit the transcript of the 10 questions that you get asked all of the time. Take that transcript, edit it, clean it up, copy edit it, add to it, whatever you need to, to make it a little bit more complete. Put an introduction at the front, put a conclusion with a call to action at the end, and now you have a complete ebook. Number five, use Canva to make your ebook look more professional, matching your brand colors and adding your logo. Number six, Add a pop-up with a form throughout your website so you can offer your new ebook as a way to build your email mailing list. You could, for example, use HubSpot Marketing Starter for that, HubSpot Marketing Hub Starter. And number seven, set up social media profiles on all of the major platforms where your most important customers participate. How do you know that? It should come directly out of your buyer persona research. For most SaaS startups, for most B2B SaaS startups, this will likely include LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, and of course, as I mentioned a few moments ago, YouTube. What kind of SaaS content marketing have you tried to so far? What has worked best for you? Let me know in the comments section down there below. And if you're looking for some help with your SaaS content marketing, feel free to reach out. I may be able to help. Look me up on LinkedIn. Send me a quick note about what kind of help you're looking for. And we may be able to talk. I'm Joshua Feinberg from SP Home Run, and I wish you great success in using SaaS content marketing to grow your company. How to build customer loyalty in infrastructure, software, and fintech. If your company depends on recurring subscription revenue, you're likely to prioritize customer success as one of your most important ways to build a more loyal customer base. So let's look at how your company can build customer loyalty for your infrastructure as a service, software as a service, or financial technology company. What can you do with social media to generate more loyalty and trust from your prospects and customers. Like so many things in life and in business, it depends. For infrastructure SaaS and FinTech companies, social media can create tremendous loyalty and trust from your prospects and customers. However, it's a big however, to approach this correctly, social needs to become an overall part of your company's branding investment and how it wants to be perceived in the marketplace. Generating loyalty and trust is usually solved by positioning your company and your team as subject matter experts, trusted advisors, and thought leaders. For B2B tech companies, LinkedIn and YouTube are great social channels for achieving these goals. For example, the Edelman LinkedIn B2B Thought Leadership Impact Study found that 89% of B2B buyers see thought leadership as enhancing the perceptions of an organization. And this is thought leadership that's promoted on social media, among other channels. And just under half, 49% of those surveyed, said that this thought leadership influences purchase decision. So 89% see thought leadership as enhancing their perception of a company. And just about half, 49% say that that thought leadership actually influences their purchase decisions. That said, untrained salespeople really can erode trust quite quickly on LinkedIn by one or more of the following toxic activities, or what I call the six LinkedIn mistakes that make you look bad. First up, don't spam LinkedIn posts with self-serving comments and sales pitches. Second, don't spam LinkedIn inbox with messages and in-mails with sales pitches that are begging for 15-minute meetings. Third, do not make an aggressive sales pitch in your connection request message. Fourth, don't pitch me on meeting virtually with you immediately after I accept your LinkedIn connection request. Fifth, do not repeatedly view my LinkedIn profile or constantly like my posts. 
in a desperate attempt to get my attention. And number six, don't post about how wonderful you are and how great your products and services are. I'm sure your boss cares about it. Some of your coworkers might, maybe mom does, but the reality is most of the prospects that you're looking to build relationships with have not yet heard of your company. And in order to get them to pay attention to you, they have to see you first as having valuable information, valuable content worth interacting with. And that starts by understanding their goals, their challenges, their problems, and offering content that can help with that. So what have you found helpful for building greater customer loyalty among your infrastructure, software, fintech customer base? Let me know down there in the comments below. And if you're looking to get some help with building a more loyal customer base, among your infrastructure software fintech customers, I may be able to help. Feel free to send me a quick note on LinkedIn about what kind of help you're looking for and we may be able to work together. I am Joshua Feinberg from SP Home Run and I wish you great success in building greater loyalty among your subscriber base. Brand building strategies for B2B fintech. With so much growth opportunity, but so much global hyper competition in B2B fintech, startups and scallops in the space often struggle with basic brand building strategies. So if you're looking to get up to speed on crucial branding factors that can take your business to the next level, consider the table stakes, so the minimum requirements needed for branding success, and how these have changed quite dramatically over the past 10 years and were accelerated even more so during the pandemic. Today, many founders and entrepreneurs still think of branding as their logo, fonts, and brand colors like the hexadecimal numbers. However, in a digitally transformed world, your brand is what the marketplace says about you when you are not in the room. Your brand is what drives your differentiation and competitive positioning, and your brand can either accelerate positive digital word of mouth through social proof and review websites, or your brand can bring your digital word of mouth to a grinding halt if your most important stakeholders discover negative social proof and poor online reviews. Many companies, especially in B2B fintech, startups and scallops in that space, chronically underinvest in branding because it's so much more challenging to measure than traditional demand generation metrics such as leads, marketing qualified leads like MQLs, and opportunity, sales opportunities. Exacerbating this challenge, most marketing technology platforms and digital ad platforms are designed to make it easy for you to measure and attribute success to non-branded factors that many would characterize at best as perhaps leading indicators, but many times are more like actual vanity metrics. Building a brand is challenging, but at the end of the day, as the marketplace becomes more consumed by commoditization, technology, and globalization, your company's brand is your most important asset for driving your current and future business growth. What kinds of brand building strategies have you invested in to drive the growth of your future B2B technology, fintech startup, or scale up? Let me know in the comments section down there below. And if you're looking for some help with building the brand for your B2B fintech startup or scale up, I may be able to help. Feel free to look me up on LinkedIn, send me a quick note about what kind of help you're looking for and we may be able to work together. I am Joshua Feinberg from SP Home Run, and I wish you great success in improving and scaling and using your brand as an important part of the growth engine for your B2B FinTech startup or scaling. You know, HubSpot teaches, HubSpot Academy teaches a lot about marketing and HubSpot has marketing tools. HubSpot Academy teaches a lot about sales and we have sales tools. And we sort of imply that the two should work together since we offer one platform that has both, but we didn't explain how to make that happen in reality. Um, and so I said to my, my leaders, you know, the, the heads of, of HubSpot Academy, like, I think we should create a course that teaches sales and marketing how to work together. And they said to me, okay, how do you make sales and marketing work together? <laughs> Welcome to the B2B Digitized Podcast where leaders of B2B technology startups and scale-ups learn how to use digital transformation to differentiate, educate, build trust, improve competitive positioning, close sales faster without compromise, and scale revenue growth. Now here's your host, Joshua Feinberg from SP Home Run. Hi, I'm Joshua Feinberg from the B2B Digitized Podcast, and I have with me today a very special guest with me, Kyle Jepson, who is a senior inbound sales professor 
at HubSpot Academy in Boston. Kyle, welcome to the podcast. Thanks so much for joining me. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. I'm excited for you to be here as well. And I've known you for quite some time, but I think it would be super helpful if you could start by giving our viewers and listeners some context on how you ended up in your current role at HubSpot Academy. What were you doing before that? What was the journey that led you to this place of being an evangelist for reinventing the sales profession? Yeah, for sure. Um, So my... uh... I guess one relevant piece of information while I was an undergrad, when I was in college, I got married. Um, and my, my plan uh, was always to graduate and go straight to, to grad school. Um, but my wife was a year behind me in school. So when I graduated, I had this year I had to kill before I could go off to grad school. And I, I joined this SaaS company, kind of a, a late stage startup. They were building out their first inside sales team. And I was hired onto that team. Um, and it was, uh, it was rough. I, I did not excel. And, and part of that um, was that their, I understand now their approach to sales was not ideal. They were scraping names and, and phone numbers off of the internet and just feeding that up to me. I was calling people I should not have been calling people. You know, we, we were selling um, online tools for apartment complexes. And sometimes I would call people and get into my pitch and realize, oh, this is a tenant of the apartment complex. They don't actually have any say in whether the apartment, and it, it drove me crazy. It made me cringe, um, but I really liked the company. So I moved from sales into customer service, sort of a CSM role and really enjoyed that. And then helped uh, found their, their technical support team. And I ended up staying at the company for three years just because I found the whole thing so enjoyable and I was learning and growing so much and the company was doing great things. Um, but ultimately I decided I still wanted to go to grad school. Uh, so I, I left that job, uh, we moved to Boston and, uh, and I went to, to grad school at Boston University, got a master's degree in linguistics. The most important thing I learned is that I don't like grad school. <laughs> no offense to higher ed, but after spending three years at a, tar- a tech startup, it just seems so slow and, and rigid and, and I, I needed something faster paced and more adaptable. And so I decided to leave higher ed, which made me sad because I love teaching. I loved research. That's what I wanted to do. Um, but we, we had fallen in love with Boston. Uh, I looked around at tech companies here, quickly fell in love with uh, HubSpot and joined uh, their support team in summer of 2015. And at that point, HubSpot had just launched its CRM, the, the inbound event previous to that. So it had been out less than, less than a year, had its own little dedicated support team for the CRM and, and a couple of sales tools we had at the time, which we called Sidekick. And, uh, and that's where I started. It was just this little, uh, the, the sales team, the, the support team, the engineering team for these sales tools, which were sort of an experiment at that point, uh, would kind of operated like its own little startup within the company. Um, but fast forward, I don't know, six or eight months, uh, the sales products are taking off, people are liking them. And so our CEO, Brian Halligan announced, we're gonna stop operating like two companies. We're gonna have one support team, one sales team, one engineering team, and HubSpot Academy is gonna start teaching sales stuff. And, uh, and the people on the academy team at that point were sort of shocked and overwhelmed because they'd only been teaching marketing things. They, most of them hadn't even seen or used the CRM at that point. And so they, they asked my manager, hey, is there anyone on your team that you think would, would be into this? And he's like, well, I know Kyle wanted to be a professor, so <laughs> he'd probably be interested. And so I came over. And, and, and so this is early 2016 now. I joined the academy team. And my initial heading was just teach people how to use the CRM. And as a, as a support rep who had been teaching people to use the CRM, that was pretty easy for me. But then that slowly expanded into teaching sales strategies. Um, and I, I had had a short and miserable failed career at sales uh, a few years earlier. Um, that was really daunting to me. But what I quickly learned is that there are lots of experienced sales practitioners out there who are happy to tell you how to do things the way they do things, right? They say, this is how I beat quota every month. You can be like me if you just you know, pay me money and I'll tell you my, what, what I do instead, because I cannot claim my own expertise is I operate as a sales researcher. I talk to a whole bunch of different sales reps who are having success. I talk to a whole bunch of different sales managers who are having success. I talk to a whole bunch of different VPs and CEOs and just anyone in a company that's doing well who will talk to me. I ask them what they're doing, what, what mistakes have they made, what is working, what's not working. And then I can find these patterns that exist out in the world and package them together into education. And it's no longer, this is just my opinion. This is no longer just, uh, you know, I, I, it works for me in my career, so maybe it'll work for you too. It, it, it's, this seems to be a lot of the way the modern world operates, right? And, uh, 
and and that combined with with HubSpot's you know intense focus on on inbound and helpful uh, approaches, our, our flywheel model of business, uh, we we roll it all together, and and it it helps a lot of people in various sales roles sell better. Yeah, I think it's been super effective, and I was just. Uh, going back a little bit down memory lane and thinking about that time, like 14, 15, when the CRM had just come out. And I remember specifically giving feedback a number of times, when is there going to be training on how to use <laughs> the, there was like almost no knowledge base articles. Yeah. You're right. I remember getting two different invoices. It, was, it really was, had the feeling of like two distinct companies. And I remember yeah. talking to one of my uh, friends from our hug who had figured out how to use HubSpot as a, as a CRM, even before it actually was a CRM. And there was just like a huge shortage of tools and training, but I knew at some point uh, Academy would end up putting some um, resources into this, but what you've done has just been phenomenal. I was just thinking as you were describing going out and curating all these great experts, when the original, uh, version of the sales management course came in. What is there like eight or 10 or 12 different subject matter experts in there? It's fantastic. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. So I, I in 2017, uh, so I've been on the team a few years. We had sort of some base level um, education in there about sales. And I had this realization, you know, HubSpot teaches, HubSpot Academy teaches a lot about marketing and HubSpot has marketing tools. HubSpot Academy teaches a lot about sales and we have sales tools. And we sort of imply that the two should work together since we offer one platform that has both, but we didn't explain how to make that happen in reality. Um, and so I said to my, my leaders, you know, the, the heads of, of HubSpot Academy, like, I think we should create a course that teaches sales and marketing how to work together. And they said to me, okay, how do you make sales and marketing work together? <laughs> I said, I don't know. And so uh, I, I, me and a uh, guy, Steven, on the video team here at HubSpot, we basically just took a camera and interviewed uh, anyone who would talk to us who was a leader at any sort of company just to hear their horror stories about marketing and sales not working together or their success stories about marketing and sales working together effectively and, and figuring out how what that looked like and packaging it together. And that eventually came became what is now known as the, the sales enablement certification because the patterns that emerged about how a marketing team can support a sales team around content and training and these sorts of things all kind of fall under this umbrella of sales enablement which is counterintuitive because usually sales enablement is handled by someone in the sales department. But I think there's a real opportunity for marketing to, to add a lot of value there. And so we published that course uh, late 2017. And there's this guy, Corey Bray, he and uh, Hillman Sori are, are great. They, they wrote this book called the, the Sales Enablement Playbook. It's short, it's, it's pithy, it's super actionable. They write a lot of really short, really helpful books on sales related things. Um, he showed up on some uh, internet forum somewhere, somewhat a couple days after sales enablement certification went live. Someone posted and said, "Hey, HubSpot just released a sales enablement course. Has anyone taken it?" How it? And and Corey hops on and says, yeah, "I've taken it. It's terrible. I hate it. Here's all the things that's wrong with it." And I was crushed. Uh, but I, I was like, "Who is this guy?" I look him up and see he's written a book. And I read his book and I was like, "Oh man." This book is actually really good. <laughs> this is someone who's, whose opinion I value. So I, I, I got in contact with him and I said, hey, loved your book. Just want to let you know, I think it's great. Uh, by the way, I released, I, I'm I, the guy who headed up the sales enablement course that you are not a fan of. I would love your input on how we can make it better. And he was just floored. And he said, that, wow, thank you. I'm so sorry. Like uh, uh, there are things that are good. I think the main thing I was uh, uh, offended by is, is you focus so much on marketing. You didn't talk about all the things a sales team has to do for itself. And he came up with a list of like five or six things. And so then we did the same thing, set up a camera, interviewed him. I asked him, who else should I be talking to? He sent me off to two people in his network. And that's where the sales management course came from. It, it came out uh, less than a year later. And it was just this follow-up to here's the stuff we missed in the sales enablement course. And those two courses together, I find a lot of people seem to take them together. We don't, we don't package them that way, but I think just organically, they, they cover related enough topics and have the same look and feel that people take them together. And then you get this really holistic approach to what a sales team can do for itself to, to improve itself over time uh, in the sales management course. And then what the marketing team can do to add additional value there in sales enablement. And it, it's just so fantastic that that just started as a question I had, we had internally, how do you get marketing and sales to work together? Um, and, and as I went out and talked to people, we discovered uh, so many companies are, are, are asking the same question. And so many of them have a piece of the puzzle, right? They find one little thing that works, but they're, they're not noticing this other thing over here. And as you pull it all together, it, 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 it comes together into this really pretty remarkable piece of content. 
I think part of it too is the more of a startup y kind of environment you work in where everyone's expected to be really resourceful, the more critical it is for marketing to have a little bit of hands-on day in the life experience of what sales is going through and vice versa. So it's almost like if you could just get your sales team to not only go through some of the sales resources, but take the one-on-one, like the intro to inbound marketing and vice versa. If you could just get the inbound marketers to take the inbound sales training program, a couple hours there to understand the best practices, they'd be in so much better shape to be better team members, better collaborate. Yeah, for sure. I, I spend a lot of time on LinkedIn. Uh, people post their certifications they get from HubSpot Academy. And I try to congratulate everyone. And I'm surprised how often uh, there will be marketers, right? I, I, their title on LinkedIn is digital marketer or whatever, um, or marketing intern even. Um, and here they are posting the inbound sales certification. And I'll ask them like, well, why did you take it? What did you learn? They're like, oh, I understand so much better now what uh, the, the sales team is doing. I find salespeople are a little less uh, inclined to, to do that sort of empathy kind of research. I think they're just heads down and under a quota and it's hard for them to look up and, and do any sort of personal enrichment. But I do occasionally find salespeople taking uh, just the inbound course or, or uh, you know, what, like the sales enablement or, or, or even like a social media marketing uh, certification. And I think anytime anyone does that, not just marketing and sales, if you can, if you can invest some time in understanding what your colleagues need to do, um, not so you can tell them what to do, but so you can understand better what they're trying to do. I think that goes a long way. Two, at some point with getting rid of the potential for silos, having that buy-in from the top down and in a small company would be a, a CEO and a larger company would probably be someone in a, a senior role that's a champion of the whole thing of bringing everyone together is so critical. I remember a couple dozen of us went down to Richmond maybe five or six years ago and Marcus Sheridan before he, um, while he was still actively building Sales Lion. Um, led a great workshop with a couple dozen HubSpot partners specifically around this on leading great workshops and getting the sales and marketing and CEO all working together to buy into the whole, whole idea of using content. And it was before they ask you answer, but it's the same basic idea. Yeah, man, I'm seriously envious. <laughs> I was not invited to that. Uh, it's good, uh, good timing though. So what I wanted to get your thoughts on today is for someone that is brand new to B2B marketing, B2B sales, but is thinking that digital content inbound needs to be a core part of their playbook, where would you tell them to start? What's super critical for a beginner to focus on that's brand new to B2B? I think uh, <laughs> weird piece of advice here. Don't really, don't, don't like come to HubSpot's website and see what HubSpot is doing, right? HubSpot has been doing inbound marketing for uh, more than a decade, we have enormous resources we put into it now. That is not where you should try to start. I think a lot of people get ahead of themselves. They see the companies that are really great at content and they wanna get straight to that. And you can start pretty small and pretty inexpensive with content. I think the main thing you need to focus on is, is just understanding what it is your customers need. What is it they come to you for? And understanding too that you know, when it comes to your product, uh, you know, there's always going to be some competitor who is cheaper than you. There's always going to be some competitor who has a better product than you do. Um, but you can can really own content and education. You are an expert in something, right? Your your sales team, especially as they're on the phone or or however they communicate with with your leads, uh, they they hear the questions and the problems that people are trying to address. They hear the solutions they've tried that haven't worked. They they hear the dilemmas they're stuck in as they try to choose between option A and option B. And that is what people come to your sales team for. That's, that's what they need help sorting through. And if you can package some of that into online education, written content, or video content, um, that will go a really long way. And you know, your, your sales reps today, I can almost guarantee you, have emails that they write the exact same email over and over and over, day in and day out. Uh, I mean, if they're smart, they have some sort of template tool, but still, they're <laughs> sending the same email over and over, answering these same questions day in and day out. And if you could just have them take a five minute break and turn on their webcam and record a video explaining answers to free, uh, some, one of your frequently asked questions and put that on YouTube, um, now, now you have content, right? And it didn't take you long to make and it's not fancy and it's not polished, but if it's helpful, it'll resonate. And, and that's then a resource that either your marketing team and your sales team, when they get questions like, hey, you know what? We have a helpful video on that. Send it on over or a blog post if, if you want to take the time to write it up whatever form the content is in, and then you have one piece of content, right? And you can do that over and over and over again and start to build out this library. 
this is very much the Marcus Sheridan approach, I realize now as I'm saying it, uh, but just like answering these questions, um, that's that's where where you can begin. And, and you can do, you know, you can take our, our content marketing course and learn a lot about content strategy and, and you can take our SEO course and learn about that. And you should invest in all those things. But I think before you do any of that, just backing up and understanding who your customer is and what it is they want help with um, and then helping them help themselves um, is going to build a, a, a level of trust with your brand that uh, that is really the precursor to having a steady flow of customers in the digital space. Um, and that, yeah, anyway, that was a long answer. I, I think the short answer is just don't know, is start small and start cheap, right? You don't need, I, I now, because I film my lessons here at home, I have a, a fancy DSLR camera and it has like a teleprompter housing, right? But when the pandemic first hit a year ago, I was recording my lessons on an iPad, uh, right? And uh, they were fine, <laughs> they worked. Um, and and it's nice that I work at a company that has the resources to in, invest in bells and whistles. But if you're just looking to educate people, your smartphone will probably do the job if you need to record a video or your webcam. Um, I post totally unscripted short little videos on LinkedIn all the time and they help people a lot. Um, and I've realized you don't need high production value. You don't need a huge investment of money or time to, to create content that makes a difference. And, and, and thinking of it in that way, I think will we'll take some of the edge off of trying to jump into the water, right? Oh, it seems so intimidating. How can we afford this? Who's, who's got the skills to write, uh, you know, a, a blog post worthy of a Pulitzer Prize? Like, well, maybe nobody, but don't, don't worry about that. Just start by starting and then, and then you can improve over time. I think some of the silver lining of the past 12 months we've gone through is going back four or five years ago when I talked about video content with clients, they all of a sudden tensed up and they were thinking that they needed a videographer for the day and it was going to be a $5,000 video. And it's like, now people are super comfortable realizing that Zoom and go to meeting and WebEx and all these other teams are, are is the studio essentially. Yeah. And you, know, you can buy some bells and whistles, but like a couple hundred dollars can really, really check off the box to get you exact. And at, at some point it becomes more of a strategy issue than, um, than tools and tactics and yeah for sure and i mean if you are going into video and and you do have a little bit of money to spend uh, my my pro tip there is invest in audio before you invest in video like this this webcam i'm on right now is fine um and i'm wearing this headset for the for the audio the audio is probably not awesome i do have a fancy mic i could use but then you would pick up my son who is in first grade zoom right now um, but it's just like as long as people can understand the words you're saying the video piece is sort of secondary um, you don't need a super fancy camera. You don't need lighting and things, um, at least not for your first set of videos. So that's great advice that people, when they think about emulating HubSpot, should be thinking about emulating HubSpot in like 2008 to 2010. Right. And, uh, and, Absolutely. Because uh, everybody has to start there, right? Yeah. We, did, we didn't start where we are today. Uh, HubSpot Academy grew out of this thing called uh, Content Camp. Content Camp, yeah. Uh, and it was... Uh, it was webinars, right? It was not pre-recorded. I don't, I don't even think there was a video portion. I think it was just kind of like yeah. voiceover slides, you know. And, and uh, look, here we are today, right? Yeah. And 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 I think, I mean, I remember growing up. Uh, it's sort of an extended metaphor here. I got lots of advice from like church leaders and 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 uh, people, uh, teachers at school and stuff, who would say, you know. You look at your parents today, they have a house, they have a car, they have all this nice stuff. You need to remember when you become an adult, you won't start there. You will be living in a small and dirty apartment and eating tortillas, <laughs> you know, and then and then you grow from there. And um, as a kid, that just just like, yeah, I get it. OK, that's obvious. But I think in every aspect of our life, we do that right when we go into a career. We want to be great at it the first day when we when our company launches digital marketing. We want to we want to be awesome at it the first day. And, and that's just not the way life works. You, you start small, you start basic, start sort of rudimentary and, and you grow from there. I saw, I forget who posted it. Someone on LinkedIn recently posted a quote saying, if your old work doesn't make you cringe, you're not growing. And I think that's an important thing to remember, right? Like you don't have to make something today that you'll be proud of forever. You just need to make something today that you can build on tomorrow. Um, and, and so that's, that's my advice there. I remember right around the time we started using HubSpot, which would have been maybe in summer of 2010, Brian Halligan was actually still doing webinars and was still blogging and talking about how he, the blogging process that they were 
utilizing. So yeah, it's, yeah. You know, it's in, in companies at the stage where there's a few dozen employees. Yeah. It's very much in all, all hands on deck with getting the content marketing. It's why yeah. we're spending. Um, so thinking about now someone that's been at this for quite some time, maybe they've had PubSpot been doing content inbound digital for five or 10 years and, they had a really tough year the last year and they're trying to reset and get back on track. What, what advice would you offer to someone to relaunch and get their content and whole digital program for B2B back on track? I, I think uh, my advice would be very much the same as my advice for the new people. Uh, I think there's this tendency with, with digital marketing to, as you grow, start making improvements and investments that your, your customer doesn't feel, right? Those bells and whistles I was talking about, do people get any more learning out of a HubSpot Academy video that is filmed on a DSLR camera versus one filmed on an iP- iPad? Probably not, you know? Um, there, are, there, are thing, there are reasons internally that that's advantageous to us. It makes the editing process much easier. Uh, and so that's why we invested in it and we think the end result looks better. But as far as education goes, we need to be focusing, like me and, and, and the other professors on the team need to be focusing on how, uh, you know, what topics do we need to be teaching? How, how can we teach them better? How can we make them clearer, more accessible? And I think um, the same applies to all sorts of uh, digital transformation things. If, if you're looking at your website or if you're looking at your blog or if you're looking at your social media strategy or your education or your video or wh- what, whatever you do in your, your digital strategy um, and you're looking for ways to make improvement, uh, y- you've got to tie yourself back to what it is you're trying to help that customer do. Um, otherwise, you'll you'll make improvements, you know, that that make your website prettier, maybe, um, but don't necessarily uh, make it uh, more accessible or useful. I, I I feel like all the time these days, this this seems to have happened recently. I don't know if this is like a, a milestone for me getting older, <laughs> that, that I'm super old, but like I visit websites all the time now, and I can't find what I'm looking for because they've invested so much in cool design, right? Things are moving as I'm scrolling, and there's different colors, and the menus are all over the place, and things appear and disappear. And like, I just want to know where the information I'm looking for is, right? I don't, I don't care if it's if it's a single column of unformatted text, if the information I'm looking for is there, that's what I want, right? And if you've got all these cool transitions when I click buttons and and different colors and things, that's fun. But if it makes it harder for me to find what I'm looking for, that's actually a step backwards. And so I, I think design is important. I, I don't mean to, to say design is not important. Um, I, I think if you're in a position to invest in design, invest in design, but make sure you're, you're investing in usable, accessible design, right? That, that user experience uh, is, is very important. And just surfacing the things that people are looking for, prioritizing the things that they want and need um, should be your your top priority always. So whether you have been in a bit of a slump and you're you're resurfacing, or you know if you're Zoom and and this pandemic is the best thing that's ever happened to you, um, I think just never losing sight of what it is you're trying to help people do. What is it people come to your website to accomplish? What what is it they you know make that the main purpose of it? Not not the brand colors and the you know cool transitions as we're scrolling and clicking and and that sort of thing. Interesting is I remember years ago, we had a number of heated conversations at the user group at the hug meetings about this very issue. And a lot of times internal marketers were butting heads with IT that was controlling the website. And I think a lot of times what ended up happening is they just didn't want to burn the political capital on owning the main website. And they did their thing just really aggressively on the blogs and on the landing pages and on email and social and let that all that stuff play out. But when I think about like the whole growth driven design movement and being able to optimize and really do true conversion rate optimization and everything, it's really hard to, to uh, eventually you have to confront the battle of making sure the strategy on site aligns with everything else that's been doing. Yeah, for sure. And I mean, I, oh, everything I just said is a bit of a hot take, I guess, even internally HubSpot has a, a wiki of just internal wiki for, for, uh, you know, employee information and uh, there's been a lot of design investments in that recently. And uh, I don't know, six months ago or something, I was, I was just blo- uh, posting a short informational post. I ran it by my manager first. Hey, is this okay? She's like, oh yeah, but here we have this fancy new template. Can you just use the template? And, and then there's like multiple columns and like things are in different spots. And for me, I published it. I just like, I don't, I wrote this thing and I'm confused by it now. I don't know which piece of text I'm supposed to read first. And like, yeah looks nice but it's not as readable as just my 
solid wall of text was. Anyway, I suppose I'm old fashioned in this regard, but that's, if, if you're marketing to me, keep your website simple. <laughs> When we think about simple, you have the advantage in working with a team of academy professors where there's still still very much more resources going into the marketing side than in the sales side, but you're very much in, infused with that. When you think about the strategy that takes someone through the, adjourn, uh, the journey and they move through awareness and consideration and decision, what do you think is super important for people to keep in mind to get that right aside from just the basic awareness of contextualizing what they're creating content around? Yeah, I think definitely contextualizing is, is really important. But I, I, I mean, when I think about the, the inbound methodology, which for anyone who's not familiar, the, the really short version is there are three stages. You attract people, you engage with them, and then you delight them so much that they attract other people to you, right? Word of mouth goes out and, and it accelerates. Um, that's, of course, I would never say anything disparaging about the, the inbound religion that's sort of like, or the inbound methodology is sort of the religion of, of HubSpot. Um, but like the word delight is the one that stands out to me. And I think at every phase of everything you're doing, you should be delighting people, right? You shouldn't, that's, if, if, you're, if your sales approach or your marketing approach or whatever is sort of like, you know, suffer through with this and, and, and there's a light at the end of the tunnel, right? It'll get good later. That's, that's not great, right? Like why can't it be enjoyable for someone who very first lands on your website and is navigating and learning about your company? Uh, why can't there be delight moments in that, right? Why can't it be a delightful experience when they're on the phone with your sales rep and negotiating pricing or whatever? How do you make this enjoyable at every step uh, or at least beneficial? Um, and then, you know, at the end, when you actually deliver your product, yes, that absolutely should delight them so that they go out and, and tell other people. But I mean, we, HubSpot's sales team is pretty fantastic. And, and we get emails occasionally from people who are just like, wow, you know, uh, we really thought we were going to go with your competitor, but then your salesperson was just so nice. And that salesperson was trying to stiff arm me into buying something I didn't know if I wanted. And, and so I went with HubSpot because the guy was just so nice, you know? And like, I, I think that's real. I think that really matters. Um, people in a B2B setting, um, your, your potential clients or, or customers or whatever you call them are looking for a partnership of some sort. They're looking for someone who can help them succeed in whatever their job is, right? And, uh, and so you've got to make them feel that you're invested, that you care about them uh, from the very beginning. Um, there should not really be any part of, of that uh, funnel or flywheel or cycle or however you think about it, where they feel like uh, they're jumping through hoops for you, right? Like you should be the one uh, it, you know, serving them from the beginning. Uh, and I think that is true at, at every stage, beginning, middle, and end. Yeah, the usability and even that whole concept with the frictionless sales, I think scratches the itch of people that are just doing so much more research on their own that they're talking. They don't want to talk to a salesperson early on anymore. They want to talk to a salesperson after they've done all the research and yeah. they're going to bring tough, much tougher questions than they would have five or 10 years ago because they can yeah. get all the, all the easy answers before they ever get there. Right. And hopefully, right? Like again, backing up our conversation, invest in that. Make sure you are providing those answers. Don't, uh, don't, I mean, if they come to your website and you don't have answers to, to their questions, they'll go to someone else's website and then they might never come back. So, yeah. Where do you, final uh, final thoughts on where you think B2B is headed? What's the big thing you think that you see changing in the next one to three years with B2B that's going to catch a lot of companies off guard and that the the ones on the leading edge are already starting to figure out? Uh, I, think, I think we're going to see B2B in a lot of cases becoming much more, I, I hate to say the word transactional because that feels somehow disparaging or, or negative. I, I, I don't know. But I, I think, I mean, the ability to purchase things through a website or to um, try things out for free uh, is going to become far more common, self-service sorts of things in, in B2B. I mean, some B2B things, right? If you are negotiating a long-term contract that is worth millions of dollars, there's always going to be in-person interactions there. And I I, I do not believe that the, the end of B2B salespeople is anywhere in sight, and I don't think we should want it to be. I think salespeople can add a huge amount of value, but I think many companies will find for smaller offerings, um, you know, for, for events or, or for consultations or something, um, a, a, a sort of e-commerce feel will be uh, appreciated, and, and, and you'll find more and more 
I, I think maybe self-service just in general. So whether that's that smaller transactions that can be paid for through the website, or if it's live chat or chat box answering questions in real time or, or whatever the case may be, I, I think uh, B2B purchases will stop being this enormous, you know, six month sales cycle sort of thing where we are investing in, in conversations and, and, and at the end you sign and then you get everything. I think we're going to see it broken down into little bite-sized pieces and these are the bits you get for free and these are the bits that are self-service and these are the bits that you just transactionally pay f- with a credit card through a website just like b2c sellers do and then you know the big it, it all builds up in the end to that that big purchase still um and and i but i, I just think we're going to find ways to break it down <laughs> to make it happen more gradually in smaller pieces free bits inexpensive bits uh all culminating in that big purchase instead of just being one big transaction that's negotiated over the course of several months. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. I don't remember the exact data, but I know a lot of the VCs that are big in SaaS have looked at like what's the lifetime value where a company can afford to do inside sales? What's the lifetime value where a company can afford to do field sales? And then now what we've gone through the last 12 months, the whole field sales model has been rethought <laughs> like used to with the conventional wisdom is you can't close a six-figure deal without you know, flying out to the prospect and, and visiting yeah. and closing in person, but somehow companies have managed to close six figure, and seven figure deals over Zoom. Yeah. 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 And I'll be really interested to see how that shakes out. Right. Once, once the, once we are all safe and healthy and we're able to go back to, to flying around and being in person without fear or restrictions um, or danger of any sort, uh, do we, right. And I assume the answer is a qualified yes. I think there will still be times that that is valuable and that we do invest in that. Um, but I think, I hope uh, every company will be a lot more thoughtful about like, well, you know, if the sales rep talks to them over Zoom, instead of us having to pay tickets and lodging and, and you know, fancy restaurant bills, uh, where can we reinvest that money in, in other ways that, that our customers will actually appreciate even more? Um, and the answers to that are, they remain to be seen, right? That's a big TBD. But uh, it, you you said one to three years. I bet in in one to three years, we're starting to see some some patterns and answers emerge there. Yeah, I mean, after every big economic shock, you know, the housing collapse in two thousand eight and following nine eleven, there was just so much transformation that happened with IT. You know, prior yeah. to it, 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 early generation WebEx, more video conferencing, more digital, the emergence of smartphone, social, cloud, consumerization of IT, all of these were largely happening at the same time and probably had a more warm, receptive environment just because of the hardships that so many companies were dealing with and being forced to be creative. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot to be said for, for the value of constraints on creativity. I, I don't know. Uh, I, don't, I don't wish for these downturns. I don't wish for these global crises, right? Um, but, you know, from the ashes of disaster rise the roses of success. So <laughs> enforces more creative solutions. But yeah, this Kyle, this has been super helpful to get your thoughts on B2B and inbound and providing helpful content and marketing and sales, working more closely together and just focusing so much more energy on what your potential clients, what your potential customers need to hear from you before you get to a sales conversation. I know in terms of people being able to follow what you work on, I know you're super active on LinkedIn and have those great videos. You seem to do just about every day. You know, you have great courses at Academy. What's, what's the best social media channels, the best website where people can learn more about what you're working on, what Academy's working on if they want to get more plugged into this? Yeah, definitely uh, find me on LinkedIn. Uh, it's it's, it's it, I-N slash Kyle Anthony Jepson, all one word, no hyphens or anything between it. Uh, that is definitely where I am most active online. Um, and then all my uh, all my official Academy content is, is at academy.hubspot.com. Um, I, I, yeah, I, I am, I am a little bit active on Twitter. Mostly when I post things on LinkedIn, I check the box to have them also post on Twitter. That's, that's at Kyle underscore Jepson. Um, but LinkedIn, if, if you uh, send me a connect request, let me know you, you heard me on this, on this podcast. I, I'll be happy to connect with you. We can DM, we can even set up a, a zoom meeting. If you have things you want to talk about, I, I love to interact with anyone who is who is in this space and, and thinking about things or trying things or struggling with things. Let's, let's talk. And Kyle's content is just, is fantastic. The value that you're going to get from going through the courses that are up on HubSpot Academy between inbound sales and sales enablement and sales management, frictionless sales. And if you use HubSpot, the, the sales software specific ones is 
if I was the dean of a digital marketing program in an expensive private university, I'd be very nervous <laughs> about how fantastic HubSpot's free, free uh, training is. Well, thank and you. I'm a huge fan of it. I've been recommending it for years. Can't say enough great things about it. But thanks so much, Kyle, for joining me on this podcast. It's been super, super helpful. Yeah, thank you. All this the best. Is fun. Thanks for listening to this episode of the B2B Digitized Podcast. To subscribe and leave a review, check us out at b2bdigitize.com or wherever you like to consume podcast episodes, including Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and YouTube. You're making the right, right decision there because that never ends well. Yeah. Because they don't know what they don't know. And perhaps worse, they don't have the humility to, you know, acknowledge that. Um, and they're going to say, well, it, it, it reminds me years ago at some chamber of commerce function, some guy that owned an IT firm was talking about something on a panel. And he said, advertising doesn't work. I bought an ad once and nothing happened. That always stuck in my mind. And that is exactly who you were talking to. We hired a HubSpot person. How come I'm not minting money? <laughs> Welcome to the B2B Digitized Podcast, where leaders of B2B technology startups and scale-ups learn how to use digital transformation to differentiate, educate, build trust, improve competitive positioning, close sales faster without compromise, and scale revenue growth. Now, here's your host, Joshua Feinberg from SP Home Run. Hi, I'm Joshua Feinberg from the B2B Digitized Podcast, and I have with me today a very special guest and good friend, Douglas Burdett, who is host of the Marketing Book Podcast and founder of Artillery, a marketing consultancy based in Norfolk, Virginia. Douglas, thanks so much for joining me for the podcast. Welcome. Good to reconnect with you and, and say hi to Jennifer for me. I definitely will, for sure. So I think the first place to start, what I'm super curious about is I've known okay, you. Okay, I know what these... you're going to ask. Those <laughs> charges were dropped, Josh. Okay. <laughs> oh, awesome. so you're not going to ask that? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> the uh, first place I wanted to start is I've known you probably about seven or eight years. What led you to originally want to start a podcast about marketing and sales books. And I know it was originally marketing, but it's morphed into the critical relationship that marketing and sales now enjoys together. Yeah. I think after about 60 interviews, I finally had my first sales book, which was New Sales Simplified by um, Mr. We Mike Weinberg, mm -hmm. which is a book that member HubSpot would recommend that to us as the yeah, one sales yeah. book and a fantastic book. Um, I've had now had about 50. Um, it's a, it's an interesting question and it takes me back to, uh, I can remember a couple of years ago and actually an author who's been on the show a couple of times, he saw me at a conference and he said, are you making money on your podcast? And I said, not, not really, but that's not why I started it. <laughs> so I guess in the podcast world, I'm not doing it right. Um, I, ideally what you want to do is, um, uh, build a, a, a watering hole for the specific animal you want to hunt. Uh, you want to do something about that specific niche and, and then maybe even interview prospective customers for your podcast. What, what I did was I came, uh, I did it for very personal reasons and that's why I'm probably able to keep doing it. Um, I came from a real advertising background. I worked at big agencies in, in New York city for a number of years and then uh, moved to Virginia and, and 20 years ago started my own firm. And then it was real advertising focused for a long time, but a lot of that started to go away. You know, uh, unfortunately, a lot of industries change if you stay in them long enough. And so I started to feel less and less uh, relevant and it really was bothering me probably more than most people. Like for instance, uh, having to bring a website person to a client meeting and hear them talk about, uh, SSL or, you know, <laughs> some, some sign of servers or whatever. And I'm just thinking, or then they start asking about what was a fad, which is the internet and social media. Those are clearly fads that aren't going to. So anyway, the, I, my, my background was in advertising and I just started feeling like I was kind of growing dinosaur scales. And I didn't like that. And I went back to doing what I had done in grad school, which is, you know, reading a lot of books. 
And I stumbled upon uh, David Maron Scott's, one of his early editions of the new rules of marketing and PR. And that really crystallized where the whole world was going because of the uh, internet and technology and social media and all that type of things. He's now up to his seventh edition in that book. And I felt like I had a second bite at the career apple, like, ah, oh, I see where it's going. That led me to uh, ultimately meet you at a HubSpot inbound conference. I, I, I started going in that direction. We don't buy, we, we buy very little advertising now for clients. We're doing a lot of content and that type of thing. But I remember thinking, I don't ever want to be in that situation again. I need to, I just, I, I hated it so much. And so I had uh, always been listening to podcasts. I always like listening to marketing podcasts. I particularly like podcasts where they interviewed authors of, of books. And so along the way, um, I thought, well, you know, maybe I should try this. And so I, I started the podcast and the first guest was David Merman Scott. And uh I interviewed about the first 10 and I had already read all their books and I had even met some of them at conferences, you know, like people like Ann Hanley or Joe Polizzi or Mark Schaefer, uh, the, 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 the really big time authors. They were very generous with their time. I got to about the 11th book and I realized, wait a minute, I'm actually going to have to read each one of these books. It's like taking the wrong exit on the interstate and you realize you can't turn around for another 20 minutes, but, but it's, 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 it's fueled that uh, desire that I have to want to try to keep up with what's going on. And in other words, it's like a regular program of doing it. So now I'm up to 320 something books and that have been on the show and uh, it's uh, it's good. It, it, you know, gives me some idea of what's going on. It's helpful for clients. It's helpful for me. Um, fills me with ideas, but the other thing that gets you going and you'll find this as the, you continue to do your podcast, you start to hear from people. And they, they'll say to me, I hear from them now every week, and they'll say, hey, I've been listening to your show for a couple of years. Just want to say thanks. It's really been helpful. Or it helped me get a promotion. Or just these amazing things. And I'm thinking, oh, man, I better take this more seriously. <laughs> I didn't know the impact I was having on people. So now it's got over 2 million downloads, and it's in over 155 countries. And th that's why I started it. But it's really more of a professional development as performance art, sort of a occupational hobby. It's not the main thing I do. And I'm not, there are some advertisers and I, I do need to charge them. Um, but some of that has to do with my time <laughs> that's involved. But otherwise I probably, uh, if you look at, if you look me up under in the dictionary under podcast monetization, there's probably not a picture of me as somebody who's doing it exactly right. Oh, no, you still deserve a huge congratulations for getting to 300 plus episodes. I heard someone a couple of weeks ago talk about the term pod fade, where virtually everyone at some point drops off the cliff at eight episodes, 20 episodes, 40 episodes, 100 episodes. That's amazing perseverance, amazing endurance. And it sounds like it's been super helpful for professional development and building relationships. Yeah, yeah, it is. And I, I really, I have such admiration for these people who write these books. Um, I'm sure you collect autograph for Lord of Marlins uh, sports memorabilia uh, or more maybe the Jets. I don't know since you're from New Jersey, but uh, I collect autograph marketing and sales books. And I have such admiration for these people that write these books. I, I don't want to write one. I'm too busy reading them, but it's just, uh, it, it, it's, it's so helpful. And I'm a person who at a couple points in my career read a book, particularly two books that the right book at the right time can really uh, looking back, make a big difference. So if I can help people discover the right book at the right time, that's good. And that's why so many listeners contact me uh, asking for book recommendations. They'll say, I'm, I'm, I'm working on this or I'm challenged on this particular area. Is there, do you know of a book about that? And quite often I'm able to send them a link to an interview about the book and they can listen to it and see if that might be, might be helpful or, or point them to whatever resource would be helpful for them. Like a book concierge, like call down to the yeah, front desk sort of, and say, yeah. I'm, I'm looking for four new books to improve my uh, craft this quarter. What do you recommend? Yeah. Or like a, somebody like this, this week, um, somebody said, I'm going from becoming a, a peach, speech pathologist, which I thought was a pretty good line of work, but she's going into marketing instead. And I said, oh, okay, I know just what book is she, is she, you know, or somebody who's a more senior person or they've just been assigned to a certain task force. And I'm like, gosh, thanks for listening. Have you read this one? You know, if I can, I don't want anyone else to have to read 350 
books to find the right one <laughs> or two for something that's going to help them right now. It, it only takes a few seconds. So it's kind of the fun thing I get to do during the day is hear from listeners and, and, and make a recommendation or point them in the right direction. I think what's interesting too is in the five, six, seven years or so that you've been hosting all these interviews, there's been such a dramatic shift in how people view formal education. Even before the pandemic, the big college scholarship scandal a couple of years ago and tremendous amount of frustration over college debt and people rethinking, do I really, you know, $150,000 for an MBA, what's the ROI going to be on that? It's, you know, relatively easy for someone to find a few hundred dollars a year to buy a very respectable library of books. Maybe they have an audible subscription or getting them on Kindle. Yeah. And you know, um, not that you asked, but that is so <laughs> important. I want to mention something. There um, have been some, a few books over the years that talk, that were more about what marketers should be doing, like with their own career and to be successful rather than a specific topic like Google ads or Facebook advertising or content marketing or whatever. And uh, the really, and, and in several different studies and books talk about how the most successful marketers are the ones that have a learning mindset. In other words, they're always teaching themselves and an even larger number of CEOs have that looking back over some, some study that started 40 or 50 years ago, they were very much into self-improvement teaching themselves. And, uh, this is at a time when companies are spending less and less money training their employees, but there's never been a better time to, to, to learn. I mean, like even your audience, you know, they're, they're probably pretty focused on, on learning something new and, and improving their results and, and, and their career. And uh, there was a video I saw of Brian Halligan, one of the HubSpot founders, and they were, the interviewer was asking what kind of, it was, I think it was a video about startup culture or something, and they've been enormously successful. And they said, what do you look for when you hire someone? And obviously at a marketing and sales software company like HubSpot, there are a lot of marketers there. What do you look for? And he said, the number one thing I look for, and this isn't the opposite of a know-it-all, but it, it is a learn-it-all. I, I, that's the number one thing they're looking for is someone who and I, they probably know how to tell are they capable of teaching themselves something, figuring it out, and then going and doing it? I just thought that was fascinating that that was the, the number one thing that they look for now because they're obviously in the technology space. Marketing is changing quite a bit. Um, and it, it, you can imagine it goes really well with an entrepreneurial environment like that, but it's a, a learn it all. Somebody who has demonstrated that they can they have the desire and the motivation to go teach themselves something. That's why I'm always telling, um, I'm always telling the kids these days, <laughs> go get some of those free HubSpot certifications or a Google certification, put it on your LinkedIn profile. That's a big differentiator. Yeah. We we're talking about this a couple of days ago. If you took a teenager in their senior, junior, senior year of high school, and they were taking all of the free HubSpot certifications. And then you layered on a Coursera subscription because Google has those programs now where there's five or six different certifications like project management and data analytics, where for $39 a month, six months later, you have a Google certificate. And then you really, really break the bank and you go get an executive certificate from a prestigious university and something that's really spot on. And those are like a whopping $2,500. That's going to be your highest budget expenditure. It's like all of a sudden, HubSpot certifications, Google program completion, and a digital analytics certification from MIT or Northwestern or Wharton or something like that. And total cost about $3,000. And you just have to yes. wonder at some point if you're the dean of a business, especially private schools, are you going to start getting a little nervous that disruption is right around the corner? And I think that's going to happen faster than we expect. That's always the way it happens. You know, there's more and more people are like, what what are we paying for? But here's something, here's just to add to that, the other side of that coin, say you're an employer and somebody comes through with that kind of unbelievable self-direction and motivation, yeah. you better snap them up. Um, I, I would hope that they would know about writing. They would be a good, good at writing or communicating, but even still that, that, that whole course of action is, is very impressive. Being that entrepreneurial, that resourceful to figure all of that out. You know, it's interesting yeah. too, to even just look at 
what HubSpot's trajectory has been with the whole investment and academy over the last decade, going from like one full-time to now a couple dozen (laughs) full-time professors in multiple languages now. And if you go to their course catalog, like it's like trying to reach the end of the internet. I think there's a more discrete number of few, of a few dozen certifications, but course wise it's in the hundreds. And I guess at some point, you know, originally they started with the idea that they were training people to better utilize software, which for SaaS is super important because if you don't use it, you don't get value and you don't stick. But uh, they pretty quickly thereafter came to the conclusion that it was also super popular and important for people that um, weren't customers and may not be customers for a while. Well, and think about it. Uh, I, Mark Killens, who you probably recall. He used to work at HubSpot Academy. He then went to Drift. I'm not sure where he is now. He may still be there. Is he still there? He, um, uh, I remember once he was given a presentation and he showed a picture of a major league baseball pitcher and it said, teaching is the new pitching. And, And think about the experience that you give somebody by teaching them how to be more successful. Think about the trust that's built for that particular company and the authority that they must have. Um, and when I was a HubSpot user group leader, I can remember, um, there were a number of companies that would come or people came who weren't even using HubSpot. Like there was this one guy from a big tax preparation firm. I think he said he had 11 people in his department and they didn't use the HubSpot software, which is fine. And he said, every new hire, I make them take, you know, one of these two or three courses just because it was so valuable and it's free. Yeah. Um, but that's a lot of goodwill that, that HubSpot um, builds up there. So, mm-hmm. and it's a, such a great example of really effective marketing, content marketing. You know, if you're, if you're helpful, you're going to get further than if you're talking about yourself. They have a really interesting play too. They've explored in the last couple of years with, getting more college professors to use their software in marketing graduate, undergraduate and grad courses. And lines were in college. I worked for IBM for two or three years on a program that was designed to give students and faculty members very aggressive discounts on what was back in the day, state of the art, IBM hardware, their PS2 systems in the early days of windows. And Apple was neck and neck with them at the time and a few other hardware vendors. And the idea was you form all these brand affinities when you're 18, 19, 20 years old and your first time out. And all the consumer products companies were there at the same time. Pre uh, Phone cards. I remember that. Smartphones, consumer products, like uh, the CD, the record CD, music clubs. um, Oh, Columbia House. Yeah. yeah, I remember having having an AT&T card at school. Yeah, yeah. That's interesting. And I remember when that that came out. Um, because I have a you know a relationship with the local university. I was hiring interns from there and I would go in and lecture every once in a while for the, some of the professors. And I remember sharing that uh, with them and some are receptive, some are not. Um, I think they're, some of them are kind of told what they need to teach. Um, but I also, in the back of my mind, was wondering, were they, were they threatened at all by this? I, I don't think so. But interestingly enough, I've started seeing Facebook ads from the local university on a digital certification. (laughs) (laughs) Think about it though. If you're sophomore, junior year in business school, you use HubSpot marketing enterprise for your course, but you get out and you go work for a small business that's about to install their first round of marketing automation. And you already know HubSpot well, are you, is Marketo even on, is Adobe even on the short list? Are you looking at SharpSpring? Are you looking at Infusionsoft? Are you looking at any of these other alternatives or, you learned it so well that HubSpot got first You're mover so comfortable advantage. With it. Yeah. Absolutely. And I think that there's a lot of, um, oh, someone who's under 25, you go set that up. <laughs> like I can remember having a lunch a few years ago with this executive vice president of this big um, shipbuilding company. And they wanted to talk to me. And uh, I remember he then, he brought along to lunch this uh, new marketing person. And she was a young, a recent college grad and uh, seemed, you know, very sharp. And the, I remember at one point during the conversation, he said, yeah, we hired her because she understands the Facebook thing. And they weren't even using Facebook. And I almost, and she looked at me and I was just sort of thinking like, you know, can you blink twice if you're under duress? <laughs> 
<laughs> I know she needed a job. She had student debt probably to pay off and she was very sharp. And sure enough, she's not still there. So she got some experience and moved on to a place, but it was like, okay, if that's what you guys need, I'll, I'll do that for you. But it, it kind of saddened me that there are so many more senior people thinking that they're just it's such a blind spot as to what, what their marketing people could be doing for them and, and how they could be helping them. I think in a lot of small companies, I see what I call premature abdication, where at a certain size, startup, scale up, small size, probably sub 50 employees, the CEO still really needs to be hands-on involved in the marketing and sales strategy because they just simply can't afford someone that's at a strong enough level with the uh, mar digital marketing, marketing automation, sales enablement expertise, and knows their industry well enough to be able to completely punt it. But I usually tell, when people come to me, they're like, how many, how, I don't have time to spend time on this. I'm like, okay, well, the most important thing is we have to figure out a way to position you as an expert, as a thought leader, as a subject matter expert, who in the company fits that role? Because we can get it to the point where you can make a really big dent in an hour a week, but it's not an hour a year. Um, and there's got to be somebody who, who has a ridiculous amount of institutional knowledge that needs to be captured. You know, all of that gets captured into video. And Probably more than one person. And, yeah. Usually it should be a committee. And what makes me yeah. nervous is sometimes when they show up and they're selling to a market and there's no one in the company that checks off the box of being uh, enough of an expert to feel comfortable with turning the webcam on and turning the microphone on in that yeah. role. But it's, it's getting them thinking that the first goal with all of this isn't the tools is the campaigns. It's, oh, it's, it's, con it's strategy and content. This is turning into a support group, and I thank you. <laughs> um, premature abdication, stealing it. I'll, add, awesome. I'll give you full attribution, of course, but I, that is so good. And there was a book on the show not too long ago, The Ultimate Guide to Google Ads. When you get up to heard that one. episode 300 or whatever, I can really start to go out into some very specific areas. I had one on Facebook advertising. And even if you're not a Facebook advertiser or a Google advertiser, those are two fantastic books because the people that are really successful at Facebook advertising and Google advertising are really good at marketing. And they have basically had the basics. Uh, they have the basics down. But there was uh, in the ultimate guide to Google ads, this was the um, Mike Rhodes. He has the largest Google ad agency in, in Australia, I think like the 18th largest in the world. And his last chapter was on hiring an agency. And he couldn't have been clearer. He said, please be careful outsourcing this because there's a couple of reasons. One is you learn quite a bit about your customers and your company through Google advertising in terms of all the massive amounts of testing that you can do. Um, but also um, he was saying that you know, the CEO or somebody, uh, maybe a smaller company, they should try and do as much as they can because they're going to learn so much and they should never relinquish it. In other words, maybe you work with an agency to help get you started, but try to get it back in-house as much as you can because it's much more than just ads. You are learning in real time about, <laughs> about your customers. So I thought that was interesting. I think it showed uh, enormous, uh, you know, authority and credibility and uh, from from him. So... I actually listened to that, that the interview with Mike Rhodes. Um, oh, you did on your podcast. Yeah. What's interesting is when I look at that entire category, the most dangerous um, area for a non-marketer that's hiring a Google ad specialist is when you're working with a small company and they're counting on that one person being their whole digital marketing solution. That that person really has to have a good pulse on lead generation and segmentation and nurturing and personas and how this stuff impacts sales opportunities and the more considerate of the sales process there is, the more heavy high ticket B2B it is, the, the more dangerous it is to just end up with someone that can handle the traffic, but can't connect the dots on, um, on everything else. And it, it's like putting together a, a baseball football team. It's like, you really have to be able to spread that budget around to have good yes. outfielders, good infielders, good starting pitchers, good relief pitchers. It's all, yeah. in, all in one place it doesn't work very well in a, in a small company. Yeah. And I think that, um, well, humans want to find this, you know, path of least resistance, simplest thing. And for a long time, there was a somewhat simple approach that worked for a lot of companies, which was just to buy advertising because you had a somewhat more of a captive audience out there and you could kind of interrupt your way in. Um, of course, now you can't 
very easily interrupt what people are interested in. You have to be what people are interested in. And uh, the, um, the, the companies that, the, there are a lot of companies that still are yearning for that. And they think, I just want a silver bullet. I just want to, you know, I, w- I just want a nail for this one hammer that I have. And it's become, uh, you know, much more complex. And I, I think that it goes back to the four P's of marketing, which is, you know, product, price, place, mint, distribution, and promotion. And so many still think of marketing as just promotion. And the, the truth is marketing now is much more about how you run your company. Marketing is much more about the kind of people you hire and the experience that you give your customers. It, frankly, people don't really believe what companies say about themselves. And, you know, the experience that your company, your customers have with you, you know, the more that your customers can become your marketing, the faster you're going to get traction. But those aren't simple answers. And I'm, <laughs> I'm sorry about that. Yeah. I, I th- you know, it's interesting is when sometimes when people come to me and they already have HubSpot, it's the most challenging possible situation because they're certain they already have the answer and they just need somebody who can press the buttons for them mm-hmm. and having to get them to reset and go back to the drawing board and think about what their actual go-to-market strategy is, who the personas so are. Why where's, are you in business? Where, where's all yeah. the content to load all of this stuff up? It's like, no, 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 wait, I just need somebody to do that. I'm like, okay, then it's, they not, I might not be the right person for you if you just need a technician to press the buttons for you because you're too busy to press them yourself. Well, and also, and I know I must sound like your dad, but you're making the right, right decision there because that never ends well because they don't know what they don't know. And perhaps worse, they don't have the humility to you know, acknowledge that. Um, and they're going to say, well, it, it, it reminds me years ago at some chamber of commerce function, some guy that owned an IT firm was talking about something on a panel. And he said, advertising doesn't work. I bought an ad once and nothing happened that always stuck in my mind. And that is exactly who you were talking to. We hired a HubSpot person. How come I'm not minting money? (laughs) People are laughing to keep from crying. Just so your audience understands that (laughs) in a sales leadership role too, it's equally challenging. If there's not a lack of, if there's not the humility there and the openness to new ideas, because my position is, hey, look, you know, I'm investing 30, 40, 50 hours a year to keep my skills sharp on what I need to do to support a sales team at your size. Can I at least get you to watch the intro to inbound marketing from HubSpot Academy so you kind of sort of get what we're really trying to do here? <laughs> it's yeah, a challenge. Yeah. But that's, you know, uh, our friend Marcus Sheridan, that's good assignment selling. Yeah. Because, you know, in sales, no should be your second favorite word. And the faster you can find that out, you probably save yourself a year or more of heartache and a bad ending. I think the interesting outcome that a lot of people don't think of in a startup in the first couple of years of their business is if you can just get the activity going to get their get them closer to product market fit faster or go to market fit faster, a lot of times they get some very interesting outcomes because if they do the content and the ebooks and the webinars and podcasts, if they do all of that stuff right, they get fans of people that fall in love with their content before they even know what the company does to the point where when they get to the meeting and they're actually talking about their product or service, if they get someone who isn't going to become closed one, the second best outcome is, hey, Douglas, I love what this is about, but you're missing this key feature. And if you added that, I'd sign up yesterday and I have five friends in other companies in similar roles who would also sign up. And when you, you walk away with that and you realize that like they just gave you a hundred thousand dollars worth of, of or a million dollars worth of free consulting there as the consolation prize for not closing them now. They told you exactly what you need to uh, get with your product manager, get with your engineer, build and come back to them in a couple of months and say, okay, now try. Yeah. It's like you have my phones tapped because uh, years back as I was transitioning away from advertising to digital marketing, I was blogging and I was downloading things and, you know, linking to whatever blog post or landing page was just just talking about these different resources. And uh, along the way, I downloaded some stuff from uh, HubSpot. And then a month or so, I can't remember, it was in summer, I saw the caller ID, somebody calling, and normally we we can't answer the phone anymore because it's usually somebody trying to bother us and said HubSpot and I answered it. And they said, hey, Douglas, um, we saw you downloaded the stuff from our website. Did you find what you were looking for? And I said, yeah. And basically the conversation went, I love that stuff on your site. 
I have no idea what you guys do, but I really like all the stuff on your site. And they laughed and said, yeah, we hear that a lot. Can we, could we tell you what we do? I said, yeah, what, what, what do you guys do? I like you. Well, I was our, a week later, I was a customer. Um. <laughs> and so that's, you know, that's, that's one nature of, of how it works, but there were, um, there are three books come to mind. If a lot of your listeners are, are interested in the, the startup world, um, and I can provide you with the links to these interviews, but there were uh, a couple of books that were, I, I wish every startup would read. And one of them was called The Ultimate Startup Guide by Tom Hogan and Carol Broadbent, a couple of Silicon Valley startup marketing agency. And I think they only work with companies that are VC funded now. They've done very well, <laughs> but they, it was funny and they explained where so many startups get it wrong and where they get it right. And the very funny thing in that book at the very beginning, they talked about how the legend of Steve Jobs was the worst thing to happen to startup culture because so many clueless CEOs thought they were supposed to behave that way. He, he was a unicorn, okay? And uh, then there was another book uh, called Beyond Product by Jill Soley. She's a Silicon Valley marketer. And it, it was, again, it was, that was a short book. And she explained this idea of, you know, product market fit in a way that was so crystal clear. And every week she's having to explain this to people who have a lot of money. And these are experienced executives, a lot of engineers, obviously. And they don't quite understand <laughs> where they're going wrong. And I, I remember reading that book thinking, are they, are they really, do you really run into this a lot? And she said all the time, they, it's just a massive blind spot. And there was a, a third book by, uh, you probably have heard of um, the book predictable revenue by uh, Aaron Ross and uh, Mary Lou Tyler. Um, so Aaron Ross then wrote a book after that with Jason Lemkin called from impossible to inevitable. <clears throat> and he's in the startup world, all that sort of thing. And those two guys wrote this book, no theory at all. They say, these are the seven things that every hyper growth company gets right. And he actually came on the show to talk about the second, the second edition of the book. Fantastic book. Fantastic. But those were three that they were so clear. And I think all the authors felt like they were probably taking crazy pills for their whole career because they were having to explain the same thing over and over again, but it's just, just what you were talking about product market fit and, and several other things. Yeah. I come across Aaron Russ quite regularly, he puts out great content. He has a company that does outsourced sales development and building uh, calling based mm -hmm. campaigns. He came from, was an early Salesforce hire. He puts out great content in that area. And Jason Lemkin has that whole Saster conference community, which has been a little more virtual the last year, but I'm sure he's looking forward to it being a more traditional. And he does great podcasting content, great video content as well with uh, entrepreneurs and sales leaders and, and uh, marketing leaders from uh, uh, software companies. All good uh, stuff yeah. to try to figure out to connect the dots. One of the interesting areas that I've had to lean into the last couple of years as well. It's like, no matter how successful your marketing campaigns are, sales isn't supporting and they're not calling the leads and they're not calling them uh, with the right frequency and with the right mindset to aim to help. Um, getting that alignment right is super critical. And then marketing and sales can do everything right, but if the product isn't solid enough <laughs> and delivering on all the great work that marketing and sales did to get somebody to close one, then there becomes a retention and monetization sort of problem. So I think the more... Mark Roberge really got it right when he said, when you're looking for your first sales hire, get someone that's startup experienced because they'll be used to working in the extreme uncertainty where uh, mm -hmm. they, they didn't walk in and they weren't the, the 500th salesperson hired who was on version 37 of the playbook. They were there when they had to figure it out and realize that part of their job is listening for product management type of information and relaying that back to the, the team about what's missing and what it takes and being very entrepreneurial internally. Yeah, his his book Sales Acceleration Formula was just fascinating because he, he talked about um, you know being the first director of sales at HubSpot when they started, and he was an engineer. He'd never had any sales training, although we both know his dad is a sales trainer. So maybe right. there was a genetic thing, but um, it was so fascinating to just like any entrepreneur or startup person I was like, I, I've never been in sales. That's okay, just do it anyway. So he approached it like a mechanical engineer, which he is. And what was interesting is they would test people. You know, you test 
salespeople, evaluate them, see if they've got some of the qualities and skills. And so they got going. And then of course, after a certain amount of time, he went back and looked at the ones that were doing really well to see which of the 12 traits they scored high and low for. And the ones that were doing really well actually were people that didn't exhibit very good closing technique. You know, in other words, they, I can't remember exactly what they were, but like uh, they were very good listeners. Curious and, and uh, coachable, right? Or open to yeah, something give them like feedback that. and they gave them feedback and they're able to run with it. And they were selling a product people didn't really understand. It wasn't like there were a sea of 10,000 sales and marketing software companies like there are now. So yeah, that was just fascinating. Very different to be selling HubSpot as a brand, as SaaS um, 15, 16 years into the company's history compared to like doing year one, year two, year three, where nobody had ever heard of the company or, or inbound marketing, why they should even pay attention. To yeah, yeah. And I'm, I'm sure that's why so many of the early employees have done so well. Going on to other things. He's had interesting trajectory too. He uh, teaches sales at Harvard Business School and he's a, a VC now for mm -hmm. SaaS companies helping to rethink the whole model to get the success rate up much higher than it currently is. Yeah, and hats off to Harvard for having a guy like that um, you know, on, on the faculty. There's not much sales taught in schools. No, I come across it every once in a while where there's like competitions and um, like clubs around that, but it's definitely not a mainstream thing where you hear of, of someone, oh, I decided instead of majoring in marketing, I'm gonna major in sales. Maybe there needs to be in certain schools um, because you just, it's the challenge with all of this is what you thought you knew five or 10 years ago is largely very irrelevant today. Yes. And I remember in Mark's interview, I can't remember if he said this in the book, but he said uh, the problem with salespeople is that after they've been in sales two years, they don't want to learn anything new. And I thought, whoa, strong words. He goes, no, I've seen it. You know, and so, and that's a problem. Like you talked about, like, let's say, and again, you know, in the marketing agency world, there's been a number of times where we would do everything right from a marketing standpoint, but they weren't following a sales process and then they would blame us, which is why at, at some point, a couple of years ago, I just said, all right, that's it. <laughs> We're not going to work with any more companies if they don't have the other stuff squared away. And if we have to help get them squared away first, we're going to do that because they think, oh, let's just do some marketing. Um, and uh, I, I'm sorry, I was just getting off on a, on a tangent there, but it, uh, it reminded me of what he, what he said about some folks, to, they're, they're being resistant. And actually, Marcus Sheridan talks quite a bit about this because he does a lot of sales training and, he, you know, helping people come around to uh, a more modern approach to helping customers that you're selling to. And in uh, Mark Hunter's book, A Mind for Sales, the second time he was on the podcast, he... He talked about how there was this one client where he was doing sales training and they said, Mark, there are these two young guys and we want you to spend a little time with them and find out what they're doing because they actually thought they were doing something illegal because they were selling so much. These were younger guys. And he said, okay, I'll, you know, it's not what he was there for, but he, sir, I understand, you know, and it turned out, they were completely legal. They were spending a lot of time with marketing. <laughs> they were talking to them all the time. They were you know, collaborating with them. They were giving marketing ideas. They were getting ideas back from marketing. They were providing a lot of helpful content that marketing had been producing and they were crushing it uh, from a sales standpoint. I thought that was a very funny story. And they were, they were like the two youngest employees too. This is uh, what we're doing now is part of the muscle that modern sales professionals need to be taken seriously, being good on video, being good in moderating webinars and podcasts and good with using, yeah. using video as a report. And the interesting thing too, is one of the silver linings of what we've gone through over the last year is I think people have, it's forced people to become more comfortable, but I think it's also dialed back the perfectionism that I used to see with companies where they felt like, oh, we can't get started with video. We're, we don't have the budget to bring in a professional videographer for a couple thousand dollars for the day. I'm like, um, no, you can start like with what you have. If you want to get really fancy, buy a better microphone, get a little better lighting or something like that. But you know, that's a few hundred dollars and you own all that stuff. But oh. the, bigger, the bigger thing is the mindset shift of just starting and, and realizing that it's all about providing value. Yep. And just to add to that, if you're too slick, 
I think it hurts. Yeah. Um, and there were, again, I realized books, so I, I keep thinking like, oh, oh, oh. But the 300th episodes with Jeb Blunt, I think it was the fifth time I interviewed him. He's one of the most prolific sales authors, and he wrote an entire 300-page book on virtual selling. Now, what was interesting, though, is it's like he snuck in a really good sales book, um, and everything into under the guise of virtual, but it included all the other things you need to be doing, like getting on the phone and all these other kinds of things. But the other thing that was so interesting about his book is that everything that we're doing in this pandemic from a sales standpoint, virtual selling, we're still going to be doing four years from now. We may still get to go visit people, but I think that a lot of people are thinking we don't need to go see a prospect as soon as they express some interest, maybe a little later in the sales process. Um, you know, the, the idea of, well, let's get, let's get a team on the airplane and go meet these people. No, <laughs> maybe, uh, you know, well, further down your, your sales process, but there was another book back to Marcus. He wrote a book called uh, the visual sale with Tyler Lassard from uh, Vidyard. And it was, uh, it was one of those books where you just can't argue with the logic. And he just explains, look, this is working really, really well getting on a zoom call and, 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 you can use video to make buying from you much easier than people realize. I think too, once investors and board members get wind of the fact that so many deals are able to close without getting the team on a plane and spending 10, 20, 30 grand to go out and do an in-person pitch, it's going to change the dynamics. I've heard Kevin O'Leary mention it a bunch of times also that once he saw it actually work, are really people going to go back to doing this, there may be a small sliver of your market that does need the FaceTime. The question is, does the, the client acquisition costs versus the lifetime value really justify it? And what's interesting is in the space we live in, where you look at SaaS at the price point that like HubSpot sells to small and medium-sized businesses, they knew eight or 10 years ago that it wasn't going to be a model that supported field sales. And part of the reason that I think they hit the tipping point with their IPO and the crazy trajectory they're on as they figure that out pretty early on. It's like there's natural demarcation points where price point is so low that you really can't afford inside sales. And then there's a much wider band where you can afford inside sales, but you can't afford outside sales. You got to wonder now post pandemic, how big the deal size, how big the lifetime value needs to be to justify still doing field sales. In instinctively, it probably feels like at least six figures. Like somehow, magically, a lot of these deals in the five-figure range have been very closable over Zoom and e-signatures. Yeah. Um, but, you know, they've, they've had outbound sales ever since the beginning. Yeah. They have a whole floor of, of people doing outbound sales. Um, and I often, I, in fact, when I interviewed Mike Weinberg about that new sales simplified, um, he is one of the several sales authors who is deeply irritated by people that promote this idea that you don't need to sell anymore, that customers will just come to you, that deals will somehow close themselves, <laughs> which is not true. Uh, salespeople will always be needed, particularly good salespeople selling complicated things. And in that interview, I said, well, you know, Outbound or HubSpot does outbound selling. And I, do. he wasn't yeah. aware of that. Yeah. And he said, oh man, I appreciate you saying that because I'm going to be talking about that a lot. Because not so much in his book, but <clears throat> in, in, in when he goes out into the world and he's giving talks and he's doing training, that that company kept coming up. Well, pretty quickly he was able to say, "Look, guys, th that's a fantasy that you're longing for. That people are just going to call you up and wire you money. You got to have e a sales it's, team. It's e-commerce. HubSpot has one. Yeah, yeah. HubSpot does inbound and outbound, and the outbound fits really nicely with account-based marketing and target accounts." At a certain size, it I think can be engineered with like product-led growth where someone, they have a $49 a month offering or somebody's buying Dropbox or Google Apps or simple web hosting or something that by necessity almost needs to be something that people can self-serve on. And then there's a wider band at a few hundred or a few thousand dollars where you definitely need some figuring out. The, the, the challenge for a lot of B2B tech companies I see is if people are purchasing without being vetted and qualified, you could have a situation where someone signs up and they churn really quickly because they were never a fit in the first place. So shifting that responsibility to the sales team 
of making sure that they properly manage expectations and properly vetted and making sure that there's a smooth handoff from sales into onboarding and customer success and ultimately the salesperson having some responsibility. In, <laughs> yeah, I, re- I remember in, in that, uh, Mark Roberge's book, book, he talked yeah. about how they were wrestling with that. Like, Ooh, the the churn is, yeah. we're, we're making the sales, but we're, we're really churning more than we, we should. And as I recall, they were thinking, Oh, what should we do? And they, they said, look, you're going to get some compensation when you make a sale, but you're going to get what, like most of it or at least half when they renew after one year. And he said it was almost like overnight they were getting <laughs> better customers. Yeah. They, and I remember they engineered tracking into the products. And that's something a lot of SaaS companies are doing now also, where they know that there's a certain usage where you cross the threshold and like, okay, you're 90% likely to stick now because mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And vice versa. On the flip side of like you're, two weeks in, four weeks in, 60 days in, and you haven't hit that milestone and you're not using the product at all, you're probably an extremely high risk. That's the whole idea too, of where you have these annual payments or annual contracts. You really don't know if you're not looking at the product, whether you really have a healthy relationship or not. You can get fooled pretty quickly on the financial side and the investors love that. But the flip side is if, some, if the product utilization isn't there, it's, it's just masking the real problem. Yeah, and that's where a couple of books that have been on the show over the years were so interesting. One was The Membership Economy by Robbie Kellman Baxter, and also like Subscription Marketing uh, by Ann Janser, and uh, Subscribe by Teen Zwo, where what's interesting and what so much of the subscription based companies are hopefully teaching the rest of the world is that it's not just about getting the customer, it's about keeping the customer. So, yeah a large part of their marketing is to their customers to make sure they can keep them. And I can't think of, of even a non-subscription business would do well to pay more attention to their customers, uh, keeping their customers than trying to get uh, new ones that are going to leave after a year. I saw that happen in spades in the hardware and software business. If you think about the entrepreneur who started up their business 30 years ago in the heyday of people building out client server networks and Novell network and things like that and offices and selling a lot of routers and switches and servers. That Equipment. classical, that classical uh, traditional sales professional, a lot of them had a really hard time shifting to selling managed services and cloud services on a recurring basis because it was such a different Yes. A diagnostic process, such a different exploratory process, consultative process, and completely changed the dynamics of the skill set that would work. And what's interesting is a lot of the attrition just simply happened because so many of the people that were hitting that inflection point were near retirement age. Um, so some of it forced uh, attrition with replacement. You, know, you weren't going to hire somebody who was in their mid 20s or who's going to face the same resistance to, hey, I want to do it the same way I've done this for the last 30 years of my career. Um, but, <laughs> But it's been interesting challenges too to watch all of that happen. The consumerization of IT and a lot of IT decisions being shifted out the line of business managers throughout organizations, decentralized IT changed the dynamics mm-hmm. of that too. Yeah, and it may seem like a subtle difference, but it's an enormously different mindset. You know, they were actually having to pay attention to their customers. Um, so yeah, that's that's a, a very interesting thing. And you're gonna probably see more and more of a subscription-based products. There's even in the book subscribed, which is really well done. um, They talked about earth moving equipment. You can buy subscriptions to earth moving equipment. So in other words, I think it was Caterpillar is doing it and they realized, I mean, you still buy their equipment if you want, it makes sense for you. But with subscription, you have to think doubly hard about what is it that people are buying from us? They're not buying a subscription. They're buying a solution to a problem. So in the case of these massive earth moving companies, these were companies that were buying these big vehicles. They were paying to have earth moved and they kind of knew how much they needed moved. So they just bought a subscription saying, we want this many, you know, cubic yards of earth moved every month. (laughs) And the Caterpillar was like, sure, we'll have, We'll have, we'll have everything for you there. Just pay us a subscription and we will we will move that earth for you. And we'll do it on time. And you won't have to worry about equipment. You won't have to worry about employees. Uh, you don't have to worry about insurance. You just pay us. I just thought that was fascinating. The things that people are subscribing to now. CFOs love to talk about, and even the sales people that sell um, 
this type of uh, in this type of business model, love to talk about shifting from capital expenditures capex to operating expenditures opex, um, because hmm. there's all different implications to how you measure. And I think a lot of the seeds for this were getting planted as software as a service and cloud services became more popular. But I just heard Dell talking about this a few months ago too, that they envision that the whole future of the company will largely be people um, subscribing to hardware as opposed to purchasing hardware. So it'll look more mm -hmm. like a car lease <laughs> to a certain yes. degree with a certain end of yeah. life and a certain refresh cycle. Some of the um, phone uh, phone plan companies too have already shifted to that where you're paying monthly with a guaranteed refresh when you realize that, oh, wow, you know, my iPhone is two years old. It's really ancient now. Of course, I want the new one. And, and instead of having to buy it, they just have you pay a fixed fee per month and okay, they'll take it back. They'll refurbish it. They'll do something else with it and get the new iPhone model. Yeah. They're selling connectivity. They're not selling phones. Different business, you know? the jobs to be done. Exactly. <laughs> awesome. Exactly. So yeah. And, and pulling this all together, where do you think B2B as a focus for companies is headed in the next two, three, four years? What do you think we're going to look back on now and realize that something dramatic had changed that flipped the switch that really made such a big difference on how companies were selling to, to other businesses? Well, for the rest of our working years, it's going to be interesting to see the after effects of the pandemic. Um, what changes did it speed up? Like you're talking about education, healthcare. Do you need to travel three hours to see the doctor if you're feeling fine, but they wanted to <laughs> follow up with you? Um, so from, I guess from a B2B marketing standpoint, one of them we already talked about is the way that I think customers are going to be more inclined to want to get with you on, the, on a Zoom call than have you come see them. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, can, can we just meet that way instead of having you come out here? Um, I, I think people expect that are going to e expect that more. Um, I think <clears throat> also, you know, when we're so awash in content and there's so many distractions and we're able to tune out so much more than we used to every month, we can probably tune out more things that we don't want. Um, I think the silver lining there is that, companies are realizing that they really do have to uh, focus more on the, the true uh, motivations of their customers and what's interesting to their customers because um, they're getting tired of being invisible. So if all they're talking about is their products and their services, um, which is not, not really the way to go, it, it's, it's focusing more on uh, the customer and, you know, the, the most successful companies, and this is recurring through so many of the books that I've read, the most successful cost companies are the ones that understand their customers just a little bit better than their competitors. <clears throat> and when they do understand them, a couple things happen. Uh, one is you break through because you think, oh, they, they get me. They, they actually kind of understand what I'm, what I'm doing. Um, and you you sense that they're empathizing with you. Um, but also when you understand your customer is just a little bit better than your competition, you don't have to be perfect at this. It's like what you were talking about uh, earlier. They will start to tell you what you need to do to be successful. And uh, that kind of brings to mind another book, Content Inc. by Joe Polizzi, where he talked about all these companies that built an audience first. And then basically they were told, this is what I want. This is what I need. Um, and so if you, the, the company is, it's hard for companies to do, believe it or not, empathy seems to be the hardest yet most important word <laughs> in marketing and sales because, you know, humans are kind of self-oriented. Um, but I think that more and more people might start to um, understand that. It also kind of brings to mind that notion you had about the IT guys that have been there for 30 years. It's like, okay, maybe some more folks are going to retire and some, maybe some younger people will come along and uh, more digital natives who just understand the, the fallacy of, of taking the old approach. There was a book on the show a while back called sell the way you buy. <laughs> it was by an ex Salesforce guy who was a sales manager and he was telling us people to do a certain thing. And then he realized he hated it when people were doing it to him. So he, he changed it all up and realized you know, the, not only were his, what his people were doing is wrong, <laughs> irritating, it wasn't really very successful. 
So I think there's more people that are going to start to, uh, to understand that. So I don't know. The only thing I know about the future is that, that I can, that I know is going to happen is that everyone will have flying cars, entire meals will come in pill form and the world will be ruled by damn dirty apes. Back to the future the Jetsons and, um, yeah. I should, I should, I should disclose that I, I'm quoting Austin Powers. <laughs> that was his prediction on the future. And actually every year there's a, a, there's people that write these blog posts, like, what are your predictions for the next year? And I always respond with that and they never come back to me again. Cause I just don't think these, these prediction roundups are, you know, always very, very helpful, but um, it's an interesting question. I think a lot of people aren't asking about that, but I, I think that, people, the most successful companies are going to be the ones that are better at using technology to connect on a more human level. Bezos mentioned that a few times in interviews that when it comes to his daily routine, he's not working on what's going to make or break Amazon's quarter. Now he's working on what's going to be relevant to Amazon's performance 24, 36 months out. And great for companies to have that luxury. And I guess it really depends on where you are with your competitive positioning and size and capital and, and what what the role of a CEO looks like and being able to read the tea leaves, the customer insight and think about the future and entirely new business models. You know, um, another thing that he has said, I've seen him quoted as saying, he can't, he doesn't know what's going to happen in the future. He's pretty <laughs> candid about that. But what he's said that he tries to focus on are what are the things that aren't going to change? And that's worked really well for him. Like people want low prices. They want fast delivery. They want guarantees. They want more frictionless experience. Uh, that could be free returns or one-click buying or whatever. But he, he, he's found it really helpful to also try to focus. I mean, obviously, you want to see what's, where things are going. But what are the kind of universal truths that, that the customers aren't going to change? And those are, I think, largely things that go back to our prehistoric brain days, you know, <laughs> uh, the sort of some of the most basic uh, human motivations. Trust is a big one. I think there's still, that will still be a barrier for businesses for generations to come. And if anything, it will be harder and harder for companies to overcome it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, very true. And, you know, it's like one of those questions that people could ask internally at a company like, <clears throat> Is the decision we're about to make, is that going to build trust or subtract trust from our prospects and customers? You know, is it going to add to or detract from their customer, their opinion of work dealing with us, uh, the experience? <laughs> Part of the bank account. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Friends keep from either give you points or take away points, whether you know about the analytics that goes on in people's brains of how they make decisions and how they navigate their choices. Yeah, it's true. Was it um, Vince Lombardi? I think it said there's no such thing as being on time. You're either early or you're late. I saw this in a book that talked about the same concept, which is there's no such thing as meeting customer expectations. You're either exceeding them or you're not exceeding them. You're not interesting. meeting them. I thought that was an interesting uh, idea. So, Customer expectations are going to continue to increase. People expect companies to have superpowers. Everything that they've experienced on the customer side, they'll eventually demand on the business to business side. And you just have to wake up to the importance of customer of CX of customer experience. Yeah, folks may have heard of the thing called the Amazon effect. There was a book on the show called uh, Marketing to the Entitled Consumer, um, Dave Franklin, who lives in uh, Palm Beach. And ex Forrester guy, great book. And he talked about how uh, what you just said. They said that regardless of what your industry is doing, don't pay attention to what your competition is doing because your competitors may suck. If they have a good experience with some other industry, they expect it from you, whether you can do it or not. Like, for instance, you buy something, they, you expect an email update saying, We got your message, we got your order, or we finally shipped your order or your order is going to arrive that day. <laughs> Just simple things like that, 
don't make them go and chase that. And so, you know, all these other companies are like, yeah, nobody else does that. That doesn't matter. <laughs> Your customer has experienced something good elsewhere. Uh, they want that from you now. And I think there's a lot of things that have happened in this pandemic where people are thinking, well, I, why can't you bring it out to my car? <laughs> you brought my meals out to the car. Why can't you bring the couple of bags of sod <laughs> or whatever out to my trunk? <laughs> We mulched last weekend and my sister and brother-in-law were shocked that it's possible to get a pallet of mulch delivered to the house. And yes, it's possible to get a pallet of mulch delivered. And oh, wow. It's probably as for unskilled, relatively unhandy folks like ourselves. If you can move the bag and cut it open with scissors and dump it and rake it, you're 90% of the way there to being able to self-mulch. But yes, these oh, are the I, things I you can you on, could do on that. your phone. Yeah. Cool. Now, yeah, now you've cool added stuff. to my weekend list. Yeah, gosh, because I'd always thought, oh, I don't want to carry those things. And otherwise you have to hire a company and they dump a big pile of it on your on a tarp on your driveway. It's like, oh, interesting. I didn't we have an And actually SUV that probably works probably out have... even better for the seller because yeah. they're saving on space. And uh, it's, a, it's a high volume, it's a high dollar purchase too. We would have probably had to make four or five trips back and forth to the store to pick up 10 or 20 bags at a time and, and just got it all done and Interesting. Totally, totally contactless. But yeah, these are all just all the crazy that we, our car came up for, or at least came up for renewal and it was done hundred percent without going to the showroom anymore. I guess it helped that we've stuck with the same dealer year after year. So there was that trust already, but yeah, it was all, everything was all done and it was just delivered to the driveway and we signed the papers in the driveway. Okay. So now <laughs> you can expect that every time. The time white. That's yep. what you were talking yep. about. It changes, definitely changes perception. Cool. Well, hmm. Glugs, thanks so much for joining me for this episode. It's been super informative. I think you gave a tremendous reading list to our <laughs> solicitors to fill their shelves and, and virtual shelves and Kindles up with keeping up with best practices for what it means to be successful with marketing and sales. Um, I know you're active on LinkedIn. Is that the best place for someone to connect with you or follow more about yeah. what you're doing? Okay. I, I go on LinkedIn probably more than anything else. I go on Facebook and Twitter just to see if somebody's left me a <laughs> message. I, in fact, I have a Chrome plugin on Facebook called Newsfeed Eradicator for Facebook, which erases the newsfeed. But I can go in because that's very seductive. You know, they very smart people at Facebook. They want to pull you in. It's blank. It'll have like a quote from Maya Angelou instead. And but I can see if somebody's leaving a message. But on LinkedIn, Douglas Burdett. But uh, what I was going to suggest was that, as I say to my listeners, if, um, if I can help you from having to read 350 books by recommending like one or two that kind of might scratch the itch that you have, please get in touch with me on LinkedIn and I, where we can chat and I'll do my best to you know, send you a link to an interview about a book that I think might help you or, or one I haven't interviewed the author about or any other kind of uh, resource. And the only thing I ask is that please include a message and say something like, I saw you on Josh's show. Uh, let's connect. That's all I ask because I'm getting what seems to be an awful lot of spam uh, LinkedIn connections on, on LinkedIn these days. So uh, maybe LinkedIn will, will figure that out. But, but um, if I can help point you to that, otherwise the, go to marketingbookpodcast.com and you can find some of the, I think it, um, it's funny. It's on HubSpot naturally. I think it only goes back the last 200 episodes that'll show. <laughs> I can't, you can't hit a button and see all, all of them, but, uh, yeah, either LinkedIn or marketing book podcast. I'm oh, on Twitter. I'm marketing book, but, uh, if I can help folks find the right book or resource, um, do uh, connect with me on LinkedIn and I'll, uh, I'll see what I can write a, a book prescription. I mean, even in this conversation, you would bring up an idea or a concept and I'd say, Oh, Oh, in this book, they talked about that or that. So it's like I, my grandfather and uncle were pharmacists and I, maybe it's genetic. It's like, I want to write prescriptions. I want to write book prescriptions for people. It's like, oh no, I know just the book you need to read right now. So I, I enjoy doing that. So if any of your uh, audience wants to do that, um, happy to connect. It's the repositioning of every aspirational trusted advisor and sales professional is the doctor patient relationship as you ask your prospects <laughs> what their symptoms are and you prescribe, you identify, connect and explore before you advise as opposed to showing up and demoing first. And yeah. Pushing, yeah. Uh, which, which reminds me of the, uh, I, I still go to sales training once a month, once a week. Um, they can't get rid of me now. I reached a certain point at sales training where I didn't have to pay anymore. And now 
I've, I've probably, uh, gosh, maybe over 15 years now, but, um, but it's, it's a great class. And uh, there's a joke <laughs> that I've heard where the guy goes to the car dealership and they say, um, hi, what, what brings you here? And the person says, well, I'd like to buy a car. And the salesperson says, have I got the car for you? <laughs> no question, you know, no diagnosis, nothing. Uh, you're not supposed to do that in case any of your audience uh, <laughs> doesn't know that. So, well, good. Well, it's great, uh, great catching up with you. Likewise. I uh, hope things go well with the show. Let me know how I can, what I can do to help promote it. Sure. Appreciate that. Thanks so much, Douglas. Appreciate it. Take care now and stay safe. Thanks for listening to this episode of the B2B Digitized Podcast. To subscribe and leave a review, check us out at b2bdigitized.com or wherever you like to consume podcast episodes, including Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and YouTube. Well, first I'll claim my bias, <laughs> which is I love startups. Um, and uh, I, the reason why I love startups particularly is because you build from scratch. That's really what I love to do. And I would say those, I like to call them intangibles, drive, passion, hunger, curiosity, these qualities that you do not teach, you either have them or you don't. Um, those qualities really help help new marketers flourish because those, those are the things you rely on to figure things out. And especially in a startup context. Welcome to the B2B Digitized Podcast, where leaders of B2B technology startups and scale-ups learn how to use digital transformation to differentiate, educate, build trust, improve competitive positioning, close sales faster without compromise, and scale revenue growth. Now here's your host, Joshua Feinberg from SP Home Run. Hi, I'm Joshua Feinberg from the B2B Digitized Podcast, and I have with me today a very special guest, Rebecca Corliss, who is VP of Marketing at VergeSense. Rebecca, thanks so much for joining me today on the podcast. Uh, thanks for having me. It's great to see you again. I feel like we have to take every moment to see each other, even if it's in this digital form, to really appreciate the opportunity to reconnect. I know. It's probably only been, I want to say, about a year and a half since the last inbound conference, but it feels like you know, 18 years ago, not 18 months ago. Uh, it yeah. does. I, a totally different era. So that's terrific. I, I think the first place I'd like to start is I've known you probably the better part of 10 years or more dating back to the early days of HubSpot's marketing team. But can you give us a little bit of an introduction of how you ended up um, being a college student, how you stumbled across HubSpot, how you were involved in the early marketing team, early video, early live streaming, early building out of courses and user groups and evangelists. Can you give our viewers and our, our listeners a little bit of background? Yeah, sure. Happy to. Um, so first, my original background um, is PR. Uh, that's what I studied in college. Um, quite a bit of time ago, but it was a really great opportunity in terms of learning writing. And um, I met this incredible individual named Mike Volpe. Um, and uh, I was a new college grad. Um, I think what he saw in me was energy, ideas, and creativity, uh, a musical background, which I never thought would be relevant for the marketing world. Uh, and he gave me the opportunity to create HubSpot's first ever marketing music video. My goodness, this was in 2008 um, when YouTube was really starting to take off and marketers were thinking, ooh, we might be able to use creative videos for marketing. Imagine such a thing. Uh, and that was my big break. Um, and so I joined HubSpot when it was 50 people. Uh, the marketing team was a mere five and it was a cool opportunity really to, it was my opportunity to learn each facet of marketing. I kind of, my, the theme I say is when there was something brand new to be built, they put Rebecca on the job and I, I loved that. And that's how I learned that I'm truly a startup person. And uh, so that brought me to cool things like how we met with the HubSpot user group program um, and being having the opportunity to work with these amazing individuals and showcasing how HubSpot can affect the marketing world in these little micro communities across the United States and the world. Um, it brought me to the opportunity to build a program called Inbo Marketing University, which has since transformed over and over again to be HubSpot Academy. 
Academy, which is such, such a resource um, today with the amazing leaders leading it. And uh, it's been a cool place to really build my foundation and move forward. Yeah, it's really interesting. If you think about the same interest and background in music and the creativity and realizing how quickly marketing was going to be a place where not only education and trust building needed to be combined with entertainment to a certain degree, just to keep people's attention and engaging and stand out from the crowd. And yeah, I remember that first video, it was um, You Ought to Know from Alanis Morissette, right? Yep, that's yeah. exactly right. Um, I'll tell, I'll tell a, a quick anecdote. Um, so imagine uh, me and new gal at HubSpot and Mike, he's uh, very creative and he he always likes to dig in. He wants to make sure the content's going to be really high quality. And I love that about him. And so when I was presenting the lyrics to the song, this is all pre-recording. Um, we're sitting in a conference room with some of my colleagues and I, I printed it out. My goodness, which that even sounds archaic at this time, but I printed it out for everybody and I was going to read it. And Mike looks at me, he goes, don't read it. This is a song. You have to sing it. And I think, oh my goodness, if you're going to put me in this situation, I'm going to sing the heck out of it. And I belted in that conference room. And then they thought, okay, this will be great. Yep, this works. <laughs> it was a fun moment. Yeah, it's, it's terrific. Um, so I think the first place that would be super helpful to get your thoughts on is for someone that is brand new to getting into marketing, digital marketing in a company that sells to other businesses, B2B, what advice would you give to someone if you think back to yourself, maybe going back 10 years or so, fresh out of school, there may be somebody that uh, got connected with you through the BU alumni network, or maybe a friend of a friend, and they ask you for advice, what should they be thinking about to build their career up to be successful? and a, a marketing role in a startup that sells to other businesses? Yeah, um, I have two directions to answer that. First, for anyone considering B2B, um, one of the things that I, I think is really a shame when people think, oh, B2B is the boring marketing. Um, I like to say B2B is where the budgets are. Like that's the fun marketing. <laughs> is the reason why so many B2B products are called solutions. It's because they're actually to address real problems that business has have and are investing in. So I, I love, so I guess that's my first tip. Any, any new grad that's thinking, oh, I want to do the fun marketing. Like B2B is the fun marketing. It's fun to have businesses spend thousands, if not hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars. That's exciting. So anyhow, that's thought number one. And thought number two, I mean, bringing on my own experience and, and thinking back when I entered uh, the marketing world, uh, I would say marketing yourself is your is your best asset when you're early in your career and you don't necessarily have uh, a foundation yet. Maybe you have a few internships, maybe you have a, a newer job, but marketing yourself and that can mean how do you create content and use use the digital world to showcase an idea that you have or or show the type of content that you can create or really successfully drive results. I remember I had the opportunity to hire a woman who said, I have this Instagram account and it has 350,000 followers. And that was the basis of the whole conversation. I said, tell me how, and it, it was so clear that she on her own had stumbled upon how to, the, the, what her audience would be, what the content would be to attract them, how she would cause the engagement in order to create this great resource. And I said, that's all marketing. You you did it by yourself on your own. So I would say lean into lean into that idea and that will be great. Yeah, I remember in the early earlier years of HubSpot, there were stories of people creating music videos as part of the interview process, people running really creative LinkedIn campaigns targeting employees at HubSpot and Facebook ads targeting employees of HubSpot. And what better way to get your uh, pans and, and active project that showcases your expertise than building your own blog, building your own podcast, YouTube channel, driving campaign results, account-based marketing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And also the drive, the drive that that individual has. And I would say when, you, when you're an ambitious company hiring uh, the best of the best, and that's your goal, you can't teach drive. You either have it or you don't. And so seeing those in instances in which someone does something you would never have thought of, um, that's going to catch someone's attention because that's, that's a person who's going to enable him or herself to make things happen. And that's exactly the type of teammate you want on your team. Do you see those instincts be even more important in a startup kind of culture as opposed to walking in and being one of 50 people on a marketing team? 
Yeah, well, first I'll claim my bias, <laughs> which is I love startups. Um, and, uh, I, the reason why I love startups particularly is because you build from scratch. That's really what I love to do. And I would say those, I like to call them intangibles, drive, passion, hunger, curiosity, these qualities that you do not teach, you either have them or you don't. Um, those qualities really help, help new marketers flourish because those, those are the things you rely on to figure things out. And especially in a startup context, uh, you're doing things below your pay grade and way above your pay grade, way above your pay grade. Um, and you need to lean into those intangible skills in order to find the resources, the information to make sure you're making great, informed, smart decisions. So it's very, very important to have those. Yeah, thanks for adding that because I think it's so important to contextualize for the kind of company that someone is working at the size of team, how versatile they need to be versus how specialized. And it seems it makes an enormous difference depending on whether you're one of the first five people hired or one of the first hundred people hired in that particular role. I think that's true. For example, when I think of even HubSpot's evolution um, in the first early days, uh, I think back to my now really close friend and someone I respect quite a bit, Ellie Merman and I, like we did everything. It didn't matter. We did everything purely because everything needed to be done. Um, when I left, the marketing team was approaching 200 individuals. It was amazing, amazing. And so now what was really celebrated and really needed was the specialization and this ability to optimize and unlock value in this specific, uh, specific area so deeply. And that's a different skill set. That's a skill set that is incredibly valuable as well, that is really impactful in larger businesses where you need to always figure out how do you one up yourself, one up this channel, one up this strategy to continue to drive growth. That's some great advice for someone that's just at the beginning of their career. What insight would you offer to someone who's got at least a decades of experience in a marketing role? focusing on B2B and maybe they've had a really difficult year. Maybe the company they were working with was hit hard, especially by the pandemic. Maybe there's been a lot of turnover on their team, a lot of churn within the customer base. What would you advise someone in that role to help them reset and get back on track? Yeah, that's that's a wonderful question. And also my heart goes out to those in that, that position because there's been a whole lot of shakeup um, in, our, in our world in the past year. So my thought are a few things. One, um, I love the word consultative, being consultative. It really applies to the B2B marketing world. I think it applies to the interview process as well. I would say um, going into an interview, and this is actually the approach I took when I had the opportunity to interview for my company now, Verge Sense, is uh, use your interview process to pretend you're a consultant in the role and think about solving problems, like even within the interview process, if it's natural and natural to the conversation, of course. And the reason why I really like that idea is for two ways. One, for the individual interviewing, it gives someone the opportunity to imagine the types of problems he or she will be solving and confirm that they're interesting. Um, that's really important. And two, I think how that portrays the individual is uh, you start talking about the real work. And I think that often creates a hunger in the employer and saying, oh, I just I can't wait to have this conversation on the other side of the the hiring, the hiring contract. Wouldn't that be fantastic? So I would say dig in that way. Um, I have another tip. I'm going to tell you one of my pet peeves. It might make a few people angry because I think it works for some people, but it, I don't think it works as well in startups, growth stage startups, et cetera. It's when people are really excited to flaunt their playbook. I've got, I, it might be a hot button item, but a lot of folks will say, I have a playbook. I have a playbook that I do. And on the one hand, I'm sure they do. I bet they have a fantastic uh, set of strategies and tactics that they've applied here, here, and here, and it's worked great. And I, and I think that's excellent if you plan to continue to stay within the same space. However, if you're a startup person, being a figure it outer and knowing how to ask the questions in order to figure out what's right here, I think is more unique and super valuable because it shows how, how you tackle issues in ambiguity where there isn't a lot of information. So that's my, that's my takeaway there too. So somebody that's rolling up their sleeves and figuring out 
the personas and figuring out the jobs to be done and figuring out the whole journey as opposed to just coming in and assuming that because whatever they did in the previous role worked that we should just do a find and replace and, and reuse that same playbook. Yeah, exactly. I can give a story. Um, so HubSpot, everyone knows HubSpot uh, in terms of being so strong in the content marketing world and thought leadership, like absolutely. When I joined, actually, this is a funny story in a different way. When I joined my last company, Owl Labs, um, I didn't want to rely on the way we, we did things at HubSpot. I wanted to discover on my own and use real data to make those decisions. And so uh, I actually uh, I actually dug into advertising and these different like paid channels quite a bit. Anyway, the long and the short of it, I at least got data to find out that content marketing was still going to be very effective <laughs> in this context. But it was wonderful to have that true data in order to validate the amount of investment we needed to do. So I, I think that's really important not to assume. Use your data to decide. And just when you think you have it all figured out, the past 14 months comes along and changes so many people's playbooks and strategies on product services, target markets, yes. messaging. <laughs> Yeah. Absolutely. And that's when I think those those figure it out skills that dig in what need what do we do now? Um, maybe we're we're dealing with uncharted territory here. Uh, being able to navigate that is so crucial, especially when things you don't expect come your way. When I was doing a little bit of research about Verge Sense, because I was curious, it really struck me that how the founder could have, obviously nobody had foresight to see this coming, but to be in a place where you could make such a big impact on offices, buildings, being able to safely reopen and keep a pulse for what's going on. It's got to have amazing opportunities around content marketing and webinars and worksheets and helping people figure all this stuff out. Yeah, absolutely. It's honestly, when I had the opportunity to consider the position, it was that very element that's and we know is a marketer's dream and I said oh I had like this is going to be fun this is going to be fun to solve a problem that I think you could it's fair to say is on the top five list of every leadership team across the world (laughs) is is really fascinating um means means that you really need to have a high bar in what you deliver but it is a ton of opportunity um for those for the context for those who might not know verge sense so we're an enterprise hardware and software company that creates um, a, pro- a workplace analytics platform to measure how how people are using your office space. And also in terms of being agile, the original uh, real, real driver to purchase was to make sure you had the right amount of real estate to match your business. That's still true. That's still really important. But now it's all about if you're a workplace strategist, you have no idea when people are going to come to your office on the other side of this how they will use it, what they will need, and having data to validate is really important. So from a marketing standpoint, we have a real, really fun education opportunity in terms of offering our market and offering our buyers, um, leaning on the expertise of our teams to share, well, how do you how do you progress in these uncharted times? How do you reopen your office? How do you do that safely, productively, in a way that drives collaboration? It's super fun. You think about too, you mentioned something early on about college students having a perception that B2C marketing is much cooler than B2B. If you think about a commercial landlord or developer that has a 30, 40, 50 story high rise that's sitting pretty close to empty, there's an enormous, there's enormous financial implications to helping them get companies, tenants that are in a position to start filling up the space again safely. Huge, huge. And I think I think when uh, another tip for those considering B2B, ver- I don't know, versus B2C or, or B2B industry specifically, for me, um, and this is maybe why people like B2C often, um, for B2C, you can imagine marketing the products you'd buy yourself. Um, and I think sometimes that drives appeal because you have that empathy. I think when you can find empathy with your, you can find empathy with your buyer in a B2B context all the time. So with BirdSense, I thought, well, I'm, I'm someone who can't wait to go back to the office. Um, well, it'll be different, probably won't be five days a week, but I cannot wait to get that in-person time. And so even imagining that I could feel real empathy for the employees that our customers serve, uh, the impact of the decisions that our customers are making in order to think about how to reopen their space. And that empathy is then our motivator to think about how do we, how do we attract our buyer and, and, and really support them best. That brings us to the next question that I wanted to ask you is how that empathy 
how that approach changes depending on where someone is in the research and purchase decision. We all know the stats that everyone throws around that just there's an enormous amount of shift from seller to buyer. Buyers are just doing tons of research before they're willing to speak with someone from a sales team anymore for good reason. They're able to get access to tons of information. They're asking questions of Google and Siri and Alexa and posting questions on LinkedIn and Twitter and Facebook all day long. How does your approach to B2B change depending on where you're trying to first intercept a prospect? Sure. Um, and I think it also, how much emphasis you put depends on the length of your sales cycle too, right? Um, so let's see. So one of the ways I think it changes um, and it's important, well, one, I think you need to map not only the needs at each stage, but also the mindset. That's where that empathy comes in. What is their mindset? Um, and really being authentic to it. And that's how you can make sure the way that you speak to them aligns with what they care about in that moment. So, I mean, I'll take, I'll take a verge sense example. If we start <laughs> sharing uh, sensor and platform tech specs, when they're just figuring out what like reopening policies look like, that doesn't, that doesn't align. So that's really important. Um, once you've mapped out that mindset, I think you then can think about what is going to be of most value to them at that stage. And then I think, um, going into that consultative solution-based focus, you can really have the most impact because the best sales cycle, the best sales journey is one where you're in the mindset of, I need to find people who have the problem that I solve. Um, because at the end of the day, you could be their hero. It's not even about making revenue. You could be their hero. You could be the answer of their problem that they're ready to invest in. And so how can you make sure you start the relationship by answering the questions they have then, make sure they have the right product information to know that it fits their needs, and then really dig in, in the sales process in order to con uh, get that nuanced view into what their true needs are and, and talk about how that's gonna work. Where does it work? Where does it work? And how do you make sure it fits in order to then ultimately have a sale in which you have a customer that's really excited to get started and, and implement this new product. You, know, you bring up so many really interesting, subtle nuances that so many people seem to often overlook. If I think about the brand buzz and perception that people had of HubSpot 10, 12 years ago is basically you taught hundreds of thousands and millions of people about SEO, about digital marketing, about how to set up their Twitter profile the right way, about what, uh, how, to, how to do LinkedIn right. So much to the point that they many times learned these great things, had a great perception of HubSpot before they even knew like, so what does HubSpot do? And <laughs> being able to connect the dots, like awareness, consideration, decision, staying with them through that, that whole process is a big part of it. But I, I think just the same as I always tell people, your goal really is to get them to fall in love with your content and then by extension, fall in love with your brand. And then it's a much easier process of them seeing you as the educator, as the trusted advisor, helping to shape the criteria that they use to evaluate the whole process. And when you do that right, not only are you on the shortlist, if you do it correctly, many times in a B2B context, you are the entire shortlist. Whether they, yeah. whether the prospect actually tells your sales team, that's another story, but it's a great way to differentiate and neutralize competition. Yeah, right on. And I would say, uh, we saw the sales journey beginning um, at that point when someone, I mean, remember this is 2008, uh, <laughs> Googling, what is blogging? <laughs> like that's where the sales process began. And like our top of the funnel, um, like the timeline in which we focused on top of the funnel was maybe 50% of the full journey. Because once you came in, our, 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 our sales cycle in terms of talking to sales and closing could be a matter of months. So really the time that we needed to focus on was that beginning journey. Um, and it could, be even, it could be even longer than you might expect. Um, those individuals who, I mean, we'll, we'll put it real into context. Um, when building Inbound Marketing University, it was 2009. What was happening in 2009, this terrible recession. And so real, real long, long play. Um, I was honored in terms of building the certification program. People use that to better themselves in their career, get the new job, which is wonderful. What we all wanted to do was get back to work. And then they advocated for purchasing HubSpot. And so, I mean, that's even the longer journey. And it really goes down to earning credibility. And I would say earning trust. It's an interesting um 
place that HubSpot ended up in in the last couple of years too was spending a lot, putting a lot more emphasis on getting college professors to use HubSpot in the classroom, which I can relate to. My job during college was working for IBM and Apple did the same thing and Microsoft did the same thing where they went on campuses and they were trying to get professors to adopt the platform because they knew if you were a Windows user all through college or Mac user all through college was a very good chance the first time you had a chance to pick your preferred platform. If you're using HubSpot in the classroom as opposed to another uh, MarTech stack or something like that, it's, it's the same idea as the comfort the familiarity tends to breed loyalty. Yeah. And even today, I mean, I, so I'm in the position where I'm, I'm hiring for a handful of roles myself and my team at Verge Sense, And I smile from ear to ear when I look at someone's LinkedIn and I see HubSpot certified, Inbound Marketing certified. And I think it just makes me so happy because one, I'm glad, I'm glad for just the HubSpot brand continuing to flourish. That's wonderful. And two, I love, I love seeing the full impact. Like that is as good as marketing can get. Full marketing that impacts the full ecosystem and the full marketer and truly with the goal of bettering their world, their lives, and then seeing the, the opportunity that comes from that. I've often said that in a lot of ways, the free education that a SaaS company like HubSpot has put out should make the marketing professors at a lot of universities very nervous that they need to keep raising the bar to make sure to be able to justify the tuition investment and the time investment of a formal higher education approach to teaching these same courses because um, everyone's constantly comparing these different options. It could be, or the evolution that can come from it. Is this a, a rising tide raises all boats moment where uh, university systems also think about what can they uniquely provide that maybe they weren't prioritizing before? I mean, that's that's the best of every world. The experience. Experience is uh, the real world experience of encouraging somebody to build their first uh, blog, build their content offers, doing customer insight research, giving all these super hands-on things. So when they walk in for their first interview, someone's like, wow, you know, we have people that have been here three, four years that haven't gotten to some of these, yeah. some of these things yet. Real live demo portfolio. Yeah. What, when you look big picture at what some other companies do with approaching uh, B2B marketing, B2B sales enablement, what do you think is the biggest mistake that a lot of companies make that's preventable if they knew better going into it? One thing that comes to mind, and this is especially true right now where we're um, a full enterprise sales process, um, uh, long, long journey given, given the, the investment of our platform. Um, I've been thinking a lot about attribution and uh, one of the, I think, uh, problems that some folks could, could adopt accidentally is putting a lot, I would say too much value into lead source um, I actually used to think this way all the time at HubSpot, love lead source. Where did it come from? Came from social, came from organic search, came from email, came from a BDR, great. And I think, well, I think it's really important to capture that. There are some businesses who put 99% of their like, marketing ROI evaluation into just the entrance point, where I think in some cases it might even be irrelevant. I mean, that's what I believe. And I think I think businesses, especially if you have a lengthy sales cycle like ours, who really invest in understanding all the touch points that a prospect has along the journey um, to becoming a customer, I think that's more impactful because ultimately you're doing this, not this territorial mechanism to give credit and celebrate and win. I mean, sure, that happens, but that's not the value to the business. The value to the business is understanding where to invest more. And so I think companies who aren't investing more into just that full attribution picture are really losing the opportunity to understand um, where they should put more dollars or where they should take dollars out in order to keep growing. Yeah, it's, it's interesting too to see all the different models that people are using to try to justify that they've completely figured it out. But it's so easy to see at the same time the things that sometimes get attributed to organic search or paid search or really a brand search on the company that started with something much more impactful happening that wasn't as easy to measure. Yeah, yeah. Or a uh, new lead comes through a partner. That's awesome. But it's actually because they read a press release and then they asked the partner or, or vice versa. We get a new lead from a webinar, but it's actually because, I don't know, a BDR <laughs> did a quick phone call and they went and jumped to the website. So I think, I think we need to really lean in, especially as digital marketing gets more and more 
um, sophisticated of seeing how these things weave together and just accepting that there isn't this binary, which cup can I put this customer win into? Like it doesn't work that way. And embracing that, letting go and saying, all right, I know that these, these experiences weave together. I want to measure the whole ecosystem ultimately because it's not about credit. It's about knowing where to invest. Do you think the pressures of so many companies in the space following these playbooks having venture backing adds to complications because there's an impatience to show that something is working and being able to measure things in the short term that sometimes are really difficult to measure in the short term, especially when I think about like a startup that's trying to get to product market fit or go to market fit and there just being so many unknowns? Interesting. Um, I think when things aren't going well, or you have a big goal in front of you, there's a lot of pressure. And I think when there's a lot of pressure, there's often an instinct to go to the nearest answer versus, or the most obvious answer versus the best answer, most impactful answer. So I think that in that dynamic, that absolutely could be the case. Um, I also think that then, I mean, it's real marketers leadership opportunity to say, I understand why there's interest in being really binary about just like categorizing a customer by a source. But what ultimately what I want to do, like you go back to the value you're trying to provide. Ultimately, I want to be able to have conviction in where I want to invest. And the method in order to have that clear answer is this. And so this is what's going to serve us more than that. And I think when a marketer can step back and speak to the ecosystem in that way, in those high pressure situations, that's going to be much more successful and a real moment for credibility for him or her. There's the extra complication too of post-purchase. What does the retention look like? What is the, is it someone that's a really good fit that's getting value enough out of their investment that they're going to stay and become a, a customer marketer's dream being a great evangelist and promoter? Or are they at the other extreme where sales pushed really hard just to get it over the finish line and maybe it wasn't the right fit? Yeah, yeah. And I think that just emphasizes that measurement doesn't end <laughs> At the purchase, continue collecting that data. The data you collect might evolve, but continue to collect that data because that's going to be really impactful, especially if you're at a startup phase or a scale phase in which more data is going to inform what you do and how you prioritize. That's terrific. The final area I wanted to ask you about today was to get your thoughts on where B2B digital marketing, where B2B sales enablement, where the whole B2B playbook is headed in the next 12, 24 months or so. Is there something that you see going on right now that seems like it's going to be this big inflection point where we'll look back and be like, oh yeah, that was the big thing that was changing everything. Sure. Um, so where my mind goes, it really is relevant to the time right now is what marketing channel have we all lost that might have an opportunity to be reborn. And that's events, um, physical events, in-person events. And I know for our market particularly, events are great. I know in the meantime, we've, we've done the digital events and that's been wonderful from uh, a demand gen standpoint as a means for our reps to talk to their customers, et cetera. But it's, you, you, we've lost the depth. We've lost the depth in that. We've gained accessibility. That's interesting. We've gained <laughs> accessibility to it. We can now join without traveling. So that's a win, but we've lost the depth. So I think, I hope, that those who produce events from a marketing standpoint or those who use uh, events as a marketing channel use this really disruptive moment to think about how can we take the winnings from this disruption and what we miss and actually create a new, totally fantastic marketing channel event type that can impact businesses. So that's where I put my bets and a lot of changing, a lot of changes happening very soon. Hybrid events and offline events and getting back into traditional conferences and trade shows. Or maybe something totally, totally different that neither you and I are thinking of right now. I don't know. Yeah, it'd be really interesting to watch that space continue to evolve because anyone that had large investments in that has had to get really, really creative the last 12 or 18 months with running virtual events and to try to keep. But then I, what's interesting too, is I see in the next few months that a lot of traditional IT events that I've gone to over the years are coming back in very reduced capacity with all kinds of safety measures and as hybrid events, I guess, with the idea that yeah. they're keeping everything warm with the idea as we move into next year, that they'll um, look to return to where they were in years past. Yeah. Well, I'm an optimist. 
gosh, do I have to be? I'm an optimist. So I, I can't wait to see what creativity is born um, from this because I do think these these moments to come together are so impactful, so impactful. And uh, I, I know they will flourish and I expect it will be in a new, a new evolving form. Every inflection point in the last 20 years or so between the housing bubble, between post 9-11 brought so much innovation and in technology and rethinking how companies communicated in workplaces. And it's hard, one talks about the idea that we've had a decade of digital transformation in a matter of months. Be really, really interesting to see how that plays out with all these new experiences. So true, so true. Well, thank you so much for joining me for this podcast interview. It's been super helpful, really, really insightful. And I know a lot of the viewers and listeners that are going to watch and listen to this will get a lot of value from hearing about your experience in building and deploying B2B digital marketing and startups and scale ups in all different contexts. Um, I know you're active on LinkedIn. Is that the best place for someone to reach out to you if they have any questions or want to connect with you? Yeah, that would be great. Rebecca Corliss on LinkedIn. Love to connect there. That's where I have some of my most fun conversations. Um, so please, please find me. It'd be great to connect. Absolutely. And I'll make sure I include a link to that with the show notes too. Thanks again so much for joining me, Rebecca. It's been great. Wish you all the best in growing your career. And I look forward to continuing to see great things coming from Rebecca Corliss. Uh, thank you so much. And thank you so much for having me. You're very welcome. Thanks for listening to this episode of the B2B Digitized Podcast. To subscribe and leave a review, check us out at b2bdigitized.com or wherever you like to consume podcast episodes, including Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and YouTube. Welcome to the B2B Digitized Podcast, where leaders of B2B technology startups and scale-ups learn how to use digital transformation to differentiate, educate, build trust, improve competitive positioning, close sales faster without compromise, and scale revenue growth. Now here's your host, Joshua Feinberg from SP Home Run. Hi, it's Joshua Feinberg from the B2B be digitized podcast and I have with me today a very special guest and good friend Cynthia Terpstra who is head of marketing at ReadyWorks. Cynthia welcome to the podcast. Thank you Joshua it's a pleasure to be here thank you for inviting me. You're very welcome and thank you for coming on the show. The first place I think it would be super helpful to start is to give a little bit about your background of how you ended up in your current role leading marketing at ReadyWorks, what ReadyWorks does, what were some of the prior steps along your career journey that, that got you to where you are? Okay, sure. You know, I spent most of my career in B2B marketing, you know, starting with, you know, communications company, actually AT&T, and working in everything B2B from, you know, the Fortune 500 to startup to kind of everything in between. So really that background in B2B, but I've also worked in B2C and actually some nonprofit work as well. Um, I've actually also worked in, you know, every functional area there is in marketing, product marketing, you know, content strategy, digital marketing, PR, um, and then, you know, ultimately putting it all together to drive the demand gen and lead gen campaign. So taking all those different functional areas, putting together, and then having something that really drives revenue for companies. And that's kind of having that background is what led me to ReadyWorks. And I really discovered over the last several years that I really enjoy working for SaaS companies. You know, it was one of those things I didn't realize how much I enjoyed it until you know, I really thought about it. And, you know, I'm, just, I'm a problem solver by nature. So working with a company that has a solution to tackle a problem that everybody's facing in their real life, you know, their, their daily work life, really appeals to me. So that's kind of how I ended up at ReadyWorks and enjoyed that team. That's terrific. You know, what I found is super interesting, too, is when you think about <clears throat> the uh, nature of the problems that you tackle on a marketing team in a relatively small company that's got a few dozen employees compared to a Fortune 1000 with tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of employees, there's business problems you're solving, but they definitely have a different context. And I've had similar kinds of experience of working with some huge 
Fortune 1000 companies earlier on in my career and startups a little more recently. How has that kind of changed your outlook of being able to see both sides of the, the puzzle, depending on whether it's a, a huge marketing organization or a marketing team of one or just in the single digits? You know, it, it's funny. Um, you know, when you're part of a large team, um, obviously you have more to draw on and more resources to lean on and, and you can build a deeper bench. But, you know, the thrill of being kind of a small company, too, who's, who's you know, new entrant to the market, you know, creating something out of nothing, creating a new category of products or services, um, and really figuring out how you're going to do that, starting small, building from there, leveraging what you've got. Um, there's a lot of appeal to that, you know, for me. And, um, you know, it, it still comes down to how do you build that, that team and how do you work with what you've got, you know, taking what you know and you can do well and then how do you bring in additional resources, you know, for example, through freelancers or through agencies that can kind of fill some of those gaps that even if you have the skill set to do it, it's impossible to do it all, right? So you have to you have to leverage that expertise. You have to know who to go to to help build that team as you continue to grow. Yeah, no, that's a great explanation too of thinking of Yes, it's good to be able to play all of the different positions, but it's really not all that. But you take like a baseball team, for example, they have the concept of a super utility player who can play six or seven different positions. But the key thing is they can't play all six or seven positions. <laughs> if the second <laughs> baseman is on, if the second baseman's on the injured list and they're covering there, they aren't going to be a very effective emergency catcher or, or, or center fielder. <laughs> Exactly. It's a, exactly and knowing where you can you can you know be that utility player, but also knowing you know that the analogy you gave is great. You know when do you say okay, this is a role I'm playing today, and here's who I can leverage um, to to do those other things and building that that roster star players who can really help you win the game. So to speak of, we're going to use a baseball analogy. Yeah, you never know what happens. Our our hometown baseball team, best of intentions. I think there's four or five of their star players that are in one shape or form injured. So you have the old farm yeah. system, which had a, a challenge last year with the whole minor league system being shut down. Uh, so the, one of the big areas I wanted to ask you about is when you think about your career experience, when somebody approaches you that's early on in their career and they're just getting into B2B digital, uh, maybe you know them through your professional network. Maybe it's someone that's an alumni from your school that was introduced and they, they reach out to you and they're looking for advice on what they should be thinking about earlier on in their career to get into B2B digital marketing. You know, I'm a firm believer in it all starts with the customer. It all starts with really listening to them, really understand who they are, what problem are they trying to solve, what are their pain points, how would their work life improve if you could eliminate those pain points? You know, where do they go for information? What, who do they trust to make their decisions? And how do you want to engage with them? You know, it really starts there. You know, you really have to get to know that customer, understand what makes them tick, understand, you know, why they would even have a need for your solution, but really start with the listening. And I think that's something that's kind of become a lost art form, you know, many areas of our lives today. Um, but it's so crucial and it's so important because if, if you don't start there and you don't really understand the customer and you don't really listen to what they're telling you, all the tactics in the world aren't going to help you. They're all going to fall flat. Yeah. I, it, the thing is, uh, everyone's today looking for a quick fix. Come on, there's got to be an app that allows you to just get <laughs> all of the customer insight and, and magically get to figure out the whole go to market strategy. And I reminds me of the, uh, the lean startup book with the guy that there's no answers in the building, no matter how much you whiteboard and brainstorm and kick that around internally, like, you know, maybe between marketing and sales and customer success and product, you can figure out like 20, 25% of it, but the marketplace is always so much smarter than we are. And many times they'll help us figure out where our shortcomings are. Yeah, and it changes. You know, I mean, look how much has changed in the past year. You know, everybody had to pivot. And if you're not really listening to your customers and not asking them the questions and probing to really understand a little bit more you know, day in the life for them, you're not going to come up with, you know, A, the marketing tactics you need to help solve the problem for them, but you also may miss an opportunity, something you never even consider. It might give you pause and say, you know what, let's, you know, let's get it. Let's, let's try something different. You know, it wasn't even in your headspace, but those kind of things come out in the conversations. 
Yeah, that's a, a real big one. A lot of times when I'm working with entrepreneurs that have a startup and they're, they may think they're getting closer to product market fit, but they're definitely still trying to figure out go to market fit and product market fit. And they're like, well, walk me through what a typical timeline looks like. Walk me through what expectations look like. I'm like, look, you know, if you get this content and thought leadership thing right, obviously the first priority is to get more closed one deals. And then everyone in sales always says the second best answer is no. But there's a really interesting thing that I find that happens in this space too, where people can say, I love what your company is about. I love the content that you're putting out there. Look, let me give you the, the inside track here. There's one feature that you're missing. And if your product team can go back and build this, I'm signed up like yesterday and I have five buddies and similar companies. So I think what a lot of people miss out on on startups is really good content marketing, really good thought leadership actually helps them figure out many times the customer insight um, because essentially their early customers help them become product consultants too. Oh, absolutely. We, we see that all the time. You know, it's continuing to refine that based on a need they've brought to us and continue to enhance the product. But as you, you know, mentioned also, the content strategy, you know, where we start and then, you know, the more presentations, the more conversations we have with the customers, understanding, you know what, it, it might be a little different than we thought, or, you know, maybe the opportunity isn't here, it's over here. So it's that constant refinement, you know, refining what you have, and then also listening to say, you know, maybe this is a new opportunity. This is something we should be talking about because this is um, a real world situation they're dealing with and they need content that helps them solve that. So, you know, you kind of then reprioritize. I know I'm constantly you know, reprioritizing what content is next on deck to get produced based on these conversations that we have with our customers. So it's, you know, it's a balancing act between, you know, what's the SEO opportunity to get yourself discovered, get your website discovered, versus what our customers um, really looking for at the moment that maybe Google hasn't caught up to. So it's a, it's a balancing act at all times. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's so much more than just that shifting dynamic of people doing so much more research online and not wanting to talk to the sales teams till they're 60, 70, 80% of the way. It's getting the leadership to see just how much value marketing can add, not only in early stages of the journey, but throughout the whole sales enablement and customer marketing, post onboarding and product marketing. It really is such a key driver with digital transformation. Oh, absolutely. And it's funny, I think, you know, a lot of us have heard the stats, but I you know, saw it again just recently where B2B customers will consume, I've heard up to 13 pieces of content before yeah. they ever want to engage with your sales team. And of that 13, eight is created, you know, in-house or, you know, created by you to push out you know, to your site um, for customers. And then five of the 13 is content that's discovered on third party sites. So again, it's just so important to have that information and have it available at the right time, at the right place, you know, when your customer is, you know, actively looking for that kind of solution, or they didn't even realize there was a solution to their problem. So making sure that content gets discovered, you know, you know, kind of in the the, the background when they didn't even realize, and they're they're reading about something else, and then it pops up in their feed, and they're like, hey, wait, what's that? <laughs> what do you mean I can do this? I think too, there's like a really important role that marketing can play in reprogramming sales professionals and how to deal with all of this. Because if you're a salesperson where you have access to a platform like HubSpot and you can go in and see every single blog post that they've read, every email that they've opened and clicked on, the webinars they've attended, the videos they've watched, um, like if you're going to a sales appointment and you don't take five or 10 minutes to use the x-ray vision to, I always say there's like explicit stuff that they know that they've told you. They know they've told you their first, last, and email, their company size, and a few other things like that. But then there's all this great behavioral data that really can help weave a story about what are the, it's not like, what are the buttons to push, but like, what are they really struggling with beyond what they told you about themselves? It's, it's similar to if you look at someone's LinkedIn profile and you see patterns of the kind of content they've shared in the last couple of weeks or the events they've attended. Yeah, oh, that that is so important. I'm so glad you brought that up because you know you see that all the time. Everybody wants the quick, the quick sale, the quick conversation, and doing that kind of research, it's there. And if you take the time to really again get to know your customer and see how they're consuming your content, what seems to be important to them, it changes the shape of the conversation. You know, they don't see it as a sales pitch and okay, here we go, Mr. Salesman, <laughs> you're trying to sell me to wait a minute, okay, you get it. You understand what I'm up against, you know, tell me more. And, and that's just so important in shifting the conversation. Uh, getting them out of the 
get sales role, the, all the, the negative stereotypes that people have about sales professionals, getting them out of the vendor box and into more of that doctor patient relationship where they're seen as a consultant and educator and subject matter expert. Uh, when yeah. sales teams embrace that, it's awesome. When sales teams are fighting it in this day and age, it's painful to, <laughs> painful to watch. So these are the cultural. I talk about the importance of like getting the CEO on board. So this trickles from the top down. Obviously, it's way more practical in a company with a few dozen employees than it is than a company with tens of thousands of employees. And it's probably more a division director or someone that or some kind of executive sponsor that, that rolls up. But, it's, but these are big, big cultural changes. Yeah. Yeah, and it's funny, you see it all the time. You know, we've all gotten the sales pitches. You know, my, my email is flooded daily with, you know, the, 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 the pitches. And, you know, you know, the good ones will work. The other ones where it's just, you know, again, going for that that quick pitch, not taking the time to really understand who this customer is and, and why they may have even come to you in the first place. You know, you miss so many opportunities there. Yeah. So that's great advice for someone that's just getting started in B2B. What about somebody that's been doing B2B marketing for 10 or 20 years and maybe the last year has been really hard on them, their company, maybe there was a lot of turnover on their team, a lot of churn among customers and they're feeling a sense of burnout. What would you help a peer or colleague like that who reached out to you that was looking for some advice and help on helping them to recharge the batteries? You know, honestly, I'd say it's a lot of the same advice. You know, it starts with the listening. It starts with reacquainting yourself with your customer. Even if, you know, you've been doing this a long time, as you said, sometimes you get to a certain point where you're so engrossed in the tactics and you're so engrossed in the analytics, you forgot who the customer is. You know, it's just they become a number and you forgot what it's like to have a conversation with them and really hear them, you know, talk about what their work life is like, you know, where do you fit into that puzzle? And, you know, what are some of the things that now that they're considering that maybe they weren't considering in the beginning? And there's just so much that you can pick up on in these conversations, not only in terms of your marketing strategies, but those aha moments, right? You know, and, and I'm a firm believer and there's so much to learn outside your own industry and so much to take away from, you know, other experiences that you may think never you know, are relevant to what you're doing, but they are, you know, or it's just that that spark of creativity that you weren't planning on that comes out of nowhere because you were listening and you were paying attention and, you know, thinking that things may be differently than you did before. So kind of taking that that mental break and, and coming at it maybe from a different angle than you've been doing it before. So I think, you know, again, those basics of really listening um, are so important. I think the other thing too, you know, in this day and age, marketing has shifted so much. It's become so sophisticated, so specialized. So, you know, getting back to our, our analogy earlier, um, you really have to, you can't do it all. You cannot be an expert in everything now in marketing. You know, you, you're an SEO expert, or you're an advertising expert, or you're a content creation expert, or you know, you're an analytics person. So again, you know, Try to learn as much as you can. Try to really understand how all the pieces you know, work together, but then leverage the expertise of people who have really gone deep in each of these topics and learn how to put together a good team you know, to really, really be effective. Yeah, I think it's fantastic insight, especially for startups um, where the role it's like somewhere between the general manager of a sports team and like a portfolio manager where you're trying to make sure that they're not overweighted in one area. I, for baseball fans, I would say like, imagine if all your payroll was concentrated in the bullpen um, and in your bench players. So like the, the pitchers that would start the games, like, you know, where you relying on, on minor league talent, same thing with people swinging the bat. So it's important. It's the same thing with like a portfolio where people have more, tend to have more aggressive portfolios when they're in their twenties and just starting out. And as they get closer to retirement, it tends to become more conservative. So it's like, okay, how do you decide how much to put into content versus SEO versus search uh, versus uh, paid social, paid search, conversion rate optimization, website building, brand building, <laughs> field marketing. I was just reminded yesterday, people are starting to pound the table on events again that on a, in a lot of B2B tech companies, 40% of budgets go to conferences. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And it's so funny, you know, again, you know, another great example of 
um, you know, we had to think of things differently in the past year with everybody working remotely and not having in-person events. You know, it was really fun to see how many different companies of all different sizes and shapes and industries, you know, got creative. It's still creating those customer experiences um, and having some fun with it, you know, too. So we're going to have a more small, intimate gathering, and maybe we're going to do a wine and cheese tasting, you know, and send out those kinds of things to the customers in advance and make it a little more fun. And I think to a certain degree, people really appreciate that because it was different. You know, we, we all get, as you said, you know, a certain amount of burnout at a certain stage. So, again, looking for a different way of doing things. You know, or even now, you know, you always hear people say, oh, we're going to go old school. We're going to go back to doing it this way. Well, you know, it's because we all get burnout at a certain point. We all recognize, you know, the marketing tactics for what they are, and they become so overused at a certain point that you're like, oh, you know, you just start to tune it out. So, you know, I think there's a lot of great opportunity there if you're just willing to kind of, you know, take that um, fresh approach and really listen to your customers and, and other folks who are out there and see how you can do things a little bit differently. Yeah, I think keeping it fresh, keeping it relevant is so critical to stand out, to differentiate, to compete for attention. Like when I hear people make blanket statements like email marketing is dead or webinars are oversaturated or whatever, it's like, yes, you know, in, in the year we are in right now, you're definitely not innovative by being the first one on your block to have a good segmented email nurturing campaign or have a good effective webinar program, but they still largely work. The key thing is the, the messaging, the value of the segmentation, the understanding what actually helps someone as opposed to helping yourself. That's the, the whole, like, they're all the time listening to the what's in it for me channel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Always be helpful. Always be listening. Always be helpful. Um, yeah, you know, it comes down to execution. You know, you can take the same tactic and you can see it work really well because it was executed well, or you can see it fall flat on its face. It's, again, all how you put it together, how it relates back to your customer versus, you know, how can I just spin something and get it out there quickly and hope it works? It's like, do it right. You know, it, it's better to take a moment and, and really think through it and do it right than to just rush to get it done and on to the next thing or, or use the, the easiest, fastest approach possible. How does your approach with a lot of this change depending on whether you're building out strategy for early stage, like awareness stage prospects versus people that are more in the middle of the funnel, middle of the journey at the consideration, and then in the later decision stages, do you find that a lot of the companies you work with have an appreciation for those differences and how, have, how do you tend to come at all that? You know, I, I think you have to look still at the buyer's journey, the different stages of, you know, like content creation or, or what you're going to do from them, you know, the different touch points, but then also recognize it's not a linear path that customers, you know, it's a very much squirrely kind of a path as they go through and they consume content and then they circle back, you know, not to mention B2B is a long sales cycle. You know, it can be anywhere from a few months to a few years, depending on your industry and, and what you're doing. So you have to keep creating content that they want to come back for, even if it's not immediately. The fact that they know that you're a trusted provider of the content, that what you're giving them is helpful and helps them understand what you offer a little bit better, they'll come back. You know, and, and so constantly getting that out there, you know, again, so like in the, the awareness stage, if you're, you know, creating the content, you have to put it out there, one, on your own site and make sure you're using the very best in terms of SEO strategies um, to make sure the content gets discovered, but also putting that content out there when they're not actively searching for it, but it pops up in their feed or on the site that they go to regularly for, for consuming content. You know, and then I think also it's... Um, it's about creating that content in multiple different formats. So, you know, right now, people really are overwhelmed with a lot of content. They know it's out there. They know there's tons of resources they can go to, but, you know, sometimes they have the time to really dive deep into it and, and really research and really understand it. Other times they're looking for that quick um, format that they consume quickly. So having the content available, you know, in, um, you know, video and podcasts and then, of course, written content, it all works together and you're putting it out there so you're offering it um, on their terms, you know, offering it in a way that they consume it um, the way they want to when they're ready to. So I think continuing to, to develop all that and make sure that's available is, is very important. Um, 
And then, you know, of course, in the middle stage is you know, pushing a little bit further with information that digs a little deeper and, and helps them understand you know, how others maybe are using the um, product or service to then the later stage where you know, you're really giving them those, those details, not only in terms of the very specific product details, but also helping them understand how you compare to any competitors, if there's any competitors in space. So again, things like third-party reviews on um, review sites are critical. Um, getting analysts to recognize your solution, getting others to talk about your solution, um, all you know, very important in, in the buyer's journey. The other thing too, I'd like to say that it gets overlooked a lot is the delight stage. And I know other folks call it that as well, but it gets overlooked so often. Everybody, again, they're just pushing things out, hoping to land that, you know, marketing qualified lead, the sales, all that. But really you're creating that customer experience, you know, from very, very, very first touch through long after the sale, you know, what are you like to do business with, you know? Um, are you creating the content after you've made the sale that helps them onboard quickly, help them really navigate your product, you know, make it easy for them to use it? Um, are you giving them additional things that maybe extends into other areas of um, what they're trying to tackle for their business? And are you measuring that? You know, are you using a net promoter score to see how do they feel about what it's like to do business with your company? Because understanding that, sharing that with your organization, having the conversations around what feedback you get from that is so critical in understanding how you continue to refine um, everything you do as a marketer. And then using that to say, hey, you know, we have someone who has been really just delighted with everything that we've been doing. Um, in terms of how we've been servicing them, and that becomes a great opportunity to ask them to, you know, provide a review on the site, to do a testimonial, to, you know, talk about your product or service with your peers. You know, we still, I, I think, referral is so important, and you know, we get that. We have happy customers who really enjoy working with us, and they tell, you know, their peers in different industries. You know, and that's we all trust that, right? You know, who are you going to trust? <laughs> Somebody you've never met that just has done very well in terms of popping up on a search engine or somebody you really respect um, in your field who says, you know what, this has been a great experience working with this company. Not only did they have the product that met my needs, but man, every, every conversation I have with them from the CEO down to the you know, project manager helping me onboard is just, just so positive. They're so easy to work with. You know, their attention to detail is so important. This would get some coming back and get them to share that story with other customers. Yeah, no, that's terrific. One of the the interesting things with SaaS companies that I've leaned on more heavily the last couple of years too is not only the formal reviews on the sites, uh, on the review sites, but drafting those same people or at least the ones that are interested to come on podcasts, to be on webinar panels. So not only are they providing positive social proof, but they're helping to become of subject matter experts and thought leaders and like co-marketing as an extension of your company. And some of, and there's definitely varying degrees of enthusiasm with helping to spread that content beyond that. In some cases, their marketing teams will heavily announce and promote that that client is going to be on a webinar panel with you on their social media. Some of them will write blog posts about it. I've seen some cases where they even treat it as similar to PR, where they put it in uh, a blog post and like a media mention. But I found as a really, really interesting social proof opportunity as well. Yeah, absolutely. You know, we were getting ready actually to launch a few that have recorded some, some webinars with our customers. Yeah, you know, who do you want to hear from? Do you want to hear from the <laughs> customer who used this to solve a problem and to really talk about their experience, or do you want to hear a sales pitch? And, you know, having that customer going to be able to talk about it um, is so important and, and so meaningful, you know, beyond what we can do. You know, I mean, not, everything we do as a marker, of course, you know, has value. But again, it's just that that third party credibility, that's everything. And, and so getting every single touch point right with a customer is so critical because that's how you get to that final stage. Uh, I, I look at when you're planning your own live events, when you're planning your own webinars, um, there's like two report card kind of things going on. Like the landing page and the promotional materials that you're using to drive the registrations is very analogous to putting in an application to speak at a conference where you have like the show manager and the advisory committee that's vetting your background and vetting your slides because they certainly want to make sure that you're providing value and then it's not going to be a pitch. And then like the second part of that is 
We just tell people, imagine that you want your webinar to be so valuable that if it was at a big conference, that there's no doubt in your mind that people would hit the mobile app afterwards and you would have one of the highest rated sessions in the entire conference out of dozens and dozens of sessions that are there. So there's like no doubt in your mind that you're gonna get invited back next year. And the, analog the analogy on that is like the surveys, the polling responses, how many people are receptive to your CTA, but there's so many parallels there is people don't want to, they, they don't want to attend an infomercial, they want to learn. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. And the more you build a reputation for being that kind of person, that kind of company, you know, providing that useful content, um, you know, the more they're going to come back because they trust you. They know that you're, you're trying to help, right? So yeah, that, that's great, great, uh, great uh, insights, I think. It's interesting, too, is that when people are relatively new to doing webinars, there's a lot of anxiety and like, am I going to do this the right way? What mistakes should I avoid? I always say like, OK, if you have a 60 minute webinar and you look down and like the average session time at the end was 20 minutes, something was really messed up. If you look down and you're like the average person stayed 57 minutes, you did awesome. Because unlike a physical event, there's nothing remotely rude about someone just exiting out and leaving if you turn someone off and they feel like they're wasting their time. It's just so much higher of a bar to provide value and keep people's attention. Yeah, absolutely. Um, what do you see as some of the bigger mistakes or what do you think is the biggest mistake that you see people making with their B2B marketing playbook? You know, I think if I had to wrap it up under one umbrella, I'd say trying everything at once. You know, I think you have to start with what you can manage and manage that well. Build from there. You know, we have so many tools and technology available to us today, but you can't do everything at once and do it well. So start what you can manage, start with the basics and go from there. You know, and it's funny how often I see the basics overlooked. Um, you know, start with your ideal customer profile. Um, you can't be everything to everyone. So, you know, who is your buyer? You know, who has the greatest need for your solution? How does your company fit into that equation? You know, what's the best fit for your company? Is it a small enterprise? Is it a large enterprise? Is it a specific vertical? You know, really understand that ideal customer profile. You know, spell it out, give it some thought, and then, of course, circle back constantly to say, you know, were we right? Or, you know, is there a whole other audience we hadn't even considered? Because that happens all the time. You think you know, and then all of a sudden some other customers start coming along and say, well, this is interesting. <laughs> you know, that we didn't think you know, there'd be as much of a need over here, but it turns out there is. So, you know, again, always be listening, always be, you know, watching out for those kinds of signals. You know, I think, um, you know, getting some of the basics and getting, you know, things um, in order are, um, you know, look at your website, look at, you know, what you're doing from a digital perspective, make sure everything is, is spot on. So, you know, when you're looking at your website, is it easy to navigate? Are visitors hanging out to learn more by spending more time on the site? Are they coming back? Or are they just kind of a one-trip pony? They come in, they come out, you know, maybe you got their attention the first time, but then that's the last you ever hear from them. Um, you know, test your, your, your website, make sure that, um, you know, it renders correctly across all the browsers, um, all the devices, you know, all, all the basic kind of technical things that, you know, shockingly, I see get overlooked all the time. You know, <laughs> it looks good in one browser and then you test it somewhere else and, you know, things aren't working properly or it doesn't look good on mobile or whatever. You know, really just make sure you get those basics right because, again, it's all about that, that customer experience and what's their first impression of you. So, you know, and having consistent tone of voice across, you know, from one page to another, to different blog posts, you know, keeping it all together, make them feel like, you know, this is a really good experience for them. Um, you know, again, you know, kind of as you build on, um, you know, the basics and what you can do, you know, having a good content strategy. You know, we talked about that before, but, um, you know, give them useful information, give them something that they're going to want to come back for, and then give it to them in multiple formats. You know, I mentioned video before, but it's interesting. I saw an article, you know, just the other day too, they mentioned that, 68% um, of folks want to watch video. That's their number one preferred format of content. In addition, the article mentioned that um, sites that include video are 50 times more likely to rank in organic search results than sites that don't have that. And again, why? Because people want to consume video content. Google knows that, and they're gonna push the pages that have video higher in the rankings than the pages that do not. So that becomes so important. You know, think about your social media. 
you know, are you being like the person who just talks about themselves all the time at a party? Or are you pushing out, you know, content that's educational, that's helpful, that's really meant to help people understand how they can solve a problem? Um, or even just, you know, fun, you know, get them to know a little bit more about your organization, get to know them, you know, engage with them. Um, and then, you know, you know, as you build more tactics, things like advertising, don't try to do everything at once. Start with one or two channels. Make sure you refine it. Make sure you see, you know, is your audience spot on who you're going after? What's working? Do you need to kind of change the, the mix of, you know, which channels you're advertising on? And then how do you grow from there? So don't try to tackle everything at once. But, you know, start small and continue to grow as you start to see the results and you start to understand what's working and what's not working. Yeah, I think that's where the customer insight, the buyer persona research can be so helpful on narrowing down the short list. Otherwise, you just constantly get these random requests all the time like, hey, how come we're not doing anything on Clubhouse? Well, you know, we just refreshed our buyer persona research three weeks ago and not one person out of 15 we looked at mentioned Clubhouse. So... <laughs> Now, maybe we'll look at it again in another six months, but let's get the <laughs> basics first. Let's get the tried and true YouTube podcasting stuff that we know they actually did mention working, and then we'll circle back to right. that. Always, should we be on TikTok? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, what fits for your audience? Right. Yeah, exactly. What's the right fit for your buyer persona? You know, and you know, candidly, the decision makers are going to be different versus other folks in the organization. So make sure you understand the person who's the influencer, the person who's the decision maker, kind of the, the folks in between, and make sure you're speaking in, in, in marketing to those personas correctly. You know, you're gonna, you're gonna market differently to a CIO than you're gonna market to a program manager. So make sure you understand that, make sure you've mapped it out, which tactics and, and messaging aligns with each, and go from there. You know, it's, it's, it's so critical, plus, you know, let's face it, we all have budgets, so you can't be effective in tackling everything at once if you're still living within a budget. You know, great if you have millions of dollars to throw at something, of course, that makes it easier, but, you know, the real world is most of us are, you know, working within a budget, so being, you know, very intentional with your spend and everything you do um, is critical. You know, see what works and continue to grow and continue to evolve, but be realistic with what you can manage, you know, both from a financial perspective and from a team perspective. It's always such a challenging conversation too with companies that are new to content to get them to see that like, you know, this ebook or this webinar that we're doing that's doing well now, there's a really good chance that people are still going to get a lot of value from downloading or watching this recording like 6, 12, 18, 24 months out. So if you're trying to figure out what the ROI is going to be three days or three weeks after the launch, you're completely missing on that like a typical company that's all in on content marketing gets 80 or 90% of their leads from things they didn't do that much. Yeah, yeah. You know, it, it's you know, we say that all the time in our company. It's it's quality over quantity, right? You know, one meaningful lead that really aligns with your buyer persona, you know, really has a true need for your product, is better than five hundred leads that don't. You know, it's you know, make it meaningful, make it um, valuable. You know, for both sides. You know, for both the customers and for the company. Make sure it's a good fit. Make sure it's a good marriage. And, and, you know, think of it that way, not in terms, you know, not just, you know, how much can we drive, but how much value can we provide and how do we grow in a meaningful way. I spent so much time talking about like LTV, not as much about uh, cost of acquisition that early on in startups, because in a lot of cases, you're still just running a lot of experiments, but the size okay. of the average deal that they envision being able to close and how long that customer sticks and what the expansion drives such an amount definitely influences the potential for where you can make the investments versus not. I mean, if you're managing a SaaS company that's selling something on their website for $19 a month or something like that, you better be able to run something that looks a lot more like e-commerce than selling to mid-market or enterprise companies with five-figure and six-figure deals. Exactly. Cynthia, when you think about where we are right now, when you look at what's going on and you think ahead with an 18-month, 24-month time horizon, where do you think we're headed next? Hmm. You know, I think, you know, from a technology perspective, we will continue to use AI to really help shape 
um, the customer experience, you know, being able to provide the, that self-service experience, you know, through chatbots or, you know, pushing out, you know, content that they're really aligns with um, what they're looking for. So really, you know, high personalization, high autonomy, I think is, is very important um, for the customers. Um, and we'll see much more of that, you know, especially as, um, you know, the technology gets better and better and smarter and we roll it out appropriately as marketers. You know, I, I think, again, that's the caution of, of doing it right instead of jumping on something because it's available to you, but then creating experience that doesn't really work or frustrating the customer. I, I think we'll, we'll continue to get better and better at that and um, leverage, you know, what's available to really help improve the customer experience on their terms. Um, you know, provide what they're looking for. You know, I think too, conversely, uh, especially for digital marketing, I think it's going to be interesting to watch in the next couple of years as privacy becomes more and more of an issue. You know, the, the customers that, that we work with, especially you see in like B2B or, you know, tech savvy customers, um, they know, <laughs> they know what marketing is doing. They, they know how to get around of some of what we're pushing out there. Um, and of course, and there's, you know, the legislation that can make it um, even more difficult in terms of how you collect information and how to use that. So, you know, thinking about that, you know, how do you um, really get the information out to them, um, working within the confines of, you know, privacy issues, and then also, you know, giving them the information in a way that they don't feel like you're taking advantage of knowing that they've been to your site or it's just so obvious that it's it's being, um, you know, marketed to for the sake of marketing versus, again, going back to the listening, you know, um, really, you know, if somebody's going to give up their email um, to you, they know they're going to get marketed to. So make sure then what you do next is just so um, meaningful for them that they're willing to see more of the marketing and know that you're, you know, <laughs> that you're now pushing your marketing ads in front of them, that you're going to send them emails. I mean, whatever you're doing, make sure that it's just very, um, you know, it really just hits the mark each and every time. So much is wrapped up in trust. So when you think about like the customer experience and using AI to improve it, that customer experience really starts long before they become customers. It's like the uh, yeah. stores or if you go looking for a new home or something where you go into a parking lot and it says parking for future customers of future residents of if you envision that every prospect that's a good fit is potentially a future customer or future partner and you make the investments and treat them like that. I always, I would say like, it's super important. Um, especially uh, I talk with a lot of people about LinkedIn. They're like, Oh, well, I hate when people connect with me on LinkedIn and I'm, I'm initially getting pitched back immediately. I'm like, yeah, they totally don't get it. It's like, it's yeah. like walking up to someone that you just met and proposing that you elope um, on the first, yeah. very first conversation. It like, you know, it, you could see Ashton Kutcher making a really funny movie about that, but in real life, it doesn't necessarily play out with the experience that most buyers that are, are on a considered sales process are gonna look like with a B2B tech company. Yeah, oh, absolutely. I mean, that, that's such a great, you know, a saying we say it all the time. It's like, listen, you know, I, I just met you. I wanna date you a little bit first before I marry you. You know, trust. and the other yeah, it's all about know, trust. It's all about trust. And then, you know, I like to say too, you know, for marketers, I don't remember the exact quote, but it's like, you know, what's the fastest way to ruin something? Throw a bunch of marketers at it, right? Because it's like, oh, this is the latest and greatest technique. So the next thing you know, all the marketers are pouncing on it. And consumers, you know, they're not, they're smart, right? They recognize it. They know, oh, great. You know, I'm going to give you my email because that's the only way to get this content. And now I can expect to get, you know, an email every two days from you. Or I'm going to be chased all over the website with your remarketing ads. You know, it's like, okay, again, be thoughtful, be conscious in everything you do. So you create this positive experience. Because if the experience is great and they feel like, you know, everything you did was built on best of intentions for serving them, you know, from the, from before the sale to long after the sale, they're going to continue to engage with you. But if, you know, the first thing they do results in being pounced on by sales, they're going to quickly exit out, you know, and you're not going to get them back. So, you know, again, keeping those customers you do have, keeping them happy, making them feel like you, you, you know, constantly want to hear from them. You want to know how you can improve. They're going to talk about you, you know, they're going to become your advocates. So pay attention to them. 
Yeah. And even just how sales interacts with early stage prospects. I'm constantly reminding people that just because they downloaded a white paper doesn't mean they're ready for a demo and ready for a conversation. <laughs> the one thing you the one thing you know is they downloaded the white paper and they wrote in something about a free form question, like what's the biggest challenge around this topic or whatever. Talk to them about that. Yes, it requires that you read the white paper before you talk to them. They're expecting that you're the expert. So yes, that, that come, it's a package deal, but <laughs> you know, you know what they expressed interest in. Start there. Right. Well, that's so funny because I have, I won't name the company. It's, it's a big one, you know, but, you know, I honestly was just consuming content because I was just curious about some of the content that they were producing. Plus, candidly, they were a competitor for, for a former company. So I like to check out what they were doing. And I got hounded so much and so often by their salespeople calling me, emailing me, linked it. And I had to say to them, listen, guys, I'm a marketer. I know how this works. Please put a note in your CRM. I'm not a prospect. <laughs> like, you know, just take me out because I'm not going to buy. So let's save ourselves some time and know that and make sure everybody else on the sales team know that. You know, quit hitting me up for sale because it's not going to happen. So, you know, put your effort elsewhere. It's the don't call me, I'll call you AI hack of the system figuring out that, oh, okay, I know the persona, I know the content. <laughs> yeah. We'll know when there's a hand raising motion going on. This wasn't it. Right, right. Well, Cynthia, I really appreciate you coming on the podcast with me. This has been super helpful, insightful. I know our viewers and listeners and readers will get a lot of value from this. What's the best way for someone to reach out to you if they have any questions or want to connect with you? Are you, you active on LinkedIn? I'm very active on LinkedIn. Um, okay. Watching it constantly, you know, I, you know, oversee our social channels too. So constantly on LinkedIn, but just, you know, be very transparent on why you are reaching out to me. You know, because as you said, I, I get bombarded all day long with the, the sales. The sales, you know, I want to connect with you, but you know, it's a sales pitch. So, yeah, LinkedIn is a great way to get in touch with me and just, you know, start the conversation there. That's awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining me. This has been super helpful. I wish you all the best in continuing to do great things with ReadyWork and to help build up. Um, great companies by using innovative, disruptive digital marketing and great customer experience. Great. Thank you so much for having me, Joshua. You're very welcome. Thanks, Cynthia. Thanks for listening to this episode of the B2B Digitized podcast. To subscribe and leave a review, check us out at b2bdigitized.com or wherever you like to consume podcast episodes, including Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and YouTube. Marketers got addicted to the click. Uh, we went from being seen as the team that sits in the corner playing with crayons to having to draw an exact like line from every dollar out to like a dollar back in in revenue. And so we got really obsessed with things that are easy. Welcome to the B2B Digitized Podcast, where leaders of B2B technology startups and scale-ups learn how to use digital transformation to differentiate educate, build trust, improve competitive positioning, close sales faster without compromise, and scale revenue growth. Now here's your host, Joshua Feinberg from SP Home Run. Hi, it's Joshua Feinberg from the B2B Digitized podcast, and I have a very special guest here with me today. I'm welcoming Sam Malakarjan, who's the founder and CEO of OneScreen. Sam, thanks so much for joining me. Welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me and for being one of the few podcast hosts who actually say my name right on the first time, but you also have like a long time practicing. So, yeah, I'm trying to think the first time we met may have been at inbound yep. 2013. My first inbound was in inbound 2013. I think you were on yeah. a panel maybe with some uh, CMS developers where they even, I don't even remember if they were calling it the CMS back then, but maybe, yeah, I, I, I had one talk and then I gave some, uh, some, and I think I was doing my like how to survive the future talk back then. That's awesome. So for viewers and listeners and readers that aren't familiar with your background, could you walk us through how you got to where you are in your current role, what you were doing before that, and some other things that would be of special interest to people that are on B2B revenue generation? Yeah. So the, the elevator pitch version is uh, I hosted an AM FM talk radio show in Tampa about cigars. 
uh, and then ended up building websites for everybody in the cigar industry and then had no idea how to help them make money with it. So I hopped on Google, found this weird company called HubSpot, um, built a website called HireMeHubSpot.com to register for, for the free webinar on why you should hire me back in 2011. Um, got a job there. Uh, that was uh, fun. I was, there, I was there for a long time. I was uh, led our e-commerce team, uh, led our marketing expansion to Latin America, and then I was the head of growth at HubSpot Labs. Um, after that, I was the chief revenue officer for Flock.com. And then uh, for the last man, 14 months, uh, you know, myself and a bunch of other former HubSpotters are getting the band back together to make the physical world inbound. That's so cool. And you've done some teaching along the way too? Yes. Uh, I taught advanced digital marketing and innovation management at Harvard University. And then um, I also taught at the college I dropped out of. I was a faculty chair at the University of South Florida, um, which was a lot of fun. That's cool. So hire, yeah, I remember Hire Me HubSpot. That was one of the more innovative recruitment, digital disruption kind of stories at the time. So that was, I guess, an ABM campaign of one that worked out super well. And nobody really called it ABM back then. <laughs> but um, I mean, I was a college dropout and the host of a talk radio show. So my chances of getting hired at HubSpot were pretty slim. Like I, I wasn't optimistic, even with the campaign. Um, and so the fact that I knew I wasn't going to get the job freed me up to uh, be more innovative. Like when you know you're going to fail, it like really clears your mind uh, to do something that, you know, is a little different and then you don't fail. My first job in school, they were looking, I was a student rep for IBM on campus and they said specifically must be at least a sophomore. I was a freshman and they wanted people who were like a technical major. I think it was comp sign engineering. I was like an econ major, but I applied anyway and ended up. <laughs> They say the, the answer to every question you don't ask is no. Too many people fire themselves from jobs before they apply to it. The, it's the hiring manager's job to know if you're a good fit for the role. It's your job to know if the role's a good fit for you. Like your job's hard enough. Don't do theirs too. It's like they say they want someone with uh, three years experience doing 10 years of marketing. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Awesome. So when you think about someone that's first getting started today in B2B marketing, B2B revenue generation, what advice would you offer to someone to set their career up for success? What should they be expecting to think about? What are the, kind of the potholes in the road that you help them navigate around? Um, a couple. One, understand that marketing is a service agency within your business. So we tend to have marketing teams sit together, which is a dumb idea. At HubSpot, we actually split the teams up. So marketing would sit intermixed with sales, et cetera. Um, become friends with your sales team if you have it or your engineering team if you're e-commerce and become friends with your finance team. Because while people think HubSpot was, you know, lovey, happy, huggy, make loves, not spam, and they were, um, what really made them successful as a company was they had really good grasp on their unit economics. You could ask any like junior marketing associate, what's our target, like customer lifetime value to customer acquisition cost ratio. And they would have been able to tell you. And that was our, really our secret to success at HubSpot. Was it uh, having a really tight focus on unit economics, like CAC, LTV, payback, all that stuff? In alignment, right? So, um, like I, <laughs> I went to the weddings of people on the sales team and not people on the marketing team. Um, which not because I didn't like people on the marketing team, but because the culture that we had, and I think is one of the reasons they were successful and I've learned so much is uh, create relationships with people outside of your pod. Because if the marketing team is successful and the sales team is not, you all still get laid off. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So you were there around the time when probably the debate was going on to freemium or not to freemium. And obviously the club spot's been ridiculously successful with product-led growth and the free CRM product last five, six years. How did that all play out? Um, it was hard. So uh, I'll be honest, and, and the HubSpot founders would agree, if freemium had been a thing in 2006, HubSpot would have started off with freemium. Uh, you get much more rapid adoption. Uh, you start at the low end of the market, but disruptive innovation usually starts at the low end and, and moves up anyways. Um, but it wasn't really a thing <laughs> when we started. And uh, also SaaS was so new that you weren't raising these mega rounds. Um, it, it was still a new concept to say you're going to lose money and break even on a customer in the future. Uh, to say like, you're going to lose money on customers and then figure out how to make money on them in the future is not really something investors back in the mid 2000s would have been super bullish on. Um, 
but it was it was the right thing to do, right? Like uh, you you can, you will cannibalize some of your revenue. You will have some people who downgrade, but you will also have much better success with customer retention long term because the people who start using your product and start paying for it have already been using using it to some extent. They already know it. They're familiar with it. They've seen value. Um, so unless you're enterprise SaaS or some kind of specialized thing, um, do freemium, right? It's, it's, if you're, if you're not doing it already, it is very hard change management to eat from engineering, economics, sales, customer success. But if you have the option to have a freemium motion, you should do it. Yeah, I remember if think about probably about 10 years or so, it didn't, it was kind of sort of there, but didn't get any respect. Like people didn't take it seriously. It was kind of like looking at the 20 pound bags of, cat food 20 years ago where people like, yeah, we're going to lose money for a while and then we'll eventually figure it out on scale. And that led to the whole bubble thing. And I think, I don't know what actually caused the breakthrough, whether it was Dropbox or someone like that to try to really figure out that there was a way to get people to realize value and, and trade up over time. But yeah, it's definitely changed the trajectory of SaaS, especially on the SMB side. You know, it, it pays to be an early adopter uh, like Dropbox, Slack, et cetera. Um, like, you know, Brex was one of the first startups to use billboards to launch. And now they're a $7 billion company and every startup in Silicon Valley is buying billboards on 101. Um, and the, it's just a conceptual shift. It's still a lead, right? It's just instead of a lead that downloads an ebook, learns something, and then you teach them uh, how to use your paid product. It's somebody who downloads your product, starts using, learns how to use your product, and then starts using your paid product. So it was just a conceptual shift. Um, especially for the sales team who's used to going for the close instead of going for coaching. I, it was interesting too, from looking at it from the partner perspective, the HubSpot user group perspective, the academy perspective, it seemed at some point, a lot of the things that started as intended for customers, like, wow, you know, we can teach courses for non-customers and we'll have this great following of people that are certified in all of our social media and email marketing. Oh, great. We're running these user groups already for customers. Why don't we invite non-customers and they can press pollinate? Oh, we have this great conference. It's That's exactly what good. happened. Uh, HubSpot Academy was originally called One to Many, um, and it was just a way to how do we do customer success training for users? Uh, you know, when somebody's like not paying you enough money to justify having like an actual human being do it one on one, especially back then. Remember, like a lot of these inbound marketing was new. Now it's taught in universities, but I still remember having to convince CEOs that ranking on search engines was a worthwhile business goal before I then like taught them how to use SEO software and do blogging and things like that. Come full circle. Now I saw um, Rand Fishkin was sharing some study a couple of weeks ago, that like 60% of searches now, I think if partner was doing something uh, clubhouse on this a couple of days ago too, that 60% of searches end up with no clicks where the people are getting exactly what they want from the top of the search engine result page or from basking Alexa or Google, whatever, and they don't click anymore, which completely changes the dynamics of building a whole content engine and building a brand and building following and reach. Yeah. Marketers got addicted to the click. Uh, we went from being seen as the team that sits in the corner playing with crayons to having to draw an exact like line from every dollar out to like a dollar back in in revenue. And so we got really obsessed with things that are easy. Um, you know, somebody like does a search, they click on it, they come to your website, they convert. Like that was something that was really easy to understand and wrap your mind around and do a budget around. Um, but like, that's not how human beings work, right? Like you want the answer to a question that educates you. And then you hear a podcast, uh, and that moves you down the funnel. Like, um, it was always an unnatural behavior to have to ask a question and then click a link and then pray that was the right answer, like read a bunch of stuff to like get the answer. And then at the bottom is like a CTA that says, we only give you part of the answer, but if you click this, we'll give you like the rest of the answer. That was an unnatural behavior. And so, um, you know, the world has fixed that. And now we, we have to adapt to how consumers actually learn. Yeah, I find when I'm talking to companies that are completely new to this, yes, it's important to get them thinking awareness, consideration, the decision. But as soon as they grasp that, it's important to tell them this isn't someone that's going to do step one, step two, step three, and 90% of people are going to follow that exact path in the same order. And that's going to be it for the touch points. It's like, it's so all over the place, but you got to start somewhere. It, it's a, the big, the big sin of like marketing automation too, is um, like if somebody abandons your shopping cart or somebody downloads an email, like send them an email to do the next step in the buyer's journey. They don't do it. Send them an email to do the next step in the buyer's journey. They don't do it. Like, come on. Like, uh, 
you know, that's not how people think. It's not, none of us have ever made a decision that way. We've never gone like, I'm in awareness. I'm now in consideration. I now have the intent to buy. I have now bought. Um, and so I think that the great thing about the evolution in tech of the last half decade has been that we have to treat like customers as if they're actual people. <laughs> Theory, the models should eventually be able to pick up on that and figure out exactly and tell us what their journey really was for and predict what a journey is going to be like for a person like that. I don't know if we're five, 10 years away in it, but it seems like some of the pieces are getting built with that. Yeah, I feel like, so I've spent most of my career trying to get marketers to use more data. And I feel kind of like Prometheus gave us fire. And then instead of using it to like light up the night, we burned down our village on accident. Um, marketers need to be comfortable with the fact that like, we're not, a, we're not a hard science, we're a social science, economics. Um, data can help us make better decisions, but it's never gonna tell us the whole story. Uh, and we have to get comfortable with you know, the fact that we're not gonna have, th there's not gonna be like an answer to a spreadsheet that we can point to and say that, that this is the, the right answer for everybody. D data just tells the story of groups of people, not like, here's what your job should be. Cause then you don't need marketers, right? Like just, hire a consultant to design the optimal flow uh, or use some kind of like machine learning based personalization app and then you don't need any marketers. Speaking back to marketers, so some great advice to be thinking about like unit economics, be thinking about a, planning your marketing team as a, as a service agency internally. What advice would you offer to someone who's like a, a veteran of inbound marketing, digital marketing, content marketing, like 10 years or more, but they went through a really rough year. Maybe their team has turned over a lot. Maybe their customers turned over a lot. And they're trying to press the reset button, get them back on track. Um, maybe it's a former alum that you work with. Um, what would you advise someone in that situation? Uh, there's the practical advice. And then there's the like leadership advice. One, everybody needs to remember that, you know, if, if we have a stress o meter of out of zero to 10, right. And normally everybody in the world's at a two right now, we're all like, all at like a six. So there's only like four notches able to be used. Uh, fortunately, your competitors are in the same position as well, but like nobody in the US needs to be told to work harder right now. The biggest danger is burnout. Um, you become less creative uh, when, you're, when you're stressed. There's tons of uh, research on that. Um, and you risk people like, you know, quitting or, or going to another company. Um, like understanding the fact that things that didn't used to be our jobs, especially when this was all first starting, having to communicate to younger people on the team, like basic health science, because they, they didn't know some of that stuff, um, or having to uh, be a lot more accommodating to people's personal lives. Um, like there, my, my favorite life advice comes from airline safety videos, which is secure your own mask before assisting others. It doesn't mean you don't care about like the baby in the seat next to you, but like if you can't breathe, anybody who relies on you is screwed. Um, so that's the like so the leadership advice. The, the practical advice is, uh, I hate this like new normal like phrase that everybody has, but this is an opportunity to reset. B great growth comes from um, you know disruptions in normality. That's why there was so much of like a Cambrian explosion of startups after the last uh, the Great Recession in, in 2008. This is an opportunity to try new things. Um, your competitors are uh, in the same position you are, your customers are in the same, like things have fundamentally changed and just trying to reset to go back to what you're, like this isn't a video game where you die and then you go back to like the last save point, right? Like this is um, trying to understand what are the new opportunities, kind of like my hiring me HubSpot thing, right? If, if everybody's, if, if you're already screwed, try something new. So how would that thinking, we can, walk us through a little bit what you're doing now with one screen, because uh, it seems very apropos with kind of, did that, the idea for that start before where we are right now, or did it start in the middle of this to envision as people start going back out that um, you wanted people to be looking up at screens as opposed to looking down at screens? That is one of our one-liners. Uh, so nice to know that a smart guy like you uh, came up with the same one. Uh, no I'm sure I'm sure I saw it on your feed at some point. Oh, maybe. Uh, so th this company was an accident. Uh, it started out as a bunch of HubSpotters wanted to help small businesses survive lockdowns. And the idea was, what if there was Google Display Network for screens in the real world? Because um, there's TVs that run inside like a bar or restaurant. Just one, the ads are terrible. 
uh, and untargeted. And two, the, the business is actually paying for those instead of like getting paid, which is how the internet works. Uh, so we built that prototype and then we did what we kind of half jokingly called a reverse stealth mode. We called everybody in what's the out of home industry, which, you know, you think of like billboards and stuff like that, but it's also, you know, place-based ads inside of, you know, taxis and bars and restaurants, et cetera, um, wrapped cars, all this stuff is out of home. Um, and realized that it was the most ridiculously archaic industry that, that one of the most uh, archaic industries that's still functioning. So it's a $40 billion a year are spent on out of home advertising. And let, let me ask you this. If you wanted to buy every billboard within 50 miles of where you are right now, would you know how? Not even close. So you can't, right? Because there's never been like a directory of who, where all the billboards are and who owns them. And it's not like a, a, like the, the large companies, top 10 companies own less than 14% of the available inventory. Um, and so, but they're like impactful. They're fun, right? Like we don't give out awards for AdWords campaigns, but you know, you can have, uh, you know, murals on a wall. Uh, you can have um, dominoes that they're like filling in potholes, like being really creative. I was actually joking uh, the other day. I said for a customer's uh, anniversary campaign in their city, I'm like, let's just wrap an ice cream truck in their branding and just like have it drive around their city uh, to say thank you. And there's a startup that there's a company that does that. Right. And so our whole thing was <sighs> our obsession with analytics as marketers has kind of one, it's made it very competitive Two, it's made it not fun anymore. Right. Like we've turned into financial analysts. Uh, if I want to spend all day looking at spreadsheets, I'd go work for JP Morgan, which, you know, totally fine, like legit profession, just, not what I want to do. Um, and I've had more fun in the last year with uh, being able to be creative, but in a way that still has those performance metrics. So I know I'm doing well for the company, um, but I'm also, yeah, I'm going to have fun at work again. Like marketers, listen, we do good for our businesses. That was the, the analytics revolution. We do good for our customers. That was the inbound revolution. And I don't have a name for this yet, but the third revolution needs to be like, we should be proud at the end of the day that we did work that we found fun and that was enjoyable and that we want to wake up tomorrow and actually and do again something new and interesting. What's interesting is the first time that I started noticing those TV ads in restaurants, probably about five or six years ago in the area of Florida, I live in, in Palm Beach County, which is parts of it are like Boca del Vista on Seinfeld, where there's it's very, very heavily concentrated active adult. And I'm pretty sure it was in places like restaurants that were heavily frequented by people my parents age with boomers that like pre-pandemic we did eat out nine days a week they like they don't believe in cooking anymore when they come and retire so yes they had all of these ads and you're right they were probably real estate um funeral homes life insurance landscaping cruises you know all, all the things that are top of mind for a, uh, a senior and, you're, and more than likely because they were targeting the campaigns they were getting it largely right for someone that was purchasing the kinds of things that my parents were purchasing. But you know, when it comes to their kids and the grandkids, totally off the mark. Nobody's talking about renting bounce houses or summer camp or Disney cruises or yeah. you're right. Yeah, that, that's like, if you're a beer marketer, you should be able to say, I only want my TV commercials to run in bars. Like, that makes sense, but that, that doesn't happen, right? Because TV commercials are sold in like DMA areas. It's going to show in like nursing homes as well. Um, and that's just like an aberration. So our, our whole like thesis after we did our reverse stealth mode and got excited about this was if we can make the real world uh, work as efficiently and organize data the same way Google did, et cetera, uh, for the internet, then you can create better experiences for people and better outcomes for the brands. So all of a sudden it becomes as accountable as buying a search ad or display ad, right? Yeah. And it changes the nature of the business, right? With local businesses, um, like they can make money, which is again, the whole point, uh, or like most billboards are actually owned by small local businesses. Again, they're not owned by large enterprises. Uh, it's a common misconception. Um, but they, my favorite example of this is uh, we have an advertiser who's a liquor store in Boston. And there are 3% of people who go to the liquor store and then go to work. I'm super interested to find out who they are. But in general, right, like you, this, this it's, it's not even that complicated and it's just nobody's done it before. Don't show people ads to get them to go to the liquor store if you think they're on their way to work, unless they have something in common with those 3% of people. So relatively basic stuff, but now you've got this, 
like the internet's actually small. It feels big, but it's very small. Right now I'm looking at the internet and it's occupying a, this much of my attention. And then the rest of the world is happening around me. Uh, and that's, that's exciting to be able to, to start creating experiences there. I noticed on your website and on social that you are doing a lot of awareness and education around QR code marketing. Is that a key piece of the glue that connects all this together? I, I almost, I argued against us adding QR codes to the platform at all. Um, but suddenly somehow everybody on planet earth, like had to figure out how to use QR codes. Uh, kind of like everybody had to figure out how to use zoom. Um, and I'm not sure if QR codes are the long-term answer, but they, they work now. You want to make the world interactive, right? It's, uh, there's no mouse that I can use to click on things in the real world to influence a, a digital experience. Uh, and it's just the, it's the low hanging fruit, the obvious, like, short term it's like the list serve uh, uh what the list serve was to email marketing is what the qr code is to actually having an interactive immersive real world experience it's better than what we had previously i'm not sure it's going to be the solution forever but it's definitely something like you should try you should use and see if you can use it in a creative way that um that again like conforms to your buyer's journey Think about QR codes. It's one of those things that for whatever reason, I haven't left it permanently installed on my Android phone over the years, but I find myself from time to time at a stadium, at a museum or something, and there's something cool enough that it's worth going to the Play Store and spending a minute to download it to actually be able to get access to that. Um, I wonder if there's a lot more people like that that are casual QR scanners as opposed to people that have it top of mind that are just constantly like, oh, cool, it's this QR card. Let me see, let me see what it is. I mean, it comes natively in a lot of mobile device cameras nowadays. Like you just open your camera app and if you mouse it over um, a QR code, it'll, it'll resolve it into whatever it is. Um, and you can be creative with it too. Like you can make it say a phone number, you can make it say text, um, you could bring it to starting a live chat. Like it's not just, you know, it's again, like trying to use QR codes as if they were a click on the internet is not necessarily the right way to do it. So there's, there's a lot more interesting and creative ways that people can use those in a way that like makes them fun to use. Is that one of the bigger mistakes you see people making is they're not taking like the whole user experience into account of what someone's going to see when they get to their site or where they're directing? Marketers do this a lot. Remember when everybody used to say uh, social media ads don't work, but it's because they were taking their Google AdWords creative, putting it on Facebook and then wondering like why um, an ad that was built for somebody literally in the intent phase of the buyer's journey wasn't working for somebody who was trying to like keep up with their friends and wasn't actively searching for anything. Um, yeah, like people try to use uh, new things in ways that are familiar, which is a natural reflex. It's an understandable reflex, but it's also not the, not the right reflex. You should think about what's the right way to use this. What's the way that people are going to enjoy the most. It's going to create the most value. I see that even with something as basic with videos. Somebody creates a video, they're thinking originally YouTube. So at the end of the YouTube video, they're encouraging people to subscribe to their channel and they go and they take the exact same MP4 and put it on LinkedIn. What channel on LinkedIn? And it's not just a, a aspect ratio or form factor. It's like a completely different kind of CTA that you want at the end to be more native and slightly more relevant. And different, different types too. Like you go to YouTube to watch videos. You're not on LinkedIn to watch videos usually. Right. So or Facebook ads like Facebook video ads have evolved so much uh, in the last five years. And that's something that, um, you know, that good marketers have learned. Right. Is you need a different creative for a different experiential medium. Coming full circle on all that, where do you think we're headed next? What do you see going on right now where we're going to look back in 18, 24 months from now and see that there was just a major inflection point happening with how B2B digital marketing, B2B sales enablement is happening? When you're a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And I try to avoid that kind of myopia, but there's a reason I am doing this. We have all OD'd on digital over the last year. Like we don't need to look at our phones anymore. We're caught up on our friends. We're all tired of staring at Zoom video. Like we, it, it, some large e-commerce companies I talk to, it's actually a strategic threat to them that going to the store is now like an, an outing, like an event, right? Um, the And meanwhile, you know, the good movements in privacy are making things like Facebook ads and Google ads less targeted and therefore more competitive and less ROI positive. Um, I think we're going to, we're going to look at this period of time as the point where we sort of like broke out of these four walls, like the, this, it's the origin of the name one screen. The only screen that matters is the screen that's useful to your customer. Um, 
and, and break out of like the, the internet and that sort of like myopic view of the world and start thinking about how do we create experiences that, uh, that go beyond just, just this, because it's, it's not going to work anymore. Right. Like we're not like, like you said, even with Google ads, right. People want the answer. Um, and this was a forcing factor to something that was already happening. People want to go outside. They want to look up, they want to, um, have fun experiences again. Um, and that's, not something you're going to do by doing your 5,000th AB test on your Google AdWords creative. It's all about the experience. That's awesome. Tying it back full circle. Sam, what's the best way for someone to reach out to you if they want to connect or have any questions on anything you talked about today? Are you active on LinkedIn? Is that the best channel for you? Uh, I'm active on LinkedIn, Twitter. Um, the good thing about my last name is if you Google anything even close to it, you'll find me. Uh, so, you know, you can definitely find me that way. Uh, or you can go check out onescreen.ai. Just we're an early stage tech startup and the website is terrible because I designed it. So we have a new head of marketing who just started. Don't blame him for the website. Um, but yeah, you can find us on, definitely find me on LinkedIn or Twitter. Um, I love talking to marketers, right? It's how I learn. Uh, and I also like sort of sharing whatever uh, insights that I can because the rising tide raises all boats. We all got to get better. That's terrific. Thanks, Sam, for joining me today on the podcast. It's been awesome. Thanks, Joshua. Thanks for listening to this episode of the B2B Digitized Podcast. To subscribe and leave a review, check us out at b2bdigitized.com or wherever you like to consume podcast episodes, including Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and YouTube. Okay, good afternoon. I'm Joshua Feinberg, and I want to welcome you to the LinkedIn Social Selling Workshop for co-location providers, hosting, web hosting providers, cloud providers, and managed service providers. For this workshop, we're going to be focusing on goals and specifically revenue growth goals. And I see a show of hands. I'm just curious where you're all coming from. How many of you are co-location providers, where co-location is one of your primary business models? How many of you would consider yourselves primarily a web hosting business? How many of you would consider yourself a CSP, a cloud service provider? And how many of you would consider yourselves a managed service provider, an MSP? So we're actually pretty evenly balanced. Is there any group that I missed that doesn't, is there anyone here that doesn't fall into one of those four areas? What, what area? We promote those services. Oh, you promote? Yeah. Okay, cool. And I think I got a good indication when people were coming in. Are most of you from the U.S.? Or how many of you are from outside of the international, from outside the U.S.? Wow. And how many of you are from Southern California, where you can just drive here? And how many of you are, for some, for, are from somewhere else within the U.S.? One thing that I'm usually pretty curious about also is when it comes to LinkedIn social selling and marketing and sales and biz dev and channel and product, generally the smaller the company, the more hats people tend to wear. So how many of you are from companies that uh, have one to 10 employees, small companies? How many of you are from companies that have anywhere from 11 to 50 employees? 51 to 200? 200 to 500? 500 plus? So it seems like the largest concentration is 10 to 50. And how many of you are in an executive role, like a CEO, COO kind of role? How many of you are in sales or business development or channel? Product or engineering? Marketing? Are you going to remember all this? <laughs> There's going to be a test. This is, is kind of like the, the, the live go to webinar polling questions, right? And is there any broad group of responsibility that I left out? Anyone in another group that doesn't fall into either executive, uh, sales, biz, dev, channel, marketing, product, or engineering? Management. Management. Okay, so we consider that kind of the CEO uh, leadership role, um, which is going to vary depending on, on the company size. The way this session is being recorded, however, the videographer is going to be focusing largely on, on if you don't want to be in the, um, in the video, you more than likely won't be. He's largely just filming me. Some of the questions will probably end up editing 
out at, uh, at some point, but if you really feel uncomfortable by being in here, if you're in witness protection or something like that, you know, just hosting Han wanted to make sure that we let you know that the session's being recorded. So um, I'm Joshua Feinberg. I'm the vice president and co-founder of SP Home Run. We help CEOs identify revenue growth opportunities that their sales and marketing teams are currently missing. We're based in West Palm Beach, Florida. We work with clients all over the US. Hosting Con and Data Center World have a very strict no pitch policy. There will be no pitching done whatsoever. I'm not Clayton Kershaw. I definitely do not pitch well, so you won't be seeing any of that. Please make sure that at the conclusion of today's session that you take a few moments and rate this session in the Hosting Con Data Center World mobile app. If for some reason you're unable to give the session the highest possible rating, please come and see me afterwards so we can get, uh, get any of your questions and concerns aired out. So when it comes to LinkedIn social selling, it's not just about doing social media for the sake of doing social media or being on LinkedIn for the sake of being on LinkedIn. We're doing this for a very specific reason, so we're gonna start with some goals in mind. One of the more important goals is that we think about how our investments, our time and financial investments, and what we're doing in terms of creating assets and positioning our company, how this is gonna to lead to the kind of outcomes that are important to our company, how it's going to attract certain kinds of influencers, how it's gonna attract certain kinds of decision makers, how they're going to land on our websites, and be like, wow, you know, this is really good. I've been searching for something just like this for, for days, for hours or weeks. I can't believe I finally found it. Who are these, these companies? What do they do again? We're looking for a deep, deep emotional reaction where people start to see a tremendous value in what you're talking about and see you as, as a teacher, as a subject matter expert. All of this needs to be uh, supporting your sales funnel and positioning your company as subject matter experts and thought leaders. Uh, we're also gonna talk about how to build meaningful connections and most importantly, how to connect the dots between what you're doing and how this feeds your sales funnel. So we're gonna start out by talking about how to build the right foundation. Quick public service announcement. How many of you are connected with me on LinkedIn? I share a lot of tips and tutorials and best practices on how to do social selling for Colo Hosting Cloud and Managed Services. So if you are on LinkedIn, please connect with me. One of the big things that we tend to hear a lot of that starts these conversations is one, uh, a lot of people come to us and they feel like they're just not getting found early enough. And by the time a potential client calls them up, sends them an email, they meet them at a conference, they feel like many times it's too late. And when it's too late, what that largely means is somebody else was their guru, somebody else was their subject matter expert, somebody else was their trusted advisor and taught them how to view their problem, taught them how to navigate the different options that are available. And this is just the nature of how things have changed. We have a much more empowered buyer today than we did as recently as five or 10 years ago. People are doing crazy amounts of research on search engines and social media before they get to you. It's a big challenge for a lot of companies, but it's a big opportunity if you're the one that can get found and be seen as that subject matter expert or trusted advisor. How many of you right now feel that your company has to compete on price in order to win deals? How many of you feel that you could double or triple or quadruple your price and you'd still keep selling the same amount of deals? One of the big frustrations that we tend to hear is that people never are getting in early enough for them to really explain their value proposition and what tends to happen is it's not a rational conversation at that point. You feel like you're talking to a wall, they're just not listening because they've fallen in love with another option already. And the only thing that's gonna change their mind is if the price is lower. Another big thing we tend to hear is that a lot of co-location providers, cloud providers, managed service providers, hosting providers, they tend to do really well when they get a warm introduction from an existing client. But they tend to have a really difficult time getting a foot in the door with strangers who have never heard of their company before. Is this something that resonates with any of you? Do you have a really easy time when it's a warm referral, but you struggle to get found by strangers? We're gonna talk about how you can do better with that and stack the decks in your favor as well. And what a lot of this comes down to is a piece of seminal research that Google put out a couple years ago called the Zero Moment of Truth, Z-M-O-T. How many of you ever heard of Zero Moment of Truth? How many of you have changed the way that you research and make purchase decisions in the last couple of years? For example, how did you decide where to what hotel to stay at for this conference? 
was on the Hosting Hub website, so they did a short list for you. How did you decide what restaurant that you'd go to last night for dinner? How, what's that? I wasn't here. You weren't here yet? How did, how, think about the last time you've made a major purchase decision, whether it was a car, whether it was a TV, whether it was a, a PC, whether it was deciding a new, a new doctor to go to, a piece of furniture. In most cases, we're looking at our options very differently than we were as recently as five or 10 years ago. For most of us, it starts with a search. Sometimes it starts with asking a question on social media. And this has become so pervasive. This started on the business to consumer side, but most things that start on the business to consumer side eventually affect companies on the business to business side because of the behaviors that people have, whether it's iTunes, Hulu, Netflix, uh, Amazon, Alexa, eventually all filters down into how people behave at work. So what Google found is that your brand is no longer what you say your brand is. Your brand is collectively what people say about you on search engines and on social media. And this has been such a big change and people do so much more research on their own now before they get to you that in many cases as much as 70% or more of their decision is already made before you get a chance to get a word in edgewise. And this is a big, big change from as recently as five or 10 years ago. Um, what's kind of the root cause of this frustration? What do you think causes people to do well with social selling and what do you think are some of the big problems? What, what are some examples of social selling done badly? Has anyone ever had social selling done poorly to them or, or received a communications from somebody on LinkedIn that just didn't seem to hit the mark? Yes. The cart making function? Yeah, the cart making function. It's uh, really horrible. Actually. What what makes it horrible? Um, just the representation of your products when they're on your page. So that's creating a less than yeah, less it, than a, it, it looks like a, it's like a fast food restaurant checkout menu compared to a nice fancy restaurant. So it's, it's not attractive. So it's got to be attractive it and, and helpful. Yeah. Anyone else besides Martin have any experiences where social selling has been done poorly to them? Where they've been a victim of social selling malpractice, where you've said, gee, why are they doing this? <laughs> you know, does this make any sense? So a lot of the root cause of frustration is that most people that are embarking on LinkedIn or social selling aren't really thinking about the impression that they want to be creating. There isn't necessarily always a strategy and it's just kind of being done on an ad hoc basis. And a lot of cases too, many of these problems start in the C-suite where the, the company believes that what got them to where they are today is going to be the same strategy that's gonna get them to where they want to be in the next five or 10 years. For example, do you know anyone that goes to print phone books to learn about options for co-location services? So anyone that would go to the yellow pages to find a good cloud service provider? Is there anyone that would look for a good managed service provider? And the funny thing is with managed service providers, if you look at kind of their family tree and where they came from with VARs and network integrators, if you talk to somebody that was a VAR integrator in the 90s, they all were taking third mortgages on their houses to pay for big ads in the phone book, right? You know anyone that's still doing that today? Another big thing that used to be very influential in how people evaluated information is they looked in printed books. How many of you have children that still use printed encyclopedias to do homework. It's changed. This is how the buyer's journey looked in 2007. Back then, people made the decisions based on cold calls they received, uh, postal direct mail, they got uh, email from people that they didn't want to be getting email from, they rented lists and they were sending cold emails and print advertising. And back then, Sales was largely a gatekeeper. Um, sales controlled access to information. It was very lopsided. Sales could decide when they wanted to engage and when they wa didn't want to engage, and buyers kind of had to put up with that. And because of that, your potential clients engage with your sales team really early on, 10 or 20% of the way through that buyer's journey. When the iPhone came out in 2007, no one really said, wow, this is gonna change everything, but in reality it did. How many of you here were early, adopt, uh, early users of an iPhone? 
anyone here camp out overnight as if they were trying to get uh, Super Bowl tickets or World Series tickets or tickets to a rock, uh, game where they spent two or three days online waiting for the original iPhone? We all kind of looked at our friends and family who were doing that as if they were kind of nuts at the time. But what they didn't realize is there was going to be a whole confluence of related factors that would happen over the next eight or ten years between mobile bandwidth improving, uh, Android becoming a lot more popular, apps becoming a lot more popular, and generally people's thirst for and putting up with getting interrupted changed very, very radically. Um, we have entire business models that exist because people got tired of being interrupted. People are paying $10 or more a month for streaming services, multiple streaming services like Hulu, Netflix, uh, Prime Stars, a whole bunch of things because they don't want to watch commercials anymore. They're paying for satellite radio because they don't want to get interrupted anymore. How many people watch TV anymore that have a DVR and actually watch the commercials? These things have fallen off, off the charts and there's entire business models that are being disrupted because of that. As a result, now people are doing so much research that they're as much as 50, 60, 70 percent of the way more through that uh, buyer's journey when they talk to your sales team. And because of that, it's critical to get found early on. Personalization is a lot more important. Where are we headed in the next couple of years? We think this is going to become only even more pronounced. People, your, your influencers, your decision makers that you're trying to attract as customers for co-location, cloud services, uh, managed services, web hosting, they're going to be almost ready to buy completely on their own. And the sales professionals that are going to left, be left are not going to be perceived as sales professionals anymore. They're going to be perceived as consultants, experts, trusted advisors, uh, subject matter experts. It's going to be very, very different. Any sales professionals that are hanging on by a thread as glorified order takers or glorified explainers, all of that is going to be, largely be replaced by digital assets. And the biggest value of sales is going to be helping people decide what to buy, answering questions for things that can't be researched on their own. So the question is, is your leadership team in denial? Now, this isn't to say that everyone should be chasing after the obvious terms that are really, really overcompeted, that are too vague to really know what the intent is, but there's thousands of people a month searching for hosting. There's thousands of people a month searching for cloud services, co-location, managed services. Chances are, when you start to dig into who it is that you're trying to attract, and you really understand your buyer personas, you'll discover dozens or hundreds that are a lot more relevant to your business model and your value proposition and your differentiation that make a lot more sense. But if your CEO, if your board fundamentally believes that your clients don't use the internet to do this research, you're kind of sunk because in a lot of ways they're living in the past. If your CEO doesn't get that there's hundreds of thousands of tweets being sent every single minute, if your CEO is in denial that political elections are being decided, and this isn't just the recent one, this is going back four and eight years, are being decided based on what's going on on social media. Revolutions are being started based on what's going on on social media. Thousands and thousands of LinkedIn profiles are being viewed every single minute. Are these conversations that you have internally, how many feel, how many of you feel that your leadership team is fundamentally in denial that this is happening? How many of you feel that your leadership team largely gets this but doesn't know what to do? So we're going to talk about some strategies that you can take back from today and the value of why getting found early matters. How many of you enjoy participating in RFPs? How many of you love to hear the word bid or like to be called a vendor um, or deal with procurement agents? The key thing with getting found early and why it matters so much is it's all about differentiating. It's removing the availability of substitutes. And when you do that, you're able to completely change the conversation because you're seen as a trusted advisor. You're able to attract clients that get your value and that aren't just looking for the lowest price. And you're able to protect your profit margin. So this drives scalable, predictable revenue growth. In order for any kind of social media to be successful, and especially when it comes to social selling, we can't look at social media in a vacuum. In other words, what a lot of times when people are relatively new to content marketing or inbound marketing or digital marketing, internet marketing, whatever you want to call it, they tend to focus on tactics 
in a vacuum, kind of on an ad hoc basis. They'll do a little bit of search engine optimization, they'll participate in social media, they'll put some thought into their branding and design, maybe they're doing AdWords. The problem is there's a very loose relationship between those activities and revenue at the bottom of the funnel. So we can't just do social media without thinking about how this is gonna impact lead generation. And lead generation requires a certain amount of thought because typically people are not gonna fill out forms unless they see a lot of value in filling out the forms on your website. So usually this involves coming up with information that is so ridiculously compelling that it's almost grabbing them by the shirt collar and saying, why would you wanna leave? This stuff is so relevant to what the problem that you're looking to solve. It's free and essentially all we're asking you to do is your business card for what's on the other side of that landing page. Um, leads inherently are flawed though. If you're just chasing after leads, most people are looking for those leads to turn into sales opportunities. But in order to take leads and turn them into sales opportunities, we have to understand that buyer's journey. Uh, and that's gonna change, it's gonna vary depending on your business model. How many of you have a sales process where somebody purchases something from your website on their very first visit? How many of you have a sales process that stretches out for a couple of weeks? How many of you have a sales process that stretches out for a couple of months? And how many of you have a sales process that stretches out for several months, in some cases more than a year? The key thing in order for us to gain leverage is we have to build a relationship with people over time. One of the most important ways to build a relationship with people over time is to share valuable content that teaches them something that they are looking for help with, and it also gives them insight about something that they may not have even realized that they needed to know about in the first place. However, there's so many companies and so many publishers that are competing for the attention of the people that you want to attract we can't just be kind of sort of relevant anymore. We need to be ridiculously relevant. And the way that we nail relevance is by stopping thinking that everyone is the same. How many of you want to attract CFOs as clients? How many of you want to attract CTOs or CIOs as clients? How many of you want CEOs as clients? How many of you want compliance officers? School district, computer coordinators, doctors, lawyers, the key, key thing is there are a lot of different types of clients that could be a really good fit for your companies, but each one of them has different things that are keeping them up at two o'clock in the morning. Somebody that is the computer coordinator for a large school district cares about very different things than somebody that's head of compliance for an insurance company. And the head of, uh, head of compliance for an insurance company cares about very different things than the CEO of a digital publishing company. And the more we can get in tune with what exactly is bothering that person, what their goals are, what their plans are, what their challenges are, uh, what if they get right, we'll get them a big promotion at work, what if they screw up, we'll get the, the opposite of a promotion at work. The more we can really get in sync with what's going on in their head, the more we can become relevant to that conversation. And that's what allows us to build a funnel that's really relevant. So social has to be able to attract the right kind of visitors, it has to be able to convert those visitors into leads, it has to be able to accelerate those leads into sales opportunities, and ultimately close those sales opportunities into new clients. But we're not done when they just become new clients. How many of you have business models that are dependent on recurring revenue? How many of you have business models that are dependent on repeat purchases? So a significant percentage of you recognize that that initial sale, you're not done. That's just kind of the beginning. And the better job we can do with understanding what's motivating them to do business with your company in the first place, the better the job we can do to make sure that we're providing them with a great onboarding experience, with great educational content, with helping them to better utilize our service. And that's what helps them to not only not have retention issues and stay for a long time, but that's what helps them spread your message to other people. So in order to make sure that we're all on the same page, there's something called SMART goals. SMART, and the acronym stands for this specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, time-bound. Specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and time-bound. And if you're looking to, everyone says for the most part, like, is there anyone in this room that doesn't want to see revenue grow for your company? How many of you want to see your revenue grow? Big, big chunk. Um, but we can't do that until we figure out what all the interim steps are gonna be. And just saying that we want more revenue isn't enough. How much more? 
And when we come up with that goal, let's say we're trying to generate another five million in revenue, and we know our average deal size is 50,000. You know, we can back into how many new customers we need, we can look at what our historical close rate, and we can figure out how many qualified leads and sales opportunities we need to get to that many new clients, and then we can work backwards with all of the metrics. But the key thing is everything with LinkedIn social selling, everything with digital, everything with content, everything with inbound starts with having a really, really clear idea of what those goals are. What's the R? Uh, relevant. Relevant. And relevant's a really, really big one because it's really easy to get sidetracked chasing after vanity metrics. Um, we have an acronym that we call the HIPPO, H-I-P-P-O, highest paid person's opinion or highest paid person in the organization. And the problem with the HIPPO is they're absolutely positively certain that their opinion is gospel and everyone should follow it just because. The problem where this starts to break down is where the data doesn't support that. Where the hippo believes that because their 14-year-old teenager is really into WhatsApp or Snapchat, that should be your new social media strategy for attracting enterprise CIOs. The problem is the enterprise CIOs aren't quite as into Snapchat and WhatsApp as, as their 14-year-olds. So you got to be really careful that the hippo doesn't sink the ship because it can. So one of the most important things to nail LinkedIn social selling is to make sure that we take the time to build and create buyer personas. Buyer personas are semi-fictional representations of an ideal client based on research and educated speculation. If we get buyer personas correct, it becomes a lot easier to create content that's relevant for the people that we care most about. It becomes a lot easier to know where to promote that content. Because let's face it, getting, there's a big difference between writing and creating great content and getting the right eyeballs in front of it. There's a tremendous amount of competition um, getting in that way. So we want to make sure that we create buyer personas so we know exactly what kinds of content we should be investing in and we know exactly the distribution and promotional vehicles. We also want to create buyer personas because we want to make sure that our sales team is spending its time in the right places. How many of you have folks on your sales team that can get distracted and spend a lot of time on wild goose chases that end up not materializing. Buyer personas are one of the best insurance policies and one of the best tools and processes that you can invest your time in. So not only is marketing focused on creating content and working with other stakeholders in the company to create content that's ridiculously relevant and knowing where to promote it, but it also helps to keep your sales team grounded and working with the right kinds of opportunities. For those of you that mentioned that you're in product or engineering, buyer personas can also be extremely important to make sure that you're developing products and services that people care enough about that they're willing to invest their time and resources in. Everything going forward should be tied to buyer personas. One of the easiest ways to get ignored on LinkedIn is to start creating content and start talking and, and doing all this activity on LinkedIn without thinking about who this is for and why they should care. How many of you look at your LinkedIn feed every day and you're wondering, what was this person thinking? Why are they sharing this? We see a lot of people sharing content on LinkedIn that says, we hired this new person, it's wonderful, clap for us. And everyone internally claps for you and your board claps for you and that's really awesome. We see a lot of people on LinkedIn and announce that they just got passed an audit or they got a new certification. And largely everyone internally, all your employees, all your investors all clap for you, some of your customers clap for you, but strangers could care less. If the goal with LinkedIn social selling is to put ourselves in a position where we're attracting strangers that have never heard of our company before, we can't just be talking about ourselves. Otherwise, it's like if you went to a networking event this evening, like the kind that Andy is putting together. That's Andy, by the way, from Patton in the background. Everyone right? wave to Andy. Um, like the, anyone, if you go to a networking event and you're having a conversation with someone and you realize, oh shoot, why is this person talking 90% of the time? Are they going to let me get a word in edgewise? The problem is if you just talk about yourself nonstop and you don't talk about their problems, you end up putting out content that no one wants to read. And if nobody's going to read it, they're not going to get to your landing page. They're not going to be able to convert to a lead. Ultimately, sales and marketing can really spend a lot of time spinning their wheels on activities that don't add much value if it's not grounded in buyer personas. How many of your companies right now have buyer personas that identify the two, three, or four, uh, or five um, most important people that you want to attract into your sales funnel? 
pretty small percentage, and that's why even getting started on a small scale, you're not gonna be an early mover at this point. This stuff has been around three, four, five years, but I can assure you that if you take the time to really think through who you're creating this content for, why they should pay attention to your company in the first place, how you're gonna attract the right strangers, it will make a world of difference for getting them to pay attention to you. The key thing is being remarkable. What do we mean by remarkable? that the stuff is so good that you just can't help remark about it. And in the social media world, that means hitting the like button, that means retweeting, that means sharing it, that means commenting on it. It's good enough that people stop and pay attention to it and remark about it. Wow, this is really helpful. What else do they have to say? I feel compelled, I have to share it, because if I share it, I'm gonna look really smart in front of my contacts on LinkedIn, or Facebook, or Twitter. You don't wanna be the CEO or the sales exec that is just sharing a whole bunch of meaningless stuff and basically goes on, on social media and says, buy our stuff, it's on sale today. Anyone ever get those kind of email messages? One of my pet peeves that we see on LinkedIn a lot is there's a feature in LinkedIn, and this has been around a while, where you can export all of your connections to a CSV file. How many of you have ever done that? Where you've exported all your, your, your connections to a CSV file? There's also a school of thought that says that it's okay to take that CSV file and import it into your email service provider or marketing automation software and automatically subscribe people to your email newsletter. How many of you have ever ended up on somebody's email send list or newsletter list because they crossed that line? How did that make you feel? Annoyed. Annoyed. <laughs> Any other reactions? It's a very quick way for somebody that's a little grumpy or that's had a bad day to hit the spam button. It's a really easy way for somebody to go back to LinkedIn, look you up and disconnect and block you. In other words, it's committing like relationship suicide. So participating in LinkedIn or social media channels without goals in mind, without buyer personas in mind, is really easy for you to be lumped in with bad actors, with spammers. So the way we kind of look at the difference between social selling and social spamming is at the minimum, we need to be social and we need to be more human. What are some behaviors that you've observed online that tend to be antisocial and it doesn't seem like they're treating you like a human being? So he's sending the same message over and over again and he's not even responding to your overtures to have a conversation. So he's not listening, so he can't possibly be human. It's like antisocial. <laughs> it's a great example. Anyone else? Really examples of antisocial selling? Okay. Uh, how many of you get up in the morning and say, wouldn't it be cool if I got 10 more cold calls today? <laughs> how many of you feel like, gee, I'm not getting enough spam. I, I need my inbox flooded with a whole bunch of nonsense I didn't ask for. How many of, enjoy, of you enjoy when somebody connects with you on LinkedIn and 90 seconds later they send you back a pitch without taking time to build a relationship? TV, radio commercials are all about interrupting. YouTube's entire advertising model is about, you know, how many of you have gotten really good at looking for the countdown timer for skip ad? Ad block. Ad block, yeah. I think, I think YouTube has some bigger problems going on right now with their advertising business model. Apparently there's a whole bunch of, of uh, Fortune 500 advertisers that have pulled out as a result of their ads sitting next to some really undesirable content. Um, but the net impact with all this interruption is perceived as harassment. So the question is, what is the opposite of harassment? In our world, we consider that being helpful. How can we answer their questions? How can we solve their problems? What kinds of questions should you be answering on LinkedIn, what kinds of questions should you be answering with your digital content? Well, a lot of that is going, a lot of helping to narrow that down comes to developing your buyer personas, uh, becoming seen as an educator. What, how do you figure out what questions to ask? Anyone have any ideas on where they would start with deciding what questions are worth answering on, on LinkedIn and other uh, kinds of media? Yes. Absolutely. Um, anyone else? Yes. Answer 
answers to questions or problems that I've come across that might other people might be helpful. So in other words, if you're at a conference like this and people are asking you about it, then it's fair game that somebody, chances are if somebody's asked you that face to face, that there's 10 more people or 100 or 1,000 more people that are thinking the exact same thing and are going to go to Google for the answer. Yep, so anything face to face? Yes? Search engine trends in reference to buyer personas. Absolutely. Absolutely. It, it's certainly a lot easier to stand under a flood of, of uh, traffic that exists than create one from scratch as long as it's grounded in buyer personas because traffic just in and of itself is not going to do much if it doesn't lead to leads and sales opportunities in the clients we want. Any, any other questions? Any other ideas on how we can be relevant? Yes? Uh, call on current customers and asking them what's impacting their world and how our solution helps. Awesome. Calling them, surveying them, taking kind of the consensus on what your sales team is being asked on a regular basis. Any question that you're asked face to face on the phone, email, live chat, is fair game for saying, you know what, let's take that question, let's take that answer, and let's create a digital asset. Because chances are, there's somebody that just like that that's going to go ask Google or Bing, maybe even a few people over on Yahoo or Cortana or Alexa or Siri, and they're going to ask that same question. And wouldn't it be awesome if when they ask that question, they found our advice on how we tackle that? And they land on our site and they say, wow, that's really good. Who are these folks? What do they do? Oh. They have a free ebook that goes into this in more detail. Yeah, I, I got to get that. So the net impact is how we be more helpful. What can we do to position ourselves as industry experts, uh, more as thought leaders? It largely comes down to strategy and recognizing that one of the most valuable currencies that we can possibly build up over time with our education is to build up trust. And it's really easy to violate that trust in the blink of an eye if you do stupid stuff like taking your email address book, you taking your, your LinkedIn address book and importing that into your email service provider. There's a lot of ways that we can violate that trust, but it takes a while to build that up over time. That's why it's so critical that we're able to build relationships over time. Because when we look at before you, there's a bunch of people that raise their hand when they have sales cycles that are weeks or months or even um, more than a year, we need a way to build that relationship over time. The challenging part with that is if we have a sales cycle that's say nine months, we know that people change jobs. So wouldn't it be cool if there was a way that we could stay connected with them when they change jobs? How many of you currently connect with your leads on LinkedIn? What's the, what value does that have when they change jobs? Absolutely. You can acknowledge it, you get notified, and the relationship is portable. Um, so there's a lot of benefits to why it's absolutely critical to grow your uh, network on LinkedIn for a whole bunch of different purposes, because a job change can be a trigger event on both sides. There could be an opportunity with their old company and their new company. And would you even know about that if you weren't connected with them on LinkedIn? A lot of times if you're working with mid-level influencers or people in smaller companies, they're not necessarily issuing news releases about these things, and you may not be following those news releases or have alerts on them. But if you're connected with them on LinkedIn, that stuff shows up right in your stream. One of the most important ways to build trust over time is your headshot. We're in a very visually oriented world. How many of you feel that your headshot on LinkedIn could use some work? There's a couple general guidelines that I would suggest. One is if you acknowledge that LinkedIn is largely a professional network and you're looking to have people perceive that you have a high degree of professionalism is business attire is really kind of a non, negotiable address similar to how somebody would see you if they met you at an event like this. Very different than Facebook. Your photo on LinkedIn should just be yourself. I get that you may be married to the love of your life for decades and you may have wonderful children. Save it for Facebook. When it comes to LinkedIn, it's just yourself. Every once in a while, I'll come across somebody that's using their company logo as a LinkedIn picture, and I wonder, is this person hiding something, or are they just kind of clueless? It's your picture. I think there's probably some terms of service somewhere along the line that that violates, too. How many of you ever come across somebody on LinkedIn that's wearing sunglasses? Is that inviting, or does that say that Joe Cool is too cool for you and he doesn't have time for you? <laughs> so unless you're visually impaired, lose the sunglasses. 
neutral background and try to keep it current. If the last time you updated your profile picture that's on your website was during the Clinton administration, someone's going to come in contact with you in an event like that and not know who the heck you are. They'd be like, is this the same person? So keep your picture current. I think, by the way, there's a, uh, an opportunity on the expo floor on Tuesday and Wednesday. And somebody's doing headshots, so I'll look around there, too. So it's a good way to get it up to you. It's in, on the back of there? Yeah. Absolutely. Thanks, Linda. Another really important piece of real estate on LinkedIn is your headline. It's what people see first, and that real estate gets smaller and smaller over time when we look at the number of people that are viewing you on a mobile device. So an interesting thing to keep track of is what your head, how you look and how your whole LinkedIn profile looks like within the confines of a little iPhone window or a little um, Android smartphone window. So if you have, how many of you run LinkedIn on your mobile device? How many of you looked at how your profile looks, your, your name, your picture, and your headline on, on LinkedIn, on, on your mobile device? By the way, this is another really good tip to use for email as well. If you're preparing an email to go out as part of a campaign or lead nurturing an email or a email newsletter, preview on your phone. If it looks good on your phone, it'll generally look good on desktop, but not necessarily the other way around. If we think about a mobile first world, if we think about the need to be responsive, there's so much value in being able to see what something will look like on a mobile. On a mobile. But make sure your headline concisely explains who you are, what you do, why somebody should care, and it needs to be done in a couple of words. There's plenty more room, and, and if you want to decide how to narrow that down, let your buyer personas be the tiebreaker. If we're going to be seen as a trusted advisor, as a subject matter expert, as a guru, we're for all intents and purposes going to be in the publishing business. How many of you currently think of your business model as being a publisher? How many of you read blogs and social media on a regular basis from other publishers? How many of you read War, for example? How many of you read Data Center Knowledge? How many of you get content from AFCOM? We're all in the publishing business. So when you think about what to share on social media, it should be a combination of blog content that you've created, premium content that's sitting behind landing pages, and what most people would consider curated content. Curated content is basically other people's content that you think is helpful enough that you're going to share that with other people that are in your network. And by doing so, you add value to your connections. You're being seen as a connector, as an advisor, as a guru. However, the problem is if you only share other people's content for all intents and purposes, you might be nominated for a Nobel Prize and doing a lot of social good and kind of accidentally running a nonprofit, but it's not helping your company. So curated content is helpful, but it shouldn't be the only thing you're leaning on. You should have your own assets that lead to your own blog, that lead to your own eBooks, that lead to your own white papers, planning guides, webinars, and events that help to fuel all that. Publishing on a regular basis is really important. If somebody looks at your Twitter feed or LinkedIn or some kind of other social media channel and they see that you haven't published in six months or a year or more, they assume that you either don't care or you're not there anymore. Along the same lines, when we look at somebody's website and we see a copyright year at the footer of every single page and it's not the current year, what message is it sending about how well that company is doing at keeping up? Or not. And, and for an IT business, kind of the minimum viable of showing that you care enough and that you give it a hoot to be able to keep up is keeping that copyright date current. I'll give you a good analogy. If you've ever gone to a restaurant and gone to the restroom and you looked at, wow, if the restroom is this gross, do I really want to eat here? What, I wonder what the kitchen looks like. Uh, it's the same kind of thing with your website. If your copyright is dated, if your copyright date is stale, or your social media is stale, it shows you're not keeping up. It's definitely not helping to build your trust. It's definitely not helping to show that you keep up with things over time. Um, it helps to make sure that you're not spamming your connections and, and followers and helps you to stay consistent. This is an interesting picture, and a lot of people don't think about this until it's too late. What this is about is take all of your budget, all your financial budget and all your time budget that you're going to put into content creation and make sure that you put an equal amount into content promotion or content distribution. Think about a friend or family member that opens up an amazing Italian restaurant, but it's the first time they've ever opened a restaurant. 
and they thought they got a fantastic deal on the rental on a strip mall. But the problem is the strip mall is 30 miles off the nearest highway in a town with a population of 300, and there's nobody else in that strip mall. So what they need to do to compensate for the fact that they got a bargain on the rent is they need to spend a boatload of cash on promotion. Typically the reason why people buy into franchises and get advisors and bounce off of opinions is to prevent them from doing the same kind of thing. It's really, really easy to get seduced into thinking that you've created this amazing piece of content and the promotion becomes an afterthought. It does no good to have 10 essential things that every healthcare CIO needs to know about HIPAA compliance if nobody is reading, the, if nobody is reading that ebook. So we need to make sure that we balance between content creation and content promotion. If you're new to doing this and you don't have a lot of email reach and you don't have a lot of social reach, there's ways to partner with other companies and there's certainly ways to go a lot faster with sponsored social, with paid search and things like that. But make sure that promotion is not an afterthought. It's absolutely critical if you're looking to make your LinkedIn social selling effective. Another interesting thing that I want you to think about with being perceived as more trustworthy is how you go about accruing endorsements and recommendations on LinkedIn. How many of you on LinkedIn actively try to grow the amount of recommendations that you receive? How many of you on, on LinkedIn currently have more than five recommendations? How many of you have more than 10? How many of you have more than 20? These are things that potential clients, potential employers, potential business uh, partners are always looking at, and it's very different than endorsements. Endorsements are, are kind of what people started to roll their eyes at. Um, I think I've been endorsed for brain surgery, uh, lactation, all, all kinds of crazy things that have nothing to do with, with uh, management consulting or content creation or strategy or anything that would be more closely aligned with that skill set. Recommendations are really important. They're a lot more like uh, testimonials or fan mail. So those are some things to help build the right foundation. Next up, I want to talk with you about how you can grow your reach and start to move the needle on some of the metrics. It's really important that when you connect with people that you're not just connecting with people for the sake of connecting with them, but it's really painfully obvious when they look at your profile why they'd want to connect with you. How many of you have 500 plus connections? Because LinkedIn, I don't know why LinkedIn hasn't raised the bar on that over time, but that's kind of what they consider to be the minimum legitimate place to be with your LinkedIn connections. And this is problematic for certain kinds of people on LinkedIn because years ago, there was a thought process that you wouldn't connect with people on LinkedIn that you didn't want to endorse as part of your network. So you limited yourself to people that were former coworkers, that you've met offline, that you can really vouch for. That's changed over time. And there still are some people that have a very hardline definition that they will absolutely positively not connect with somebody unless they have that kind of relationship. And those are the people that typically have 50 or 100 or 150 different connections. But over time, most people have loosened that definition to people that are similar to them, that have a lot of shared connections, that belong to similar groups, that are in similar kinds of businesses, that have similar kind of affinities. This presents a challenge sometime, though, because there actually is an entire industry of people that create fake LinkedIn profiles. Uh, strictly to get you to trick you into connecting with them and then they harvest your email and they sell it to spammers but for the most part as long as you're relatively good at being able to uh, segment between somebody that's legitimately looks like somebody that you'd meet at a conference or could be a potential client or a potential business partner versus the bad dudes you can you generally are okay but think about your LinkedIn as your LinkedIn connections as being a secondary CRM system another way to manage those customer relationships uh, some easy ways to build connections. How many of you connect with most of your clients on LinkedIn? How about your leads? How many of you have channel partners or are part of a channel partner program? It's another great place, whether you're recruiting channel partners or whether you have channel reps that you are partnering with, that's definitely another place you, you should be connecting with. What about your subscribers to your email newsletter? Do you actively try to connect with them so you have another channel? What about uh, vendors who you sell to? What about people that are on your board or advisors? Another really low hanging fruit is you're gonna meet, hopefully over, over the next couple days at Hosting Hunter Data Center World, you're gonna meet some, some great folks and you're gonna go back to your office in a couple days with a stack of business cards. Connect with all of them. 
And the sooner you connect with, the better. Um, you don't have to wait till you get back to the office on Friday. You can connect as you go along. I actually met someone in the hallway about an hour and a half, two hours ago, and we didn't even exchange business cards, and five minutes later he sent me a LinkedIn connection request. It's a way to stay in touch with people over time because you never know that you had this conversation that didn't seem relevant now, and all of a sudden, three weeks later, it's extremely relevant to what you do, and it's another way to be able to stay in touch. You can cross-pollinate your Twitter followers. You can cross-pollinate your uh, Facebook friends. If you belong to associations, BNI, LATIP, Chambers of Commerce, AFCOM, connect with fellow members. You have a built-in affinity. Select people in your email address book and very carefully, LinkedIn has this feature where they say people you may know. And they want you to look at it and they want you to be selective. They don't want you to overdo it because if too many people say I don't know you, LinkedIn doesn't like that either. Um, so how many of you think that you can grow some of your LinkedIn connections by applying these? Feel free to take a picture of the slide if you think it'll help you. The idea is this is an asset over time and it's an asset that not only is valuable to you this month and this year, but next year and not just in your current job, it may be relevant to a job two or three jobs from now. Think about when you're hiring a candidate to do sales for you. Not only are you picking up their resume experience, but when you hire them, you're getting access to their digital reach. If they have a lot of friends on Facebook, if they have a lot of followers on Twitter, if they have a lot of connections on LinkedIn, that's a really valuable asset that they can bring uh, fruit to bear with you and it's a way for them to continue growing relationships over, over time. Not only it helps your career, but helps their employer. It's important to make sure that you connect tactfully with context. If you think that there's even a sliver of a chance where somebody receiving one of your connections will be like, who the heck is this dude? Uh, then make sure you remind them that, hey, it was great that we, uh, we met and that we talked about um, this issue that you're worried about with, with uh, encryption, I'd like to add you to my network. The challenge with that is the mobile clients on LinkedIn have from time to time made it difficult to do that and sometimes they don't even prompt you to do it. So if you think that that's been a problem for you in the past, you may wanna wait till you're back on your desktop to do these uh, connections. But if you don't think it's immediately obvious how somebody would know you, make sure to prompt them. It's also really important to make it easy for people to contact you. How many of you currently have your phone number and your email address on your LinkedIn profile? How many of you have resisted putting your email address and phone number on your LinkedIn profile? <laughs> There's two different schools of thought. Generally, it's not very difficult to set it up so only people that are connected to you have that information. The challenge is by locking that up and making it difficult for people to figure out a way to track it down, track you down, you're showing that you may not be easy to do business with. If you think about, we're right next to the Staples Center, right? So remember that campaign years ago with Staples with the easy button? If you wanna be perceived as the easy button, don't make people spend 10 or 15 minutes doing a Google search to try to figure out a way to track you down, especially if you're in sales. I am mind boggled how every once in a while I'll come across somebody that's a sales director or sales rep or something like that, and they don't have this information there. So unless they're paranoid, lazy, clueless, or in the witness protection program or something like that, most people that want to make it easy to do business with their company, whether you're a CEO that wears the hat in sales sometimes, or whether you're a full-time uh, sales professional, make it easy for prospects and clients to contact you, or they just might contact somebody else. Avoid being antisocial too. There is ways that even when you're connected with someone that you make it damn near impossible to be able to uh, reach out to you. If somebody has to have your email address before they can connect or that you're really being easy to connect with. Another really, besides that, we talked about the importance of the headline and how because people are looking at your LinkedIn profile on their phone, you don't have a lot of room to play with. Your LinkedIn summary though gives you a lot more room to play with and should answer a lot of basic questions like who do you actually help? Who are the buyer personas that are a really, really good fit to interact and connect and, and build that relationship with? What kinds of results do you achieve for those buyer personas? Why should somebody want to connect with you and get to a conversation at some point? Uh, when's the best time for somebody to engage? Is there a certain uh, place where they should be in, your, in the process of researching something? Or is there a good time of the month? Is there a good time of the year? Um, where are you based and where are your clients based? Like for example, uh, we're based in West Palm Beach, Florida and most of our clients are in the US. That's helpful to know because if somebody that's in Singapore wants our help, we're probably not going to be the best fit. So we make sure to explain that. Why do clients need your help? Um, everything starts with why. How many of you know Simon Sinek? I start with why, 
Um, <laughs> leaders eat last, all that good stuff. Everything should start with the mission of why we're doing this in the first place. Why should somebody pay attention to you? How do you position yourself? And when you're trying to decide what to prioritize, your most important buyer persona, your primary buyer persona, should help to narrow down that focus. And even better, if you can use the same keywords that your buyer persona does, there's a pretty good chance that somebody just like that is going to be doing a search or recommended to connect with you at some point. And also, uh, make sure to give advice on how people should contact you. If you have thought leadership, if you have blogs, if you have white papers, if you have ebooks, webinars, videos, podcasts, Take the best of, take your greatest hits, and put them right into your LinkedIn profile. These are things you should be proud of. These are things that educate, that build trust. And the crazy part is, you may think that people will come to you and ask you to send these things along, but when it's 2 o'clock on a Sunday afternoon and someone comes across your profile, when they can get access to this information immediately, you'd be shocked at how many times people will stop and take 10, 20, 30 minutes and read through this stuff completely on their own just because it was there. Make sure that you're sharing content that adds value. And re remember that the CFO cares about very different things than the CIO or CTO, who cares about different things than the CEO or the compliance officer or the K-12 uh, superintendent of schools. It, different buyer personas care about different things. It's really important to pick your battles. There's only so much resources that you can afford to invest in these kinds of initiatives. There's a lot of things competing for people's attention. So at the absolute minimum, there needs to be thought in your LinkedIn social selling and all the content you create for who this is for and why they should care. We also need to make sure that we have different content for where they are in the buyer's journey. The buyer's journey is an active research process that somebody goes through in between the time when they first learn about your company and when they sign on the dotted line and become a customer. And every business model has a different way of evaluating what the different deal stages are, but at a high level, there's kind of three buckets that you can group most people's buyer's journey into. There's awareness, where people are becoming aware that they have a goal or a problem that they want to solve. There's consideration, kind of the middle of the funnel, where people are starting to look at and compare the different options, and there's the decision stage. That's where they're ready to make a purchase decision, and they're ready to look at product-specific information. They're ready, potentially, to schedule a tour, a consultation, schedule a demo, something along those lines. The problem is most co-location providers and cloud service providers and hosting companies and MSPs, when they have lead generation content on their website, if they have any at all, it's all focused almost entirely on the decision stage. The problem with that is that's making a very flawed assumption that when strangers land on your website that they are ready to buy today. That's about as accurate as if I went to go look for a new car and the salesperson was convinced that I was going to buy today or didn't care about pissing me off. So I'm 6'1". I'm actually going to be looking for a car very soon. So I care about headroom. I care about legroom. First time out, I go. I sit in the car, and a salesperson approaches me. And they feel that because I signed in on the log and I said my name is Joshua Feinberg, that he feels that he needs to call me Mr. Feinberg 16 times in the next five minutes because his playbook says that that's going to build rapport and help to advance the sale if he does that. Mr. Feinberg, which car will you be buying or leasing today? Dude, back off. First time here, a little bit tall, just checking out headroom, legroom. Maybe if things go right, I might go out for a test drive. Oh, so you're going to be purchasing or leasing today. I'm like, no, 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 you don't get it. First time out, just kind of evaluating things. I'm in the awareness stage, not in the decision stage. And this goes on two or three times, and eventually that person burns their bridges. Conversely, a couple weeks later, a couple months later, I go back to that dealership and I'm ready to buy and I walk around and I'm like, where is everybody? There's nobody here to help me. I only have two hours to do this whole thing and I can't find anyone. That's not a great experience either. So we need to make sure that we personalize approach, our approach to where they are in the journey. If we try to close them too quickly, we offend them and we drive them away. Probably not going to come back. However, if they're ready to purchase and we're nowhere to be found, that's not good either. So we need to contextualize our approach and because you never really know when somebody lands on your website where they're going to be, we need to make sure that we have content that appeals to people regardless of whether they're early at the awareness stage, whether they're in the middle, they're, they're comparing the different options at the consideration stage, or whether they're actually ready to book the demo, schedule the tour, book the free consult, whatever it is. So we need to make sure that we're helping and we're adding value. Um, 
I also want to talk with you about how you can get this. So far, everything that we've been talking about has been building your brand and building your connections and kind of taking your company along for the ride. There's some specific things that we want to do to help your company, and there's also some specific things that we want to do to uh, extend this across different associations or groups you belong to. So at the top of the list, for things that help your company is to make sure that your company has a LinkedIn company page. How many of you have a, a LinkedIn company page right now that's different from your personal profile? We come across this quite often. It doesn't sound like this is a big problem with most of you that are, that are here today, but we come across this quite often where people confuse the difference between a personal profile that's just for you versus a company profile that's for your entire company. And even if you're a one-person company, you really need to separate the, between the two because you need to be investing in your own brand and investing in your company's brand at the same time. LinkedIn also wants you to do that. They don't want you using a personal profile to talk about your company, and you certainly wouldn't use a company profile to talk about individually. So don't confuse the two. Companies build followers, people build connections. Showcase pages are an interesting animal. Um, showcase pages allow you to take your company page and create a sub-page off of it that's specific to a buyer persona or a type of product or a type of service or a type of event you're having or a division of your company. However, this is a big however, right now uh, the showcase pages are existing but you can't create new ones. LinkedIn has been going through a lot of changes in the last couple months as Microsoft grapples with how to best integrate uh, LinkedIn into the rest of Microsoft. And one of the things that they're exploring is where showcase pages are going to be going in the future. So I would kind of keep this on your radar screen to check back on it in a couple weeks or a couple months to see if it's available. But as of right now, they've kind of closed the door on allowing you to create new showcase pages. Uh, we anticipate that, that Microsoft isn't done yet on infusing Microsoft into the rest of LinkedIn, but so far this is one of the things that we've seen. How many of you uh, noticed some changes that Microsoft made earlier this year after the acquisition closed? How did those changes make you feel? I don't like it. You don't like it? What didn't you like about it? But the format's hard, harder to use. So you counted on the fact that because it's Microsoft that user interface and, and user friendliness would be a given, right? And the next question was, do you see something coming to replace LinkedIn now that Microsoft has bought it and probably going to destroy it? <laughs> I don't, I don't think Microsoft's going to destroy it. I think they're going to monetize it better than LinkedIn is. I don't see anything replacing it anytime soon. I, I think the fact that they were able to take away some of the search features and take them from free and put them in, in, uh, in Navigator and Premium shows just how much pricing power they have. The interesting thing when you look at the social media space is Twitter, it's mind-boggling that Twitter is still functioning as an independent company. LinkedIn couldn't support its executive stock options, so they needed Microsoft's deep pockets to, to kind of propel them to that next level. Everyone thinks that Zuckerberg has this all figured out with Facebook and they're all trying to monetize the way Facebook does. But you know, when it comes to the professional network, especially for IT companies, it's hard to argue with the reach that LinkedIn has built up. And even LinkedIn has been the product of multiple acquisitions years before they were acquired by Microsoft. Um, how many of you use SlideShare? There was a time four or five years ago when SlideShare was the repository for PowerPoints and was a completely separate company. LinkedIn purchased them a couple years ago, uh, integrated within that. By the way, if, in case you're not familiar with SlideShare, it's one of the 200 most popular sites on the internet. So if you have a whole bunch of PowerPoint presentations that are sitting around on your hard drive collecting dust, there's a lot of value in just taking them and putting them up on SlideShare and leading somebody back to your website. Another interesting acquisition that, that LinkedIn had a couple years ago was lynda.com. The uh, tutorial site, training site, it's not hard to see that that folds into some kind of Microsoft uh, SMB plans or consumer plans or something like that to um, better train people on how to better utilize their, their tools. But yeah, showcase pages unfortunately are on hold. Um, so what are some of the essentials that need to be on your LinkedIn company page? For starters, how you spell your, LinkedIn com your company name on your LinkedIn page makes a big difference in how findable you are. It's possible in a small company that you have multiple ways of uh, spelling your company name. Sometimes maybe you're using an acronym, sometimes you're spelling it out, sometimes you're putting the LLC or the ink at the end, some, or the PVT or something like that, sometimes you're not. It's really important that LinkedIn 
uh, what you put into naming your LinkedIn company page is as consistent as you want it to be, because that's going to drive a lot of searchability and findability. Your logo is really important. Uh, all of your company employees should add your company as a uh, their employer on LinkedIn. The header image should reinforce your branding. The summary, in the same way that you put a lot of thought into your personal summary, somebody that is responsible for the overall brand of your company, if you're big enough that you have a true CMO, usually that person, a chief marketing officer, will own that in a smaller company, usually it'll either be the head of sales and marketing or the CEO that actually owns that, but somebody needs to be responsible for creating a very coherent, consistent uh, description or summary for your LinkedIn company page, and usually that needs to be really consistent with your About Us page on your website. Should answer the who, what, when, where, why, and hows. Um, just as you did with your personal summary, try to include some keywords that are especially relevant for your primary buyer persona, your secondary buyer persona. By the way, I've used primary a few times on buyer persona. You may have three or four or five different kinds of ideal clients you want to sell to, but at the end of the day, you need to make a decision on which is the most important and which is the second most important because we're all resource constrained. And you also have place on a LinkedIn page, uh, just as you do on your LinkedIn profile, to link to certain URLs. When you can, try to link to a URL that performs a lead generation function for you, as early a stage as possible and as general as possible. Because your LinkedIn company page is gonna get um, traffic from people that are, are very early, very late, very middle. Um, there's a lot to be gained by trying to keep that offer as broad as possible. Another interesting consideration if you're serious about social selling is to think about the social icons that are on your website. How many of you current have so, currently have social media icons on the home page of your website? How many of you have given a lot of thought as to where those social media icons should lead to? One big tip right off the bat is to think about whether your goal is to attract visitors from social media and get them to your website or whether you want to be a volunteer ambassador for Twitter and Facebook and LinkedIn and send your hard-earned traffic back to them. How many of you want to be a free volunteer ambassador for, for billion dollar social media companies? Once they come to us, we want to keep them on our site. So one of the most simple but most important things is those icons that send people to social media, make sure they open a new tab. You know, the href, target, new window. Um, so we make sure that we don't, once they, that we don't completely lose them. Um, but it's also equally important to make sure that your LinkedIn icon goes to where you intended to go to. In most cases, it should be a company page. Sometimes people link to um, a, a LinkedIn group that they started, and that can be okay if that group is really, really strategic for your company. We'll talk about that more in a few minutes. But we also see sometimes that people mistakenly have a LinkedIn icon that goes to a personal profile which makes their company seem really, really small, like that the CEO is the entire company, send them to the company page. Anyone here have a LinkedIn group that they own and manage? Any of you active participants in LinkedIn groups? The challenge with LinkedIn groups is there's typically a lot of membership in the larger ones, but there's also usually some bad actors people that spam the heck out of the group, ruin the group for everyone, it's like doing the business in the pool and it pollutes the pool for everyone else. So we wanna make sure that we don't get lumped in with people that are behaving really antisocially on LinkedIn groups. So kind of the first, the first step, when you, once you join and get approved to belong to a group, because now all groups by default require that you be accepted in, is to kind of look around and see what people are talking about. Kind of the next step in easing your way into it is to answer other people's questions and perhaps ask your own questions. Over time, you'll gain the ability to share your content, perhaps even share some content that goes behind a landing page, but that should be like step three or four. You need to be able to build some equity up in that group to be seen as helpful, to be seen as an expert before you kind of earn the ability to just talk about yourself. Um, and there is a big difference with whether that content that you're sharing is ungated, uh, meaning no landing page versus gated behind a landing page. So what are some questions that you can ask to drive conversations? It really depends on the group and it depends on what they care about in their business models. When you develop buyer personas, one of the interesting byproducts of buyer personas done well is you should end up with consensus on 
um, Twitter profiles that they follow, hashtags that they care about, and LinkedIn groups they belong to. So let's say you have a, a Fortune 500 CEO that you care about and you've identified the groups that he or she belongs to. Well, it becomes a lot easier to know where to, to focus your efforts. But you know, if, for example, you're participating in a group that's all about co-location providers, you could ask people, what do you look for in an ideal co-location provider? Um, if you're in a group where people are evaluating different kinds of web hosting providers, you can say, like, what are some of the biggest mistakes? What are some of the biggest screw-ups that web hosting companies make? If uh, you're doing something cloud related, you could ask people, how do you see the difference? What do you see as the pros and cons between uh, public cloud, private cloud, and hybrid? If you're participating in a group that either has a lot of managed service providers or is frequented by small businesses that might need to hire a managed service provider, you could ask, what do you see as the future of MSPs? Um, and again, these, these, feel free to take these down as, as some examples, but brainstorm with looking at actual data you have, look at your CRM, look at your email inbox, look at the questions that you're asked on a regular basis. Those are all fair game to drive conversations on social media and to create content around. There are a lot of third-party tools that make it possible to take a piece of your content and hit dozens of groups at the same time. My advice at the risk of oversimplifying is just don't do it. Um, there may be quite a few groups that you could share a piece of content with, but if you use the exact same message at the exact same time, cross-posting, it just, it just looks bad. You're so much better off if you take a couple minutes per group and tailor what that snippet is specifically for that group. You're so much better off if you stagger it, so if there's 10 different groups and most of your buyer personas belong to all 10 of those groups, don't hit all of those groups the same day. Trickle it out every three days, every five days, every seven days, so over a period of a couple weeks or a couple months, you hit all of those groups, which argues for something as basic as an Excel spreadsheet to keep track of, of these kinds of things. Use the power responsibly so you don't harm your reputation, or worse yet, get banned from groups or, or LinkedIn. Starting and managing a LinkedIn group of your own can be very rewarding. You can do a lot of ad hoc research on what people care about, asking questions all the time. You can get a pulse on your ideal clients, their goals, their plans, their challenges, their pain, what's keeping them up at 2 o'clock in the morning. Obviously, you can uh, build community over time. One of the cool parts by default when somebody joins your LinkedIn group is most people will end up having that LinkedIn group listed on their LinkedIn profile. So they're essentially advertising for you. And one other little known feature that a lot of people don't realize is when somebody belongs to your group, by default you have the ability to send them a message to their email inbox once a week. They can opt out of it. Most people don't if it's, not, if it's used responsibly. The downside is starting a group is the easy part building up reach of relevant people in that group and keeping it alive and vibrant, that's a labor of love and it's a big, big job. Um, so, you know, it can be a good fit for some of you, um, but it also takes a lot of, of resources away from other parts of your company. Next, I want to talk to you briefly about what you can do to use what you learn about um, your prospects on LinkedIn to help advance your sales cycle. How many of you, when you get a call, when you get a voicemail or an email from somebody that wants to do business with your company, take time to research that person's LinkedIn profile? There is so much that you can gain from taking a few minutes to read their LinkedIn profile, to see where they've worked, who you might know in common, common groups that they belong to, and what's going on in their company. Because from their personal profile, you can certainly click through to their company. Their company page for their employer will give you their about us version of what their company is all about. You can look at the posts on their recent company page to see what's going on internally. Maybe there's an initiative, maybe there's a merger, maybe there's an audit or something that is extremely relevant to your business model. Um, so it's there for uh, utilizing, it, is make sure that you use this as part of your, your research process. Yes, that person, uh, especially if they have a premium membership, will know that you visited, but they know they're going to have a contact with you anyway, and it actually shows that you care enough to do that research. Uh, this is very different than prospecting on LinkedIn. There's a lot of people that will connect with somebody on LinkedIn and immediately send back a very aggressive pitch in the LinkedIn messaging system. Um, that's not helpful. That's more harassing and it's kind of the equivalent of doing a cold call and it's a really easy way to, to burn a lot of goodwill. Um, so make sure that you're using this tool as a research tool as opposed to a spamming tool. If um, you have somebody that you're meeting with and you don't have all of the information, sometimes you have to narrow it down. You have to narrow it down by where they're located, narrow it down by their company, by their industry. If 
from the form that was filled on your website that you're not, if you're not gathering enough information, like their IP address or something like that, that can narrow it down by city, you may need to be able to, you may want to ask a little bit more information on your landing page forms. Um, we could talk for a, quite a while about what kinds of information to, to go and, and be capturing your landing page forms, but at the end of the day, the more valuable your offer is to them, the more you can afford to ask for. In other words, if you're giving away a 300 page ebook that somebody would have to buy for 30 or $50 on Amazon, you can ask a lot more than if you're giving away a one page planning checklist. If you're giving away a half hour consultation that has $100 or $200 or $300 of perceived value, whatever it is, you can ask for more information than if some someone's just downloading a one-page uh, template or something like that. And the value, of course, is in the eye of the beholder. Every uh, buyer persona will evaluate your value proposition quite differently. Always make sure when you're connecting with people that you take the time to personalize the invite. We talked about this before. Um, so they know exactly why you want to connect with them. Definitely mentioned earlier, but worth repeating. Make sure you calibrate your LinkedIn BS detector if things just aren't adding up. It's not just a research tool, it's a due diligence tool for figuring out um, if things match up and things actually add up. Another thing I want to call your attention to that can be really helpful for taking early stage leads and advancing them to sales opportunities is using LinkedIn to do nurturing. Most people when they think of nurturing just think of an email nurturing sequence. However, the reality is while LinkedIn doesn't support that per se, there's a certain amount of people that will download an ebook or sign up for your email newsletter or attend a webinar of yours, and over time you'll send them email. But they get a lot of email. In some cases, that email isn't making it through to their inbox. Ever since Google had the priority inbox a couple years ago, even for people that do legitimately want to hear from you, sometimes the messages are inadvertently out. We go through this battle all the time with clients where they tell the entire story in the body of the email. You're so much better off having a much shorter email that links to your uh, your site page, but there, you could share the same piece of content with somebody in an email nurturing sequence and share it on your LinkedIn stream and you can look at did they click on any of the messages that were sent to them by email or did they click on that exact same content when it was shared on LinkedIn and many times you're catching people's attention in their LinkedIn stream a lot easier than you will in their email inbox just because it's less cluttered. So what that allows you to do is essentially nurture them by continuing to share content that adds value with them over time. This isn't on a one-off basis. This is strictly sharing information that's in their stream. The challenge is LinkedIn is Facebook envy. And in the same way that Facebook started with promoted posts years ago where most people that, that are friends or follow your company page don't necessarily get the whole, the whole scoop anymore unless you boost that post, LinkedIn is very rapidly moving to that uh, model, but it still pays to share content over time to help nurture and educate and uh, build trust. It also gives you valuable lead intelligence when that some person clicks through on, on your piece of content, comes back to your website, it writes that to your contact timeline so you can tell what they care about, what captures their attention, it becomes a lot easier to, uh, to personalize the sales process and helps to accelerate those leads through your um, buyer's journey. So coming down the home stretch here, I wanted to take a few minutes and talk about what LinkedIn now looks like post Microsoft. And we don't know exactly what it's gonna end up looking like post Microsoft. Is LinkedIn gonna be fully integrated in the next version of Office? Is it gonna be part of Dynamics CRM? Is it gonna be part of Windows? We don't exactly know. But one of the big things that we've seen so far is it's very clear that um, you know, because Microsoft's a publicly held company, one of the things they want to do is to try to monetize LinkedIn better. And if they can even get a small percentage of people to upgrade to premium or navigator, in their mind, it's a win. Maybe as a hedge, you want to look at the, uh, the opportunity on the, on the, the uh, you know, as a publicly traded company, LinkedIn, you know, heads Microsoft, they, they're going to look at different ways to monetize it. Should you have a sales navigator account? We get that question all the time. Um, it's definitely, Sales Navigator is not required for social selling, but if you spend more than a few hours a week on LinkedIn, you may find it to be a really good productivity tool, despite the cost. You know, at $1,000 a year, you kind of have to make a decision. If you got one or two new clients because of that information over the course of the year, would it be worthwhile? And you kind of have to evaluate it through the same lens of, well, if I did $1,000 in sponsored posts, if I did $1,000 in Google AdWords, if I did $1,000 event sponsorship, you know, could this give me similar kinds of ROI? Um, you can save leads, you can save accounts. If you sell to 
clients where there's a lot of different influencers involved and you use like account-based management, it can really be a lifesaver to find out who is in the company and different seniorities, who's relatively new to the company, who's been there a while. Um, that can be very, very helpful. Um, it also can be really, really helpful to get past gatekeepers. If you need to get to a C-level executive and you find a lot of influencers are getting in the way, well, social media allows you to knock down some of those barriers, assuming that the CEO is actually active on LinkedIn. Um, there's a lot of advanced filters that can be especially helpful. Probably the, the biggest ones for, uh, for most people that sell to small and mid-sized companies is, is by company size. If you notice when I asked the question at the beginning, how many of you are for companies that are 1 to 10, 11 to 50, 51 to 200, I'm programmed to use those as the default brackets because so much of what we do internally and what we do with our clients centers around uh, LinkedIn. But you know, it's just a way to help evaluate in terms of who's a good likely fit and that should match up well to what you discover in building your buyer personas. Uh, seniority can be really helpful also, but we tend to find really helpful if you're looking to target decision makers as there's five seniorities in LinkedIn that seem to really matter. CXO, owner, partner, director, uh, vice president, and um, and, uh, and, and uh, manager. Um, function, title, postal code, radius. How many of you are uh, selling in a certain geo radius, like from an MSP perspective or colo perspective, where you're most appealing to people that are 25, 50 miles away? This can be really helpful for that. You can search by common groups, who's new to their position, who's been there a while. So the question is, does it, does it pay for you to invest in it? It really, it's a big, it depends with how important LinkedIn social selling to you and a lot of the speculation too will depend on how you view Microsoft's uh, future directions with this tool. It's gonna change, it's just a matter of how it changes. So one of the most important things with all of this is to cover your bases. So who knows what's going on in Major League Baseball tonight? Teams, there's some teams that are playing opening night, right? It's the beginning of the Major League Baseball. So if you look at Major League Baseball season, so if you look at right up the road, that direction is Dodger Stadium, or that direction. Um, so if the Dodgers had all 25 players available and they're playing the San Diego Padres tonight, and San Diego, for whatever reason, only brought two of their 25 players, what's the outcome gonna look like of the game? It's gonna be pretty ugly if one team has all 25 players and the other team only has two. And the same way that a professional sports team makes sure that it needs to make sure that they cover all the positions on the field, we need to also make sure that we don't bet everything on LinkedIn, that we don't bet everything on social media, because social media alone does not create revenue. Social media can be used to attract some strangers, it can be used to nurture some existing relationships, it can be used as a research tool, but social media alone can't take you from stranger to lead, from lead to opportunity, and from opportunity to client. There's a lot of other things that need to come into play, so you wanna make sure that your strategy doesn't look like a dysfunctional baseball team. So one of the most important things is that we think about how we're gonna attract the right strangers and turn them into website visitors, how we convert those visitors into leads, how we close leads into clients, and how we delight those clients and customers so they become promoters and help to repeat the cycle. There's a couple of different ways to look at this. This one goes from left to right. This one goes from top to bottom and is aligned more like a funnel. Again, the whole idea is that we need to go from strangers, which is usually where most people start out with on LinkedIn, uh, with social media, but we need to get those strangers to turn into visitors that fall in love with our content and start to fall in love with our company. How we get those visitors to become leads because they look at our content and be like, wow, this stuff is so good, I have to, uh, I gotta get, it's free, you know, I, I gotta see the good stuff. And how we get those segment and, and nurture and advance those leads into opportunities and customers and again, uh, for anyone that uses the, that is recurring revenue that's based on repeat sales, we have to have a way to be able to continue educating and continuing building trust with those new customers so they learn how to get most value out of our service, so retention is not an issue, and they help to bring us more promoters to uh, at the top of our funnel. So again, this is what we looked at before. The key thing to keep in mind with all of this is LinkedIn is just one piece of the puzzle. Uh, approach by itself, it's kind of like if you um, put together a DR solution that focused strictly on power protection and had no other thought of end to disaster recovery aside from the power protection aspect of it. So we talked about the importance of starting out with the right foundation. We talked about the value of growing your reach and, and help growing these relationships with the right people as being a really valuable asset to, um, uh, to help you reach your revenue growth goals. We talked about the importance of getting this involved not just at a personal level but at a company level. We talked about the importance of groups. 
Um, we talked about how to use LinkedIn to personalize the sales process, how not only are there different people that we need our content to appeal to, it needs to appeal to where they are in the journey. If we talk to people on their first visit as if we assume they're ready to buy that day, that's gonna push them away, it's gonna, it's gonna really annoy and, and be very off-putting. The flip side is if they're ready to buy today and you're nowhere to be found, that's not good either. So we have to have a way to be relevant to where they are on the buyer's journey. Um, we talked briefly about uh, Sales Navigator. We talked about the importance of covering all of your bases. How many of you have installed the mobile app for hosting Con and Data Center World? Please make sure before you leave here today that you go on the app and rate the session. If there's any reason why you're having a hard time giving this the highest possible rating, please come talk to me afterwards so I can make sure that I get any remaining questions answered. If you're not connected with me on LinkedIn, this is a great way to keep up with best practices for improving your social selling over time. As we saw with Microsoft, things will continue to change. That's the only constant in our industry. Um, and we can see that with hosting and cloud and uh, hosting cloud, managed service providers and co-location. If you need more one-on-one -on -one help getting on board with social selling, feel free to take a picture of this slide and reach out to me. Um, with that, I'm so glad that you were able to attend this workshop today on LinkedIn social selling for co-location providers, hosting, web hosting companies, cloud providers, and managed service providers. Again, I'm Joshua Feinberg from SP Home Run, and I hope you have a fantastic hosting con this week.